going back to this one for a second, one of the big ideas um, about the city was the the boulevards meeting the street, and then the 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 street uh, the boulevards meeting the beach. Excuse me, and then the the promenade along the beach. And like Kevin mentioned when he was going over the site, is that this is a point where there's the square right on the beach, but the connection between the the street and the beach is not currently doing what it should within the fabric of the city. Um, so we started looking at aspects, uh, precedents for things that we wanted it to feel like, um, aspects we could include to, to achieve this feeling. Um, one thing on this slide that's important to point out is the, uh, the Gettys plan, which was the original uh, urban plan for the city which involved this series of boulevards running, boulevards arranged perpendicular to the beach so that they ran into the ocean um, and with kind of these garden promenades that, that met these squares uh, right at the water. Um, wait, do uh, you wanna go back one, Alice? Um, so in the bottom, if you look at, there is a section and um, what we, are trying to do is that uh, we're going to embed or hide the highway down so that we can open up all of that street um, to really help uh, regain that connectivity that we lost. Yeah. So this was kind of the, oh, I'll let's go. Okay. So this was kind of the first inspirational sketch, um, just something that we quickly drew on paper and we're like, this is something that we wanted um, to really explore, which was burying the tunnel to go underneath to really let people flow across from that main Ben Gurion road all the way down to the beach, redirecting them to uh, Jaffa, but then also allowing that cross traffic um, through the streets that ran from um, south, north to south, essentially. Yeah, and so it used ideas like, like raising the building to some degree on Pelodes to allow people to move underneath it. Um, like Lisa said, pulling, making there, currently the highway goes underneath the square, but what we wanted to do was, was pull that even further out into the fabric of the city so that you got this, this linear park along the edge that the square became a central node to, um, as opposed to having this highway that just sort of split the, the that, that really divided the city from the beach. Um, so here are some more images of the site showing how it really just is this, this disruptive element in the city that doesn't allow the proper connections to take place. Uh, and it doesn't really create a public space that's, that, that is pleasant for people to be in or really welcomes people to the beach in, in a way that it should. So this is our, our site plan. And this starts to show how we're using elements such as the building, the landscape, and the roof to start to define space within the plaza in the center there, while also pulling these connections out into the other parts of the city to, to bring all these elements together uh, in a, a much more cohesive manner than what currently exists. So, you guys want to add anything to this? Yes. Or? So um, before we go further into our project, I think we really wanted to state that um, our project is about connectivity. Um, and the way we do it, it happens in three different scales. Um, the first is in a much bigger way in an urban scale. Um, and then we'll go into the plaza scale. Um, and then eventually we'll talk about how the building helps um, connect back to connect the city or connect the beach back to the city. Be good yeah. for the next one. Yes. So uh, this in, is yeah, um, in this plan, um, it's just basically showing that by eliminating that highway that used to be there, um, where you see the green area down that boulevard, um, it used to block off circulation. So people would have to walk down like a mile to get on the beach. But now by proposing this, um, new boulevard on top of the highway, it allows people to directly move through the city um, so they can have a direct access um, back to the beach. Yeah. Do you wanna to go to the next one? 
So this is once again an image that you saw earlier, kind of talking about what kind of redirection and um, connection we wanted from Ben Gurion, which is the street that comes up at the top uh, right hand corner and um, how we wanted people to move throughout our site. And so one of the biggest things that came when we were designing was taking this uh, boulevard, letting people kind of stay in the plaza and enjoy the view of the beach um, but then also reorienting them back to Yaffa, whether it was visually or physically, um, that was something that we really wanted along with the fluid movement from the beach to the boulevard above, which has quite a big height difference, which is what made it so difficult earlier um, before our proposed intervention. Um, there was a lot of difficulty moving between beach and the city. Yeah, another goal of the project that uh would go on to influence some of the forms within the, the project is the, we wanted to maintain this idea that move, as you move down the boulevard, you had a, a visual connection to the sea. However, there were existing buildings and that existing pool that, uh, that were important and we wanted to maintain within the project. So while we wanted to keep that visual connection, we also wanted to create this, this curved uh, kind of circulation or path that would take people down to the beach at a bit of an angle so that they, um, that while you had the view as you're walking down, once you got to the plaza, you would sort of shift and turn to, uh, to face the old city as you came down onto the beach. Next. And this is sort of how we implemented um, our strategies in the way, there are four main ways. One was uh, through landscape, so we took the different levels of the city and or different levels and carved them into the landscape so that it stepped down at a much uh, calmer level or uh, not as steep or as fast. The next thing we wanted to add was uh, public space and seating. So a public amphitheater and sort of this lawn um, with public uh, seating to let to gather people there. The other thing that we started doing in order to start shaping the plaza and this gathering space was using the edges. Um, it was something we saw with um, uh, Oscar Neymeyer and the way that he used his, oh, I don't know how to pronounce the park, um, but with his roof, how he defined spaces um, was something that we were interested in. And so um, our forms, this uh, canopy like roof and the building attempt to kind of suggest the plaza as a space to gather. And then the last thing we did was to um, put in some green space as a continuation of both the Ben Gurion and the idea of this city and the garden. Yeah. Another thing that we, we wanted to address is that this is a, a very large amount of space. And so while we wanted everything to be connected and fluid, we also wanted to start using elements of the landscape or the roof the shading structure and the building to start creating these kind of pocket spaces within the larger um, project. So for example, the, uh, the moment that happens, see if I can just draw real quick, right here that's tucked behind the building uh, has a, a more private feel than the, the, the grand sort of circular plaza in the front. And then the amphitheater that occurs as the terrain steps down to the beach has a different feel than the more garden-like spaces that are in and around and underneath the roof. Yep. Uh, this is a roof plan looking down. Uh, you can see our uh, landscape roofs and a cultural building that is, uh, we can talk more on the program later, um, but it's a building set to kind of bring activity into the center and it's a program we choose is something public and um, so if we just scroll through the plans um, cutting through I think they're loading right now you say the yeah can we go next? Next? oh sorry no, you're good um, this is um, the cut through the highway showing how the highway runs underneath um, then going to next this is kind of cutting uh, a couple feet above the plaza with our first part of the building touching on that um, large plaza area with that uh, kind of gap underneath that leads into the garden. 
then go to next. And then this is um, the building with the plaza. And then last, a section through the plaza um, looking at um, looking at the uh, how the land grades down. Yeah, one thing that the existing square does that's very jarring is when you get to the end of the boulevard, it, it comes up onto this plinth and then takes you back down. And we wanted to do essentially the opposite of that. We wanted our kind of our plinth space to be lower than the boulevard so that it would preserve that view and so that the, the entirety of, of moving through the space is this, this set of steps, so literally um these grand steps but also just these these levels that cascade down to uh the level of the water and then this is a section cutting through ben Gurion, looking out towards the sea kind of showing how the roof interacts with the building and then the next part we'll be looking at is the cultural center uh building yeah, so we wanted to pick up a, a program that was uh, poetically connected to the city in the same way that our, our site is physically connected to the city. So we wanted something that would benefit the public and also have just a, you know, a, a, a spiritual connection to, to the place. So it, it's a cultural center. It has secondary programs within it, such as a cafe on the beach, um, a theater for lectures or showing movies or films and, um, and then a, a gallery of, of art that would be specific to the city in some way. Um, another part, um, another part of the building um, is that uh, we wanted to, if you look at the right, um, so this building um, on the back side, um, it's a hotel currently and it's a private use. So, um, the challenge that we had was that we had to um, find or design a building that would uh, establish the division between the public versus private. Um, so to the left of the building is the, the public plaza and the public space. Um, and to the right of the building, um, we design a space that would not necessarily be closed off, but it would have a character that's more private than the more open plaza on the on the left. And another way that we wanted to really connect um, <clears throat> the the north to south is that we would cut literally cut through the building. Um, Ellis, if you can go back one more. Um, so as you can see, um, we have, we're cu literally cutting through the building on the plaza level that gives you access um, to north and southbound. Um, yeah. One, uh, I'm gonna go back a few slides to mention that this area right here is a, a, his is a historically important park and cemetery space. I don't know, can you see my mouse if I- Yes, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and in the current scheme, there's this tiny little bridge that connects it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go from here to here, you have to kind of snake around this highway and go up onto the plinth. And so by kind of bringing all of this together, it, it's, it really connects this space underneath the building into this space and then on through the city in that direction. So then this is a section of the building which starts to get it into more of the, uh, the specific forms inside of the building and the spaces we're trying to create. Um, the, there's lots of lobby spaces with stairs that, that stretch out into the, the open space of the double height spaces. There's um, these rotating art exhibits as well as the permanent more cultural exhibit that take place in spaces like these. And then there's a reception hall uh, that overlooks the, the ocean and then the lecture hall that looks back onto the, the city. Um, another thing that we didn't mention from the site plan was that we wanted to connect the, um, the eastern side of the building, the side closest to the rest of the city, to the fabric of the city by continuing this, the geometry of the, the surrounding buildings. So that, that was sort of anchors it to the, the buildings around it. 
So this is a section going the other way, showing the way people would walk underneath this space and occupy this plaza and how people inside the building would be exposed to this, uh, this southern light coming into the exhibit um, and then just the, the way the spaces work with each other moving through. Um, and then lastly, we have some renders uh, that show just what the space might feel like. This is coming up down the boulevard into the plaza uh, where you'd reach the end of it and then have this, this moment where the, the building reveals itself. We, uh, we use these, uh, these columns along the edge to create a, a, an implied edge of the building that, that gives it that curve towards the old city but at the same time didn't block your view of the ocean uh, and also sort of revealed the building more as you walked around it. The columns would compress as you're approaching from one angle and then as you reach the plaza itself, you'd turn and you can see more of the building. Uh, from here, you can see the building from underneath the roof structure, how uh, that, that swooping roof and the building sort of make the boundaries of that, uh, that central plaza space. And then from here is the approach from underneath the building as you go between the columns uh, and enter that central space coming from the other side of the city. So, yeah. That concludes. Um, thank you. Great, thank you. Take it away. <laughs> Just uh, let me know what, what drawings you'd like me to go back to. Our, our uh, final presentation is also on, on box and y'all should be able to have access to that. So if you just uh, let us know what page we can bring back. Always hard to be the first one to go. I, I would, uh, sorry, I was on mute there. Uh, um, I would suggest that we go back to the urban plan since that's where you started your presentation. Maybe, yeah, maybe go back a little further. How about? Uh, yeah, that one's good. This one? So, uh, no, no, that one you just had. So, <clears throat> yeah, I guess what I think is really successful about this project is the. Um, uh, the kind of the negotiation of scale from this very more fine-grained urban scale that we see in that diagram on the left there of the kind of small buildings uh, to uh, the larger buildings that line the waterfront to the, the beach itself. So there's sort of a, a graduation in scale there, right? This real kind of fine-grained and then the kind of urban space with the larger buildings and then out onto the beach, which uh, is scaled maybe to the ocean, let's say. So very, very uh, different scales within a, within a short distance. Um, <clears throat> where uh, I, I like uh, how uh, in section, in plan and section, I think it's successful, um, how you bring people into the beach, which is a very, seems like a very difficult situation to negotiate. I like what you did in section with depressing that plaza to mitigate that, that abrupt transition from the, the very high, higher elevation of the city down to the beach, that seems like a really smart move. Um, I like what you're doing with your building there with that kind of, uh, that subtle colonnade, which starts to subtly uh, turn you and orient you to the beach. Uh, however, I think it's too subtle. And where I have, where I think is uh, the, the issue with this scheme for me is the transition from that roundish plaza down to the beach, which seems like uh, there should be a sense of arrival there <clears throat> that is missing in the project. So if I come all the way from Ben Gurion, I uh, imagine I'm visiting Tel Aviv for the first time. I'm walking through the city down Ben Gurion. I get to that plaza, and then it's going to transition to the beach. So that moment where that plaza transitions to the beach is, to me, the most important moment in the project. And I feel really let down. I feel like there's a bunch of junk there, a bunch of pieces uh, that weren't explained, and I don't know what they are. There looks what looks like an amphitheater, and then there's this kind of orthogonal thing underneath the swooping canopy. To me, that should have been 
uh, this this kind of transition and scale where I get compressed and then I enter out onto the beach. So it really should have oriented me more at a 45 degree angle. And if you now go to the plan of your building or the kind of more of the plaza plan, let's say, yeah, that one. Um, I think that that I, I really uh, appreciate the move of kind of that colonnade kind of curving. It's it's unusual. But I think it's too subtle. I almost want to orient more on a 45 degree to the beach and have that be like a really uh, impressive moment where I come down and that transition from the plaza to the beach. And you didn't really go into those three elements underneath the canopy. So I question the three elements under the canopy. Like why do you need what looks like an amphitheater if you have this big gathering plaza right next to it? And um, I don't know what the other things are. Uh, so to me, that's that's where it falls down a bit. The other design decision that I question is there's a the building your building on the right, the cultural center, and then there's this canopy thing, <coughs> uh, this kind of swoopy sauna esque canopy thing, and I wonder uh, you you deliberately decide to make those two things rather than one thing, and could those not have been more integrated, such that the colonnade like where I want to see a colonnade is where I, I leave that plaza and enter the beach. And could not the, the, the canopy be more integrated with your building rather than, it seems like the site is already very piecey and uh, just kind of a pastiche of, of elements. And you've, uh, I feel like your design uh, decisions have, have exacerbated that problem by adding more pieces, and I count one, two, three, four, five, six pieces, um, you know, and could it not, could, uh, you know, my my <clears throat> instinct is to, you know, that that canopy in the building should have been more integrated, and it should be more about space and less about stuff filling up the space. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think there was a um, a deliberate uh, goal to have kind of a dialogue between the two of them, as opposed to making them one continuous thing. But why? Yeah, that's that's obvious. But why? I think when we wanted these two pieces to be is to be in conversation uh, against each other to create kind of like a almost like a cradle, I guess, for looking at the center plaza, which was what we wanted to be the focus, um, was the, the landscape of the plaza. And so the idea was that these two would uh, come together as different elements and would suggest passing one another um, to create that focus in the center. We once explored them kind of touching, but didn't really like how it went. And so liked it more as the, roof slipping past the building as a separate element. Yeah. I guess to me to me the project is about a dialogue between your building and the beach. Mm -hmm. And and I guess that the question is it raises is what is the destination here? Is the destination that plaza at the end of Ben Gurion or is the destination the beach? I think it, it isn't there also something and I know you, you were in Israel just for a very short time, but uh, and I've never been, so Tel Aviv is a mystery to me. But um, I guess one of the things I'm having a little bit of trouble with is, you know, there's beach and there's beach. I mean, there, you know, is it is it densely populated? Are there cafes and um, shaved ice vendors mm. every five minutes or not? And and in particular, the what you're describing as a plaza, I don't have any sense of um, how how this space might be occupied, and and um, maybe more importantly, what's the scale of this space in the kind of popular consciousness of the citizens of Tel Aviv? I mean, is this you know, is this the like the biggest public gathering space in the city? And if so, what would animate it? And what would, what would, um, what occasion would there be to contrive to fill it up? Yeah, I think from experience when we were in, in Tel Aviv, it's like you said, the, the 
or as you described, the beach culture is extremely active on some days and there are a lot of cafes. The people that come to this site or that did use the site went to use the beach as a destination, um, merely using the current Kikara Tarim as a simple way of going up and down because it was the only means of uh, uh, vertical movement. And so I think that's what kind of influenced our decision was that this plaza was meant to um, kind of cap off the boulevard, but also make the movement from the city level down to the beach level easier and offering program to let the plaza space be filled. Um, it was kind of hard to um, make a plaza space that, um, as you pointed out, uh, picturing what would be able to fill that space um, was a, a challenge. I mean, again, it, it's it's probably partly due to the circumstances of the short visit and 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 of course this rupture that we're living in. But um, you know, there's probably an interesting drawing. I mean, you you it's the first project we've seen, so I, I may uh, hold this thought for later in the day. But you know, the the idea that you have um, right from the get go thought about this promenade all the way down to the old city of Jaffa. And, you know, there's probably an interesting inventory of what are the 101 ways of getting down to the beach uh, as, a, as a kind of determination of whether your plaza and a particular sequence, as John has just been probing, um, is appropriate and germane. Um, so that, that would be my... Um, initial kind of comment about the project. I mean, there's, there's things that are nice about it in the renderings, the, the um, what's the word, the kind of redundancy of the space underneath the colonnade, I think is, is a strong, um, strong design feature of the project, but the space is, is uh, it's kind of immense and, and simply to throw a few figures in the drawing, in the rendering, um, that make it look like it's populated. I, I suspect that it would be, um, I, I, I don't mean this un unkindly, but I, I suspect it might in the end be a kind of desolate space. Mm -hmm. um, if I may jump in. Um, I think the biggest challenge you're going to face as architects is how to design in a space that you have not lived in or you necessarily know. And although I, I do very much like the building itself, I feel that you sort of recreated the same scenario that exists now in so many ways. Um, sure, you're creating a pathway to the ocean, to the beach, but you're designing um, with a sort of lack of awareness to who you're designing. Uh, when you look at the get plan, when you look at the boulevards, when you look at these spaces that it's sort of, you know, these cross spaces that he created of gathering, um, you almost took three of them and put them in one place, creating the same monstrosity almost. Um, I, th I think the attempt to connect is there. But if you know anything about Israelis, um, you know that they will not go under a tunnel that length necessarily. Uh, they want to be out, outside in the open. Um, like if, if this was maybe a mega parking spot or something. Um, and, and, and I just feel that in that sense, it's become maybe a space that later on over time will just stay empty. It will just become a little pathway but it won't be occupied necessarily. Um, I, th I, think, I think when you presented it, you spoke about connectivity, but you're actually creating a space that is more neutral than actually connecting. It might connect the people that live literally around it, but it is about saying, okay, everybody move away. This is its own little creature and you're welcome here, but you know, under our terms in a way. Um, I'll run the risk of speaking after the 
the the person who actually lives <laughs> in Israel and is probably in a best position to evaluate the efficacy of what we're looking at. Um, well, and, and maybe just try and, and gauge it from a couple of different perspectives as inappropriate or as appropriate as that may seem. Um, because I honestly I find uh, projects like this a little difficult to gauge in terms of like the effectiveness of it, only because I think public spaces in urban areas can be a little bit unpredictable in terms of how they perform. I'm not sure it's a question of architecture entirely, although an architect can certainly screw them up. But whether or not they can guarantee success, I think, is a different question altogether. And I, I think you know, it's, I know it's a low bar, and this may sound like not much of a compliment, but it actually is. I think you've got something that wouldn't screw it up. I mean, I don't see anything in here that is a real showstopper other than maybe the reappearance of the highway. Uh, and we've had a lot of time to study this drawing since it's been on the screen for a while, but the reappearance on the, of the highway, I guess, would amount to the southern side of the plaza, which is on you know screen left there. Um, you know, the noise from an element like that, I think, can be an issue, especially if it's put next to what's looks like it's proposed a performance venue. I'm just not sure you've got two compatible elements right next to one another. So you swap them around. I think you got plenty of space to do that. You cover up the highway, lots of different things you can do. So I, I don't think it's the most interesting thing about your project. I think, um, I do think, I, I agree with John Ronan that the, uh, I think the sequence of spaces is, is good. I think the fact that they drop levels in a kind of like deft fashion that allows to uh, views to be preserved is the right move. I'm not sure that those views are preserved entirely with the presence of that canopy there from the upper portion of the plaza, which is showing on screen, lower part mm -hmm. of the screen, I guess, which is on the uh, east side. But your renderings, I think, still uh, paint a rather compelling, if not monumental, um, uh, portrait. Of the uh, of the space, which I think is okay too. Like, yes, it's monumental. Yes, it might feel a little desolate, but in a kind of exciting, exhilarating way. That when it is actually full, it seems like a really kind of thriving and 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 uh, uh, exciting place to be. Whether or not it fills up on a regular basis, I think, is a question of how the buildings actually handle their program and the popularity of those programs. And that's where we get into mm -hmm. an unpredictable zone, where I think that it's it, it may not be entirely productive to kind of speculate on how you should program the buildings to make it work. And one of the reasons why I'm spec, skep, spec, skeptical about that is because you know, attempts to make cultural districts in city is just like the wrong thing to do. Um, and this is my just personal opinion. There might be some people who I'm sure you disagree with me about that. But like the first thing you want to do to kind of bolster the cultural profile, cultural profile of city is not to build a cultural district. There's something just kind of counterproductive about that, I think. Um, they, they typically grow in, in ways that are a little more organic and follow the patterns of finance and uh, uh, economic development rather than like, you know, conscious attempts to make a place where, you know, certain types of events are curated. I'm not sure that that's the kind of thing that is as vibrant and uh, locally poignant uh, as something that happens organically. And I do think that that's something that sounds like it might be happening on the site at the moment based on, on Professor Alter's um, introduction a moment ago, despite that he, he gave a rather bleak portrait of the, of the current state of things. Mm -hmm. It's also the kind of place where people go to have a lot of fun. And maybe this is kind of one of those places. I do think that, and that's what leads me to my, I think my final comment here is just, actually there's two other things I want to share with you. One is like the, the, the sense of informality that makes um, uh, open spaces in, in the city thrive does seem to be missing in this case. I think it's a very beautifully handled scheme uh, and it's well proportioned. I love the long, the big colonnade. Um, name checking uh, Niemeyer is always a good idea whenever you're starting to work with these kind of sinewy shapes. Uh, I don't want to circle back to that in just a minute, but um, what's missing for me is the sense that that level of informality that's present on the site is just completely set aside for something that's so well coordinated that it, it begins to, to flirt with the edge of, of, of um, uh, skepticism in terms of its ability to, you know, to follow through on its promise of being a place where people would congregate in an organic and kind of uh, festive way. Um, I, I, but I don't know how you do that. Like as a designer, that's, that's typically play, the kinds of things that architects screw up. Um, the, um, uh, the sense that, you know, some kind of shape would come in and organize the space, I think is right. And it, 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 uh, as a side note, Lisa, I loved your answer to John's question about like whether and, you know, why you've got multiple items on the site working mm -hmm. as opposed to a single kind of co cohesive response. Although I would have, I would have augmented your answer by maybe just simply saying, well, that's just, you know, some cities, uh, well, I'd say all cities really kind of benefit from the idea that you, that you have a kind of heterogeneous approach to a space this large. Um, breaking it up 
through this series of gestures, I think is the right move to make. Now, whether or not those gestures are well handled or could be handled better, I think that is a rather subjective but important question to ask mm -hmm. oneself. And that's why I think the Niemeyer name checking is really good. <laughs> like um, the uh, Ibirapuera Park yeah, in, is, yeah, in Sao Paulo is, it looks great in plan. What a, what a miserable place it is. I, I honestly, I, I can't, I, I don't, I just don't think the details were followed through on in the kind mm -hmm. of mid range in that project. And so it feels very sterile. Um, but that said, like Niemeyer is somebody, you, should, you know, everybody in here uh, uh, working on this project would, would um, benefit from studying a little bit more closely because the sense that like the kind of sinewy sophistication of, of Niemeyer's hand, or at least maybe the hands of his designers, I guess, um, is something that all of us could really learn a, a really valuable lesson from. I mean, something that's well proportioned and exciting to look at, I think, does contribute significantly to a project of this scale. And you know, the the more you you study that stuff, and the more sophisticated your own ability becomes to kind of make these things as beautiful as Niemeyer's plans, I think you're you're in a better position to handle a project of this size. So that's a great that's a great role model. It's just unfortunately like. It, I, I would stick to the kind of aerial view as far as that goes and then maybe shift to another model that might be a little bit more, a little richer and, and more valuable um, when it comes to, to executing the first hand experience question. I was going to say, well, I was just going to say, I mean, that, um, that, and it may make some sense, Alice, I sent you a chat about this, so you might sh show some additional images while the conversation is happening. That, that talk about the, the issues that are, people are bringing up. But like there, there was, whether it's successful uh, I, or not, maybe I, I, I'll step back on, but there was a particular thought with the design of, of it beyond just programming but that, you know, the, the, for example, the order of the columns under the uh, Niemeyer-like building is much more kind of randomized as opposed to the, the order that's in the building. That they, they, and that they've had some thoughts about how these things are occupied, even if the drawings, I mean, I agree with, Chris McDonald, uh, um, that the, the drawings show it in a kind of neutral way. But I think you guys have been imagining the, the ways in which this thing would be occupied. And it wouldn't be bad to sort of address that. Like, right. Um, so I guess if we go into the, the, the I guess, specific um, spaces and how we imagine these spaces to be, um, Lisa did touch on the left side. Um, but so, yes. So this um, amphitheater is really we wanted a space for the performer performers. Um, when we walked down that beach, there were just random or people just dancing in a very informal um, place without any kind of boundary, just there, and it was beautiful. Um, so we wanted to also provide a space for them, or not just them, but other performers to come in um, and perform. Um, to the left uh, of that, um, this, this space is more for um, seating and reading, um, just looking out, sitting, sitting on that, those seatings and looking to the beach um, was one part. Um, and then that other, the third element on this side is a ramp that takes you down, but um, it's also a garden that you weave through. Um, I think that element is a little bit un unexplored. I think mm -hmm. the more important part that we tried to keep, um, and I agree that a lot of these stand as single elements, um, but uh, the time and the, the scale that we worked at, we hadn't quite gotten to work them to be together. Um, the the point, I think, trying to combine these three was to keep that uh, kind of look towards Yaffa, which we wanted with the amphitheater, um, along with this platform that carried out that turned into a ramp that somehow integrated into the stairs. Um, I think it obviously needs a lot more work, but the idea there was, was that the gradation down continued to happen. Sorry, and let me annotate. Um, like this kind of like sinking the the steppage down um, was kept in that way um, when when you were trying to reach the plaza, so it didn't matter which way you went. Um, and in sort of a sense, you were able to access down to the beach. Um, and then these three elements were kind of 
uh, more or less how we handled what we wanted to keep in the project. Um, and its size was a little bit more difficult to, to deal with. Um, and so I agree that they definitely could, could use some better handling and uh, massaging to get into the project, if not uh, work at it in a different way, rather than having this. But, but I think the, the question about what's the destination and what's the, what's the threshold you cross, <coughs> excuse me, cross to know that you've arrived. Um, I mean, just for instance, the, um, you know, it's quite striking when you see the aerial shots of your site, mm -hmm. the, the presence of the public swimming pool. So, you know, as, as much as there's a kind of figural gesture towards Jaffa, you're also, you, you've entered into a kind of public landscape, which is quite different from the landscape of the boulevard and the, the city beyond. And, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, even, even just in the drawings, the recognition that that's part of the landscape that you have arrived in uh, might, might be a useful thing to consider. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that, um, um, and this, this might not address it quite to the degree uh, that you're referring to, but we did want to have a moment where the, the, the roof extends out in a way that is then overlapped by the beach extending in. And so you do have kind of a handoff moment. Um, to the degree that's successful is, is debatable, but... Um, Ellis, could, could you go to image, I think it's 17, the one that's the more diagrammatic with the red arrows on it, please? Is that that's this one? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm very cautious to com comment it, comment on this because I mean th th we're talking about reviewing a project at arm's length and then we're reviewing a project on the other side of the world that I haven't been to and sometimes I think I know something about urban design and but you know like John Sot John Zot says yeah uh, it's um. I, I, it's to do something that doesn't mess it up or try and identify your intentions and then connect space making and form making to what those intentions are. It sounds to me like you're seeing this site as uh, a kind of a clogged artery or, or, or a major joint in the city where a number of different vectors or factors play in. There's the beach as an edge which terminates at that little corner you're just talking about. There's the public swimming pool. There's the marina all on the edge condition. There's the formality of Ben Gurion Boulevard, which comes down. It looks like there's, a, there's you mentioned the cemetery at the top of that diagram. And then, that, then there's a, like a major automobile artery that comes through and gets buried underneath. And at the moment, there's this big brutalist thing at that intersection, very much a clogged, what one might think of as a clogged artery. Am I correct in reading it that way? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so the intention then would be to open up that artery uh, in the, here at the still the beginning part of the 21st century. So I mean we're not Osman, and so the role of uh, formal gestures in the city is up for I think determination at this point. Uh, and so I, I think you've done something to try and acknowledge the presence and the force of the vector of, of the formality of Ben Gurion by, by creating a very generous public space, but one which is not defined by the rigid formality of a, of a closed geometry. So a higher arcade on one end, and then you've introduced this element, this really kind of stitching element of this canopy, which links and connects in a very sinuous manner uh, various elements within the site. And then I actually like the lower floor plan mostly where you, you can actually move from right to left across the drawing. It gets very clogged up with the ramp and the amphitheater the way yeah. they are right now. So that's something that I think really needs to be reworked and, and, and loosened up. Yeah. But I, I think the intention reads very, very well. There's a couple of interesting questions like how do you connect to one end of a long beach? And, and I, you know, I don't exactly know how to do that necessarily. It might be something to do with an environmental treatment. So the, the trees that show up in the diagram that are along the edge of the beach might be something to be reinforced and then met by this 
connective tissue that you're that you're introducing. And then I think at the scale of occupation, the intimate scale or local scale of what it's like to be under that thing, I think it's a question of uh, really gauging and, and adjusting how light comes down there and how what the relationship to light and sun in that environment might be and how it and what the scale of those spaces is. How tall is it and how does it connect to the generous central space? Yeah. So I think it's I think the intentions are present in the project. I think it's a doing some things in the right way. I think there's a couple key points where it really needs to maybe work a little bit more uh, generously. Thank you. I'll finish with a few um, kind of closing comments because we probably need to move on. Um, I think this is a very sophisticated, elegant project. Your drawings are very well done um, and help explain the project very well. And um, and it's especially looking at the renderings, I can tell that there's an elegance to um, the quality of the spaces that you've designed. Um, I would agree with all of the prior comments about um, being aware of um, who your um, kind of precedent projects are and um, remembering that those different precedent architects, Niemeyer and um, a lot of the Brazilian architects um, and many high modernist architects had downfalls in that um, similarly to how it appears that you've approached this project of very pragmatically solving connectivity issues by working the plan and working the section, doing your diagrams, um, and you've come up with a um, pragmatic solution um, that works. But uh, what we're not seeing is um, evidence that you've studied the culture of the people who live here. Um, is this a place where kids go? Is this a place where teenagers go? Is this a very wealthy neighborhood where um, people take a stroll in the evenings? Do people from other areas of town come here? Um, and how does, do these spaces get activated? Um, you know, in your renderings, I would have loved to have seen um, you know, one that points to some festivals that happen or um, kind of street life um, or thinking about that main square and, you know, invent some way that it might be activated. Um, there certainly, um, you know, you can look towards lots of different urban design studios of studying, um, you know, case studies of, you know, individual types of people and showing, um, you know, the day in the life of somebody who lives in the nearby neighborhood, how they use the space and then thinking about the life of somebody who um, you know, is traveling from somewhere else and how they arrive at the space, where they're coming from and why they would come. Um, doing those sorts of investigations will help you not fall under the same um, issues that kind of high modernist architects fell under where they designed beautiful spaces that no one used. Mm -hmm. I think the we designed is, um, is very interesting and we haven't been able to talk about it as much. Um, and um, I think that uh, probably deserves its own review. Um, but I, um, I do really appreciate the way that you've um, opened it up to let people go through the building. Um, I would love to see opportunities to bring some of that exhibit um, function down towards where um, people on the plaza walking through might actually see some of that um, exhibit so that you don't always have to enter the building to see it. It feels mm -hmm. a little bit removed, a little bit formalized um, in that sense, um, but it's, uh, it's a very elegant building. I think um, just uh, like a small response, I, I think we didn't do a good job of presenting the culture because like you said, um, mm -hmm. even though we were only there for, you know, like uh, two days essentially where how much we got to really experience this place. Um, I think one of the main sources that started us along this path was realizing how much of a, of a connectivity joint it was and the way that um, uh, John Bud described um, like the artery was that these people, there's a, no matter where you were, whether you were at the beach or the neighborhood or you were walking down from Ben Gray and all these people of Tel Aviv would be, would be using this site um, because of its uh, location and so like I think in an answer to the whether the 
which one is the destination. Um, in terms, I've always thought of it not so much as a destination, but as a connecting uh, joint that would allow people to move and offered the sub, sub, like the side programs as sort of a place that could be activated um, in the sense. Uh, I think there's um, maybe some, uh, I don't know how to describe it, uh, like one goes against the other in the way that I think about it, maybe because the, the plaza is a destination um, and we give no hint of that arrival that you were talking about. Um, and I think the problem was because I didn't see it as a, quite as an arrival spot, but more of a like passing through, um, which is what the landscape speaks of, but the building and the um, roof might speak of something else. Uh, so we definitely knew about some of the culture and the people who use the spot and how often it was used. I just think we um, communicate it or, or think about it as much as we could have uh, later in the project. When we were yeah. Something to think before. about as you show this project later on in your own portfolio is that most of the people who see it won't know much about um, where it is mm -hmm. unless you're applying for jobs in Tel Aviv. You know, I, I probably should move us on, but I, I should say um, I appreciate all the criticism. I, I think um, I think John Ronan's original comment like actually caught many of the successes, certainly of the urban design. Like I think there are like it was impressive the degree to which the three of you guys tried to look at all of these kind of different conditions the from and and sort of stitch this area of the city into its kind of neighboring areas. And I think that was kind of very successful. I, I mean, I think the what you didn't describe so well is this kind of lovely sequence that you had imagined of how you continued Ben Gurion um, in these kind of delicate ways of continuing the the trees and the the path across now a buried higher comb into a sequence that that from Ben Gurion would seem like it concluded in this final plaza, but from down there that would then actually one would discover a kind of more interesting. Um, continuation down onto the beach. I, I do think that there were uh, kind of key issues that were kind of pointed out that John's point about the, um, the kind of PCness, particularly underneath that um, Niemeyer like structure, you see it very clearly from here, like that, that kind of pivot at 45 degrees or whatever angle from um, seems kind of problematic. And, and, and Chris is kind of very uh, acute comment about actually how you start to imagine occupying this space. And, um, and how it, it is filled with life, so it doesn't become desolate. I think mm -hmm. in um, our conversations, in your conversations, like you guys had been imagining the ways in which these these places would be filled, but the, it certainly wasn't the the focus of the drawings. And I, and I think the design would get better at, as the those drawings focused on the real occupation as opposed to just the scale of a person. I lament that we didn't talk about the successes of the building because I know you spent a bunch of time on that and it's sort of vastly improved and there are lovely ways in which the kind of sequence uh, of the, um, this urban sequence you know, continues into the building um, from the way that the, the kind of main lobby starts to engage the city or the, the final places like the, the kind of um, uh, room for kind of banquets and things uh, gets this unbelievable view of the sea. And, but I, I think that, that sort of sense of meandering through the project and having a series of, of expectations set up and, and discoveries made, it's really kind of lovely. Um, and uh, I think we're suffering a bit from seeing one drawing at a time. <laughs> but but um, anyway, I think uh, there were, there were I, I saw many successes and improvements so I, that I appreciate. I'm sorry we need to move on, but um, thank you all very much. I appreciate the comments. Thank you for the comments. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys. If you guys would stop sharing the screen and then maybe um, we can get Camille and Amaya, I think, are next. Um, this is, I, I think I'm remembering that correctly. Um, th th this is a, a group of two, and they worked together on the urban design and then each developed a building on the same location. I think for, so we have enough time to discuss, it would make some sense for the two of you guys to present the urban scheme and then one after another present your buildings. And then, um, uh, uh, and then we can toggle back and forth depending on how the kind of critics want to approach it. Awesome, sounds good. Can y'all hear me and stuff? Yep. Just want to make sure. Okay, and y'all can see my screen? Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, I guess in terms of just looking at the city, um, we saw Kikara Tarim as looking very heavily towards um, 
historic Yafo, which was sort of the intention of the original Kikara Tirim. Um, the square kind of like diverts people down south, but it's super obstructive and um, very heavy handed. And that was part of the problem of that. But we, we tried to see the, the overall gesture was there to look to Yafo, which we found to be very um, significant because this entire boardwalk is sort of the most public and um, in terms of um, like having a civic presence, I guess, or having a very like, um, I guess like official boardwalk rather than just like a place along the beach where you can, you happen to be able to walk. Um, and it's very activated along the beach, especially down towards Yafo. Um, and so we found that um, once you get to the sort of this end point of Yafo, there's like a plaza and then it diverts into sort of the neighborhood area and the same um, around our site down this um, boulevard. Um, so those were sort of like the two bookends of the um, coastline there that we found to be the most important. And as you move up here, there's sort of a park and stuff, but it's a little bit more um, park-like and not as much of a like a beach uh, atmosphere. Um, and looking a little bit further into like the content of those two neighborhoods, uh, it's kind of um, dislocated, I guess, or disjointed because of um, Yafo's sort of zoning as it's like so historic and stuff. And obviously it's sort of split from the Bauhaus um, White City District, which is um, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So it's really um, like officially preserved in a very direct way. And so we found that the boulevard um, would really um, join those things back together again. Um, here are some site pictures um, of the existing condition, which was like the counterpoint to our inspiration, I guess, because we saw that there was so much um, obstruction in this um, intervention. And it's it's more of something that people have to traverse through and they don't really occupy it. They just try to overcome it in order to get to the next place and um, move south into the, to, to the beach because it's the only uh, beach access for a large portion of the boulevard along the coastline. Um, so the way that we found, or we thought to um, divert, or not divert, but like uh, solve the problem of the obstruction was to um, kind of like submerge some of the program and make it a little bit more um, visually like threading people throughout the, the site, like through these different terraces. Amaya, did you want to talk about this a little more? Um, yeah, so like while keeping the overall movement of the site towards Yafo, we also wanted to break down this very vast characterless plaza into a smaller into a series of these smaller cascading plazas, each with their own identity. So at the top you have like a kiosk level and boulevards. Um, in the middle you have a commercial level, and right at the end you have like a level with a wellness center, which is a completely individualized space. And um, the top level also connects to this boulevard, which we're proposing the highway gets converted into. So the highway is no longer sunken. It's a boulevard on the, uh, on the at grade, uh, which is connecting to our plazas. I forgot I controlled it. Um, these are just a few rough perspectives of the character we were aiming for. for. So this is the top kiosk level. This is like a smaller, more individualized plaza level for people to sit and get something from a cafe. This is the main commercial level with the cafes. Yeah, so with this, we were really trying to get at um, occupying the space because it's so vast with program and using landscape as sort of a like pseudo program sort of thing. Um, in order to break up the space because its expansiveness was so like uninhabitable. So that was part of that strategy. Um, these were some of the sketches of like main ideas we had of um, the fact that you could see the ramps coming like from down below. And so you can kind of see at every point you see where you want to go instead of having to overcome some obstacle. Um, and then extending the boulevard down into the um, into that plaza area and terracing everything down. And then these are some precedents that we looked at, um, kind of like looking at how like in the Olympic Sculpture Park, um, the views pull you through the site. This is another sketch of um, sort of going through the uh, 
process of like developing the directionality of the, the spaces. Amaya, was I missing anything? Um, no. Okay, cool. uh, these are some rough sketches or um, sections of just thinking about how the spaces would be occupied spatially underneath or the fact that they would be occupied in certain places. Uh, this is the master plan we came up with. I can zoom in a bit here. Um, so yeah, we just like detailed it in terms of um, the plaza areas and the terraces and then um, sort of using the landscape to continue the boulevard down and break it up, um, pulling you through the site again and kind of having rows of trees or planting in different ways. Um, just giving a lot of options for pathways and um, meandering through the site. And then at the end here, we have sort of like a more organic forest park sort of area that would just be more of like, an, like a lawn with trees and, and stuff and all kinds of landscaping there. Um, and then another part of our scheme was to um, was to realign the marina uh, with this boulevard, and so pulling the boulevard down where um, this stretch of like land comes out in order to form the marina, and then on the other side having a public pool there, which was part of the old program like 50 years ago or more than that even, but it seemed that it was like a very big public amenity, and so that was something we wanted to maintain and keep in in the site. And both of us, could you go back here? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, and the site to the left of the extension of the boulevard is the site where both of us have situated our programs, uh, which are both oh, yeah. museums. So the idea is to have like this built up area here, which then lets out onto the plaza and connects to the main, the middle level. Yeah. So then this in, in concept, it's kind of like this is landscape, boulevard and structure here. Um, and this is again just a view showing the different character characteristics that we were hoping to achieve with the sculpture garden on top, like a smaller sunken plaza, um, the plaza opening out onto the gym with these pocket gardens, and on the right, just a complete forest where you meander through it to get down. And the commercial strip, which is connecting you to the uh, museum. Mm -hmm. Sort of along here. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we have for the urban stuff. Should we keep talking about this or show other things too? No, I think you should move to the presentation of your individual projects and, and so quickly as possible so that there's some time for um, discussion and critics can, can ask questions. Okay. Um, so keeping to that point of um, the directionality between um, our site and Yaffa, um, and keeping in with the boulevard and directing people uh, south to the boulevard, um, just for reference the map. Um, I was looking at some precedents about sort of like having the civic presence and how they addressed um, views from far away and kind of like drawing people into the side and um, having a welcoming presence, I guess, and like a very visual presence. Um, so like on the left, it's um, David Chipperfield's um, some art gallery and then on the right, um, a Barozzi Vega project, which is also a museum. But um, I also was appreciating, I guess, the orthogonal orthogonalness of both of these plans, but then they both kind of have like a striking, like um, angular nature to them, or this one does in, in section. And then in the Chipperfield project, it sort of juts out at an angle from some uh, river, I think in England. Um, these are some super early sketches of how I saw that the site could maybe be masked in order to direct people, similarly to how we um, angled the terraces in order to direct people um, aiming towards Yafa and sort of that um, greater urban gesture. This is a super rough um, early axon. And then this is kind of a concept of developing the massing of um, how there could be like a, a civic entrance here. And then um, this could kind of push out and be seen from 
from this boulevard, uh, Ben Gurion Boulevard, and then also along the, the boardwalk that it kind of juts out at every angle. And then I guess I'll just quickly run through the plans, but it's kind of hard to like zoom in on them. But um, I guess basically a big, uh, I guess, perimeter that me and Amaya came up with was that um, our projects would sort of connect back at these two levels of like this 20 foot above sea level elevation and then this 10 foot above sea level elevation and sort of like still drawing people through the sites and have um, the greater connection to that um, beyond the constraints of just this plot of land for our site um, across from the terraces. Um, so then in this build, or I guess I'll just go through, um, this is the entrance and then, oh, I guess before I go on, sorry, I should talk about the program a little bit more. But um, so Amaya said that we both wanted to do museums. And so um, the Bauhaus is obviously super ingrained in Tel Aviv. And we went to the art museum in Tel Aviv and they had the Bauhaus archives like back in, the, in a back room sort of locked away and you had to make an appointment. And it was a little bit um, like underappreciated, I guess, even it's like everybody loves the Bauhaus in Tel Aviv, but they have it sort of stowed away um, in storage sort of. So I was thinking that um, that could be used to tell like, the, a greater story of Tel Aviv in a civic way that's not just a museum, but it, it has more of a civic presence and it's for the public. So the entrance would be here. And then um, in terms of archival space, this wall here, this is like a wall and it would be, or you'll see it later, I guess, but um, you would see like all the archives like hung up on this big atrium wall. And then um, there are two galleries here and here, which sort of are these flanking wings to this like courtyard stair that opens to the boardwalk. And then, yeah, I guess I'll keep going through. <clears throat> this is kind of hard with Zoom. So I guess this this um, exploded axon kind of shows how I tried to mediate the um, the elevation with the three masses. So this um, ground level, um, which is actually on the boulevard um, level or above sea level, 20 feet above sea level, and then you come down um, several feet to like a, a mezzanine sort of half gallery here, and Can then. Can you zoom in um, on that, Camille? Yeah. It's hard for people to see, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so then these these three masses are sort of all on different um, elevations in order to get you down to this um, other plaza. And then maybe I'll go back to the plans. Uh, let's see. So yeah, so here um, in this plan, which is um, the most upper level plan, which is the second floor, above the boulevard is where the archive space is. So I guess technically that's like the highest room in the archive space. Um, and so then that's where this archival wall is. And that's where um, it's sort of like the Yale like library. I don't know if you guys know that precedent, but where it's just like a library wall um, in this atrium. And then there's like um, archive space up here. And then I guess I'll move down in plan, sorry. And then, so on the ground level, this is the only space that's occupiable from the boulevard level. Um, and then in order to get down to the gallery spaces, you have to navigate through the elevation um, down into this space and then down again into this space, which is the, the last gallery. And these two galleries tell a little bit more, my intention was that they would tell a little bit more about um, the, the Bauhaus story, but in terms of um, including Jaffa in the story a bit too, because um, when the Bauhaus um, buildings in Tel Aviv were founded and construction, constructed, a lot of the um, inhabitants of like Jaffa and like um, the people who were already living there were sort of kicked to the side and that became like a rewritten history of Tel Aviv. So that was sort of part of the program that I was hoping would be included in that civic nature of the building. And then moving even higher, there's a like an observation tower that's sort of still part of the gallery, um, but it's kind of like a final 
um, destination and then like a light well as well to the galleries beneath and it looks to Yaffa. Um, so I'll keep moving with the sections, I guess. Um, this is a section of that atrium space coming in from the boulevard level, um, which is the, the highest uh, point on in our terraces and it opens into that highest terrace. Um, this is a section through the archive room, which is on the top here. And then um, sort of back of house is uh, nestled into like the back most bottom level. And I guess this section is probably the most telling of the entries about here. And then you have to come down and then finally come all the way down. And then you're sort of like revealed back into um, looking at Yaffa coming through um, the white city and then to the archives and then finally to Yaffa. And then this section is through that middle courtyard. And then this sort of shows how they all kind of like lay together. Um, so part of that like civic presence was that um, the gesture of angling the building in different ways was to have it be seen. Um, yeah, have it be seen from like different approaches. And then this is that interior archive wall. And then, um, uh, yeah, that big atrium. And then you come up these stairs and then this is the archive room. And then this wall can be accessed from that room. And then also from down here, but then you have to go down these stairs in order to get to the first gallery, which is this gallery. And it's a little bit sunken from that previous level. And then this is where it's sort of maybe part of the story of like Yaffa or something would be told or there could be temporary um, exhibitions. And then this is the courtyard, which could be accessed from that um, gallery. And it's also another secondary entrance. And then this is the lowest level and um, connecting to that tower, which is like a light well for the space. And that's sort of like the final, like I said, final point where um, it sort of starts to give more insight into, or it has like ingrained context in it, I guess, in terms of massing and um, the urban gesture. And then this is the view from that tower, if you were to go um, into the observation area, which is also a gallery. And that's what I've got. Okay, thank you, Camille. Amaya, could you kind of quickly try and go through yours as well, so there's enough time to talk about all of this? I think you're muted, am I? Um, so when I was walking around through Tel Aviv, one of the things that really struck me was the way that greenery was always part of the original urban design plan and how it had sort of mutated through the years. So you were left with um, like the actual Bauhaus buildings or the international buildings, giving the whole place a sense of unity and then this greenery coming and disrupting that and giving it a sense of individual ownership. Uh, and it was just used in many ways, like um, uh, open gathering spaces or restaurants out in the streets. Um, so my approach to design the museum was to have like the solid mass, which was punctured by various oculi, which corresponded to a certain view or um, like a certain important approach. And it has a courtyard in the center, which is um, which is almost like the datum within which you uh, like which you survey when you're in the museum. So the actual museum um, is a museum of conflict, and I was referring to a book in Status Quo, which basically talks about places like the Holy Sepulchre which is used by many different uh, religions and people have to navigate around using the same spaces. Um, uh, like, um, so these are just areas around our site views to previous areas of conflict throughout the years. So it's not just um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is uh, Manshia and Jaffa, there's also um, modern conflicts such as the Independence Park, which used to be a zone where uh, gay men used to uh, hang out and then uh, that got taken over by the city. 
and you're also looking out onto Ben Gurion, which is um, which is like the latest in the history of uh, Israel. It's, so, um, so this is just a diagram showing like the way I've programmed the space. So one of the things about the areas of conflict is that it's uh, like there are always areas of rituals and they're always impermanent and changing depending on the program. So apart from the main gallery spaces, you have a lot of lecture spaces, spaces for book readings and temporary exhibition spaces within it, usually corresponding to an important viewpoint. Um, and it's also complemented by cafes and bookstores where you experience that informality of, of nature and um, offices and archive research spaces. Um, for the circulation of the space, it takes uh, it takes place in this in the form of this ramp. And as you're ascending the ramp and then descending it, you're going through a timeline of the conflict. So you go past the Arab conflict and the independence spark. And then there's a point where you look out onto Beir Gurion and you uh, come back down and you exit through the basement, which is uh, where it corresponds to the era before this. This is a plan of the second floor. So it, uh, like you enter through this mid landing of, of our second plaza and you start ascending this ramp. And there's also a secondary approach to these archive spaces and office spaces for the employees, as well as the museum store, which I'll get back to. This is just a view of that approach, the main approach. Uh, so then you ascend up the ramp with gallery spaces built into it. Um, and over here, uh, like you have this um, glass arm which sort of cuts into the building. And then you turn around and you can keep going up the gallery or you can uh, be in this cafeteria over here. And this whole, this area is just a screen of um, semi uh, trans like translucent glass. So you get a sense of the trees outside, but you don't actually see them until you're in a more public space like this way, where, where it opens out onto that view. This is the highest floor. So after sending that ramp, you get onto this point over here where you have a view of Ben Gurion and that's sort of a pause point and you look back at the city and you also have small cutouts in these corners over here. So after sending this uh, main top part with, and there's steps over here so people can sit over there, uh, you start going back down and you start descending again. And you come back onto the second floor where there's a lecture room over here and you're again looking out onto the sea here. And then you come back down the steps. And at this point, you, you turn left and you descend even further. And this is the lowest basement level, uh, not basement, it's just the lowest level. And it talks about the era before, um, like during the Roman or Byzantine area. So the exhibition spaces are also arranged as a almost like a ruin with a plank um, above them and you're walking out and surveying them. And then you're finally let out onto the beach over here, onto the sea level, which is the lowest level. Uh, structurally, the whole um, structurally, this arm and this arm um, extends above, and it um, it sort of organizes the circulation. And over here, you have the main massing and the main thickness built. It's just the gallery space and the glass arm into it. Like you have small conditions where light is sort of allowed to trickle in through a small space. And the glazing, it sort of, it doesn't touch the slab, it just hovers in front of it to give it an even more uh, a lightness. This is a typical condition where you're so like you're walking through the gallery and you have like this translucent screen on the side and you see the trees. 
Um, this is a condition looking onto that glass arm, which uh, like so it physically lets in nature and and it also has like a sort of unknowable quality with so many la layers of glass. So you're not really sure what's happening. Um, and the trees within the courtyard are olive trees. So and this courtyard is sort of supposed to be like a idealized area in the center of a whole problematized museum of conflict. And so after going through this whole history of conflict, you come out into this um, grove of olive trees and you just sit over there and contemplate. And this is just a, another side of this where, where if these are the more public spaces, then only at that point does this become transparent and you look out onto the olive trees. Yeah, that's, that's my okay. Great, thank you. I'm sorry, we don't have that much time left to discuss, but I think the floor is open. And I don't know a good image to leave on, but maybe the critics will ask for something. I guess I can start. Um, it seems like you've, you've spent the bulk of your time on the building and, and it, it's, it's quite developed and uh, quite nice. Um, I, as a general comment, I would say, starting where you did, um, I like the strategy of the cascading terraces uh, to get to the beach, although I think the scale is a little bit too fussy. I like um, the building very much and, and very thoughtful. Um, and I like the idea of the swimming pool on the beach, uh, although that's, that's undeveloped. Um, I think those are all successful strategies. I guess <clears throat> where I think uh, the, the scheme could use more work is the integration of those three. I feel like at, in its current state of development, I could remove any one of those three pieces and I would never know that it's missing. So, the, the, uh, for instance, the museum that you're showing, Cultural Center, terraces down uh, much like uh, the, the plazas that terrace down to the beach, yet I don't see any uh, connection between the two. Um, I would like to see the pool complex pulled into the plaza complex, but it also is separated by this red promenade uh, that, that runs through. Um, so I think um, the, the weakness of the urban strategy is these hard breaks between the three pieces, which render them as three separate projects where we can discuss the merits of each, probably the building is the best. Um, but I really, my overall comment is I wish there was more integration uh, uh, and interdependence between the three pieces. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I, I like the, the, the carving of the ground, which is something which I think in the, in the urban plan, which really anchors the modification of the space, it does seem to stop on the one side of the Ben Gurion Boulevard extension. And with the aesthetic of the projects as they're presented, it seems a, like kind of a perfect setup for that to extend into or be reflected into uh, either of the two buildings that you proposed on the other side. So I, I agree with that completely. And uh, even more so the idea about if, and if you're redesigning the pools, uh, why not extend that same notion or idea to of what happens with those. Um, on the design of the buildings themselves, there's, I think part of this might be a byproduct of having to work, maybe not with a physical model or working in rendering. Both of them have a little bit of an aesthetic uh, heft to them, like the Marcel Breuer Whitney Museum, which is not of the early international style, it's a specific kind of 
look to them or aesthetic or, uh, or weight. And I, I don't know if that is intentional or a byproduct of, of, uh, of a default materiality. I think a little bit less so with Amanya's. I think the introduction of color and the way that it might bounce light around, I think is a particularly uh, uh, promising part of that design. Um, but it, it's present in both of those. And I was curious about if that's uh, deliberate. Um, I guess for my, my thought on materiality, me and Amaya actually kind of thought of the materials in different ways, I feel like, but they kind of um, turned out similarly, I guess. But um, I was thinking of it in terms of trying to marry, I guess, the Bauhaus, like the stucco material, but still referencing um, Yaffa and sort of like the history of the place with um, that stone and that very like um, tan materic stone. And also, I think we were thinking of the plaza in front as the sort of huge open space, and the building then is like its counterpoint. Mm -hmm. And I think I think John was correct in his assessment. Like unlike the last group, like the primary focus in the last at least several weeks has been the, the individual building. Yeah. No, there's a lot of good development there, so I appreciate that very much. Um, yeah. I, I think um, both of the building proposals are very uh, thoughtful and uh, well executed. I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but am I right in thinking if we go back to the urban design proposal, it seemed to me that one of the clever things that you did was to um, take the submerged um, artery, the main thoroughfare. It seemed to me that that was really what was problematic about the existing condition is that it wasn't so much that the road was um, submerged as that it was implicated in the, in the, the logic of the three-story building that was put there. And I, I, I think what you said is that you you resurfaced that roadway and made it into a kind of boulevard. Is that right? Oh yes. So yeah. The... I, mean, I have to. I, I just think that was an incredibly shrewd thing to do uh, to kind of normalize that. And um, even if it might be a busy thoroughfare, I mean, it's it's brought back into the the kind of fabric of the city, and and so not not seen as a kind of boundary condition, but actually as a, as a continuation of the city. Um, the other thing that I, it's just a, a comment after having seen the, the first two projects, but um, people refer to the boardwalk and I never know where it is and what it, and what it is. And it seems like it's um, in both of the projects, there's this, um, curiosity about the relationship between this site and the historic um, center of Jaffa and the boardwalk that stitches them together. Um, but it doesn't seem to have a kind of uh, either tangible or material expression. Um, anyway, that, I, I thought that the, the general strategy of this kind of fractured landscape um, taking up the 20 foot dif differential in, uh, in a section in like a good point of departure. And, um, and the buildings are both uh, engaging that, that do have a, have a kind of weight to them, which uh, is, is difficult to kind of gauge relative to other parts of the city from this, this viewpoint or my viewpoint, but, but uh, yeah, anyway, I, I think the work, you know, both both at the urban scale and at the scale of a building is in, in both both of your cases, very sophisticated and uh, um, great pleasure to be able to have a look at. Thank you. I would agree both um, together and separately. These are very thoughtful projects. Um, the um, public park aspect of it is um, feels very engaging and that it would um, be a lovely place to 
find a little shade and um, spend some time. I think it would um, be well used. And um, and then in terms of the um, your separate projects, um, I think Camille's project um, integrates a little bit more with that park in terms of the um, that the building opens itself up. Um, although I think it's very appropriate that Amaya's doesn't the program that you've chosen is. Um, really needs that intimacy of the courtyard when you're um, when you think of going to a museum like that that um, would be a very heavy subject. Um, I love that you acknowledge that and um, and provide this kind of cradle in the middle so that before you kind of walk back out onto the beach, you can have a um, some time to absorb what you've um, learned and experienced. Because um, that contrast would be rather jarring. Um, and, um, and just in terms of the, um, the way that you've developed the roof lines and uh, your fenestration, I think there's, um, there's a lot that you've considered here that um, is very advanced. Um, and uh, I also really enjoy um, the different um, elements of Camille's project as you progress through um, each of the different spaces um, and thinking about um, you know, the celebration of learning and the archives. Um, and then um, there's a lot of different dynamic things happening in section um, as you progress through the building. Um, in terms of presentation, I think um, uh, Amaya, um, in terms of integrating the um, perspectives earlier in your presentation, you're the first person to do that. And I think that's something that um, is really helpful when you're presenting, especially digitally, um, to kind of draw people in and help make connections if you're going back and forth between plan um, and rendering and like section and rendering that um, really helps us feel like we're in the project and understand it better. Um, so that would be a good um, helpful tip for um, later presentations. Both really wonderful projects. I think, um, <clears throat> yeah, I like both of them too. I especially like the tower gesture of the first project. I think it's too short. Should be um, more of a um, landmark kind of element um, along the beach there to kind of mark the end of that uh, Ben Gurion Boulevard. <clears throat> Doesn't have to be all occupiable, but as a architectural element, I thought it'd be more successful, higher. I think as far as the pools go, I think since you're studying precedents for the buildings, I think a precedent for the pool would be Caesar's uh, uh, Lace-Up Pool Complex to show uh, that which also terraces down from an urban level down to the sea and um, kind of shows how you could incorporate things like changing rooms and cafes and so forth uh, into that in, in, in one sort of integrated element. I guess one thing on that note, I guess one thing that was sort of challenging about the like in terms of the CESA pool strategy was that that was sort of nestled into a landscape that was existing. And this one is sort of all already the existing site is so built up and super heavy. So that was just something that I don't know if you have any other comments on that, but that was just something that we kind of thought through. And Lisa was a kind of a touchstone for many people. And I think that the distinction of it all being artifice was was uh, was a kind of one they wrestled with, and then some people actually have really wrestled with it in, in more directly. But uh, anyway, but it's a good precedent and it's a good point. I'm looking at both projects and just um, <clears throat> you know just asking myself the question about where the entrance is or where do you take something which has a real distinct presence and, and introduce or invite the interface between the public outside and the inside. And it's, uh, uh, Camille, I, 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 yours is, this is apparent to me uh, in that intermediate level. And my comment on that one would be because this park with its cleaved and modified landscape is, is directly across, there is an obvious opportunity to extend in some way the sense of the entrance and maybe even the two stairs that are in the project as being connected at least psychologically if not directly and visually with what happens in the area you designed 
across the extension of Ben Gurion. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very clear setup and opportunity to uh, uh, have that space, especially with buildings that are very, very closed and heavy feeling. I think I think those a lot of those don't work, and you should go study brutalist buildings. And the ones right. that seem to work the best have some sense of relief or extension, both spatially and in terms of light. And there's a very clear opportunity to do that with your project. And then Amaya's, I don't know where you, the entrance to your project is. I'm trying to determine that right now. Um, so the entrance is at the, it's when you go down Ben Gurion, it's at the second plaza level. The lowest. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's at this level where this pink line is connecting to it. The well, there are multiple level. entries, I think, no? Yes, there are multiple entries. The okay. main entry is um, uh, at the intermediate plaza level where you just continue in. Probably with all of those, it's, it starts with a little graphic exercise, which is to not just put your building in the middle of the drawing or the middle of the paper space that you're working on, but include into the area you're designing anything else that might be impacted or experienced as part of that spatial experience. And again, you have this powerful extension of Ben Gurion, and, and I think that how those spaces, because there's a cut line in the middle of the stairs I see right here, and, and I think it just gets better by including uh, the spaces that are uh, uh, adjacent and uh, connected. And Amaya, um, uh, just one other thing. I, I mean, go look at the work of Caesar because there's this thing that, that seems very present in your project where it's on the one hand very simultaneously heavy, but it also like reveals itself spatially in terms of being light. And it's a very difficult thing to do. And I think Caesar does it quite well. So it might feel very light in terms of the experience, but um, from the outside have some sense of real, again, heft or, or, or groundedness. Hey, Kevin, there's just, a, there's just a one semester studio. It's one semester, studio. yeah. And it's yeah. it's it's worth saying that that I mean it's this this kind of funny dilemma. Um, because of the timing of the, the trip and when we got back, like the, this has sort of all been developed in many ways um, after spring break. We got back just before spring break and then that was extended and anyway, so there's a lot of work. For me, That one of the great shames is that, that like particularly with um, these two projects, they've gotten through the kind of hard effort of sort of slogging through a building's organization and, and getting it kind of conceptually interesting and didn't get the pleasure of really developing it. But there, there are, nested in these designs is a lot of thoughtfulness, I think, from a kind of material sense that might be this restricted palette in some ways and then um, uh, and then kind of perceptual understandings of, of how you'd kind of experience that inner courtyard. And anyway, there are lots of things that are that I think they've been thinking about, but they haven't gotten to kind of enjoy so much. Yeah. I think yeah, also I, would I would encourage the students to do uh, when we're on the other side of this thing to do a nice model. Yeah. Uh, of, of those buildings in the site uh, to have in your portfolio because it's it really you know it merits that kind of extra work I think. I think the other thing about both of the building projects um, because as I understand it the, the students were um, given the opportunity to, to, to define the, the program so in part the two of you established a general idea of location and massing from your urban design study. Um, but you've also, you know, I think for a, a studio like this that gives you the opportunity to go to a, a new geography and a new kind of um, culture, um, you've both brought something of your perception of that culture into the formulation of the program for the building. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, you know, that has to be well, for me, uh, I understand that to be an, a significant part of the projects and that the architectural, um, what's the word, the, 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 that, that sense of kind of awareness of um, 
the, the kind of latent potential of something that you observed while you were away um, stimulates and, and uh, uh, gives rise to the imagination of, of these spaces in a way which I think has been extremely constructive. So, I mean, I mean again, I think both of you should be congratulated. Both the sophistication and the, and the degree of uh, accomplishment that you've managed, especially during these difficult times. So. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if anybody wants to say anything else. We're kind of, we have about five more minutes before we need to, to break. And I know there's only like a half an hour till some critics have to go to other reviews and things. But, but I was just going to say, like, there's a lot I really appreciate about both these projects. And it is true. I like ask them to pivot at a certain point from the urban things to focusing more on their buildings um, uh, before they really got the kind of integration in, uh, that John Ronan was asking for. Um, um, uh, but I, I think it was a very kind of apropos comment. I think things like it's lovely to see like perspectives like this one now. And I think it just points out like John's point, like actually that tower is such an amazing thing. And the way in which it's specifically present, I think is, um, you know, had, has yet to really be explored. Um, there is that other very beautiful drawing of, of the bottom of it where the, the kind of window that, that exposes the view at the top kind of allows light in at the bottom. And, and I feel like these, these things are kind of the start of something more than the finish. But I, I, I appreciate both of, both of the projects very much. I mean, from, from the programming to the, the kind of um, uh, um, the, the beginnings of this kind of articulation of, of pieces. That, I think the the, um, the 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 tower and this kind of cloister in in um, uh, Camille's project uh, that that um, that sort of supports and reinforces this kind of culture of the the Bauhaus and the cultural like identity of the place as it goes down to the sea or in in Amaya's project this kind of very beautiful program of a of, of a museum of conflict of all places in the world kind of an appropriate one. And then that the building is kind of problematized. You get this this um, kind of seemingly straightforward uh, building that is a, a kind of courtyard building, and then um, it, the, it, at every turn, it's kind of it, its straightforwardness is made more difficult. So um, from the uh, or at least problematized, it's not made more difficult. And and these like the kind of criticism that Chris was giving earlier about like just how a space like like you know this one. Sorry, you can't see my cursor. Like. This one that like might that looks back down Ben Gurion might be occupied would be kind of extraordinarily interesting drawings to start to pursue and to see how that affects the design. But um, anyway, I hope you all. Yeah, are I, I would add that uh, the drawings are very good, and particularly that first set that you were on a minute ago, the renderings of the first building. Um, I've never been to Tel Aviv, but I feel like I'm there when I look at these drawings. And um, they're very successful at conveying the desired atmosphere and, and uh, character of the architecture. And it's uh, given the nature of the profession and, and how global it is now, and, and it's not the last time that you're going to be asked to go somewhere cold that you've never been and kind of suss it out. and, and and figure it out and design something for it. And, and this suggests to me that you would be very good at that. Thank you. <laughs> Final comments, we've got about three minutes left. I, uh, I, I'm just chiming in, I haven't had a chance to contribute yet. I, uh, I also found the documentation to be very compelling. I um, um, the, um, um. The question of the brutalist buildings came up briefly, and I think that Professor Blood mentioned some really important things about how you know a geometry informal um, approach as bold as this one benefits from the presence of something a bit softer and maybe a bit more accessible. Um, it maybe it comes in the form of a more explicit entry. I do think that that transition between interior and exterior is a very magic moment in any building um, that uh, should be treated with a lot of uh, deference and and, uh, and care. Um, most importantly, is it you know a building that takes on, you know, notions of of um, uh, uh, I'd say it takes on it intentionally engages a, a profile of crude or a crude vocabulary, shall we say? Not to say that, to be honest, like I, it's a little bit projecting into your project. As a side note, I'm not I'm not actually sure we see the any details or 
you know, construction details or, or renderings that really speak directly to the notion that this would be ultimately a brutalist building other than the fact that, you know, it's fenestration strategy suggests a kind of massive profile, you know, seeing some of the kind of chunks in section and plan also reinforce that. But that doesn't necessarily mean, uh, but this isn't necessarily the case. Assuming that is, you know, a building that does do something, you know, and, uh, uh, or adopts those kinds of ideas often benefits from the presence of something that contrasts with it in order to demonstrate uh, commitment to that idea. Um, you know, things like the, uh, the Klaus Bruder, um, where a very refined door, an impossible door, is placed into a building that was constructed in probably one of the most primitive ways one can imagine. Um, you know, the, that's, that combination is very powerful. And I think that that's something that you know, the authors of these two projects should, should, should think very carefully about, because I, th I can imagine a series of studies at the scale of like uh, inch to a foot or three quarters of an inch or three inches to a foot that would would speak to how you know some of the uh, um, uh, uh, potential controversy in the programs might be very powerfully expressed in the kind of contrast that I'm thinking of uh, and that is beautifully expressed by that one zoom tour building. So. Um, I probably should take us off this to let people go to the, their next things. Um, are there final comments anybody else wants to add or? That's good, good projects. Thank you, Kevin. It's very nice. Yeah, yeah. nice to thank, thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you. Well, thank, well, thank you, critics, for the people coming back to join us. We'll, we'll start again at 1230. Um, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, I think some folks are going to disappear and come back, um, but um, uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to belabor this, but thank you to students and uh, critics very much. We'll see you guys in half an hour, I guess. Professor, Professor McDonald, good to see you guys. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to really socialize, but maybe a little bit yeah. later. Yeah. Thanks for the invite, Kevin. It was really, it was great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. What, Chris? Thank you. Uh, we don't have to go to a different site. Like I can no, just, no. just leave it. <laughs> but but turn your camera and audio off, Chris. Yeah, yeah, turn your but, audio off. For the people that uh, weren't here earlier, there were some significant um, technical difficulties getting some of like John Ronan and Chris McDonald on board. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Good job. So Mel has just joined us. I don't know how many of you all know um, Mel Lawrence. Welcome, Mel. Um, I'm sure Thank Simon and, and Chris do, uh, John Zott yeah. hey probably as well. And we have, I'm not sure if he's on or out with us now, Itai Friedman, who's an, an architect from Berlin and Tel Aviv and is uh, now teaching in San Diego. Um, because we're short on time, I think I just want to get started. Um, uh, and uh, Mel and Simon, like Chris was with us earlier, John was with us earlier. Is there some, uh, the first presentation I think is, is, has a bunch of background information as well. So I, I'm gonna let them just discuss, but if there's something that's not clear about the larger project, just you know, uh, ask a question. But if it's okay with, with you all, let's just get right started with the first group. Um, uh, um, I was just gonna remind folks that um, it's great to, uh, it's, it's, it would be great to uh, um, have a, a briefer presentation so there's more time to discuss. You guys want to? Yeah. Oh, noted. Also, okay. also, it would be great for everyone to mute. Yes, sir. For people not not speaking, if you would mute, that would be great. So, I don't know. I, I, it didn't seem like there was a problem with so many people with their video screens on, but if if we start to have a issue with um, with connectivity, we might want to take some of those off. But okay, Patrick and Aaron. Right, that's they're the next up, right? Yes, that's yeah. We're here. Excellent. Um, yeah, and if any point audio lags, uh, do let us know. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, and we'll get started. And I was just gonna make a suggestion to anybody that's having a, a personal issue with their own connectivity from their their own Wi-Fi. We found that if you call in on your phone and then mute your computer, that at least you get continuous access on your phone. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. So these guys have fantastic, they've dug all this stuff up themselves, these incredible images of what this place was like before the brutalist intervention. And they were unbelievably hard images to find. So I couldn't certainly, and neither could he tie. So. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right, so um, I am Patrick. I'm Aaron. 
and um, it's our project. So to begin, this image is of the is of our site in 1956. And what you could see here really tells a lot about Tel Aviv, um, the city founded, um, excluding you know the historical Yafo, which Tel Aviv itself is north of the um, ancient port of Yaffa. And Patrick Geddes made a plan around the turn of the century, uh, the turn of the 20th century of the city. And what's really interesting, it's this, you know, it's a beautiful plan that has this unique density and um, allows for trees and vegetation to grow. But it kind of had this weird relationship to the sea and the periphery um, sometimes was not really totally thought out, which also had to do with the mentality of the time of what people thought about seas and views and what people wanted to experience and where they wanted to be. So this image shows the Gordon Pool and the, um, sorry, the, the trying to get my annotate going, sorry. And this area here, which is a, um, an informal settlement, which Itai told me is called the Mabara in Hebrew. So at the time, um, after Israel got independence in 1947, there began um, mass migration and the city couldn't really hold all these new migrants. So where the Gettys plan didn't have an intense rigidity, these people were settling. So you see it here, there's people, um, settling all right on the beach because this is where the plan kind of broke. But then also you see in this image that people, that the city started to get wealthy and started to get more money and more formal. And so they built this beautiful pool right on the beach. And so you have this interesting dialogue between the two. And then about 20 years from now, from this image in the 1971, Kikar Atarim uh, became what it is now which is a giant industrial capitalist urban renewal scheme that literally blocks the city from the sea. Whereas in this, you can see that the relationship to the sea is informal, but it's not a brick wall that's blocking people from it. So our main goal of our project is to extend the city of Tel Aviv to the sea through Ben Gurion which is the street you see here. And this is a whole zoomed out plan of the city. And you could see the really nice avenues that Patrick Geddes designed. You can see the coast and right around where our site is, you also see the breakwaters out, which are used to create more inhabitable beaches for recreation. And the, ben, the Ben Gurion uh, Boulevard extends all the way back to Rabin Square, which is the actual center of the Tel Aviv and the government of the city. And Ben Gurion himself was the father uh, or one of the founding fathers of the state of Israel. And so our project really is taking this plan and just extending it out by getting rid of the massive wall that is Kikar Atarim. And, and, we, uh, yeah. and no, Pat, you, could, you, you can start, I'll, I'll pick up on the tail okay. end. So the big, the big move what we're doing here is right now, um, Harkon, I believe it's called, the street that runs along parallel to the coast, goes underground at the point of our site and what we're doing is we're getting rid of that tunnel and we're bringing it up to the surface and slowing down traffic like a lot of cities are doing now with the coast because people wanna be by the ocean and they don't want a highway blocking them from the sea. So we're making it a surface condition and continuing the city out to the sea and then actually into the sea with an extension of Ben Gurion. Yeah, and, and something also that was notable in the historic photo Patrick found was that Ben Gurion pool. Uh, it's interesting with the Gettys plan not addressing the beach condition. It's interesting whenever what happened, what the city decided to build on it. And I think it's, 
notable that a pool was to, uh, chosen to be built because it really does act as a sort of singularity to attract people from Ben Gurion and it kind of adds a nice end to it. Um, and Pat will go into this a bit more later. But one of the big moves we wanted to do was introduce uh, Gordon Poole, but align it with uh, to be perpendicular to Ben Gurion and to look out towards Jaffa and to serve as a way to attract people, uh, but to also just continue this grid um, and extend Ben Gurion. Uh, programmatically speaking, we've designed or we've set apart these buildings to be, um, as shown, we have a uh, up to the most east. These three buildings are housing. Uh, and then we have uh, the sailing school, which has largely been repurposed. Uh, there was already some type of sailing amenity there, but it was primarily private and separated from the public. So moving it here and incorporating it with a larger marina. Uh, and then we have a mixed use housing uh, and commercial development here. Uh, and the distinguishing parts between these two elements of housing is we wanted to respect these avenues that uh, naturally form in the Gettys Plan. Uh, it's really interesting. The Gettys Plan was designed actually for pandemics. And I'm not kidding. This was like, I discovered like Pat and I read this in like January. And it, the spacing of the city was to prevent um, pandemics from happening, to keep houses separated, uh, and also to allow fresh sea breezes to enter uh, on all corners of the house. Of, or of the development. So these houses were to more respond to this uh, neighborhood scale behind it. Um, and then they, this housing development uh, was made to more respond to this band here. Uh, and then we have a greenhouse, uh, which acts as sort of a campanile. We'll get into all these in a bit more. Uh, and then lastly, we have a city breakwater, uh, sort of an end monument uh, to uh, unite the whole band. And we'll go into that all in a bit more. Um, so now we're just gonna go through briefly each one of these uh, buildings uh, in the program and get these, like and some perspectives and such yeah. and some plans. Yeah. Um, Aaron, really, really quick, just to point out um, for a sense of scale, the pool that you're seeing, since we all know it, is pretty much exactly the size of Barton Springs, which I use to, to get an understanding of what a big pool might look like. And this is actually roughly the same amount of area. So, just to, to give you what, what the size of this is. And also to get a sense, right now, these three buildings are the current hotels, which also did this weird thing to separate the plan, which we we're trying to fix. And about now, the break, the groin extends out from here as so. The, the coast is actually more like here. And the pool is here, just, in, just so we all understand the overlay of this is the existing condition versus what we are doing now. Yeah, yeah, that's well said. Um, so we'll start with talking about the baths. Uh, so the baths, this is sort of a dual program. Um, it's sort of a city garden as well as a bathhouse. Something that is really unique to the Gettys plan it, it is how it addresses the sea. It doesn't really, it addresses it in the spacing of the cities by, or in the blocks by allowing wind to pass through it, but it doesn't really address water directly. Uh, it, it sort of does if you track the tree line as it goes to the sea, you can kind of track water that way. But something Pat and I wanted to do was uh, comment and harp on um, Israel's connection to the sea and its usage of water. So that came into using we found this precedent, which it, they're called graduation towers. They exist throughout Europe, um, but they're a way of turning a slightly sa saline water solution into a more saline water solution. And these ones were used to produce salt, but they're also, there's a lot of therapeutic um, uh, side, not side effects, therapeutic, uh, I'm blanking on the word. Yeah, uh, Medicinal? Yeah. Uh, that medicinal elements that can come from it too. Uh, so we wanted, we thought this was an, a great opportunity with the Mediterranean Sea being close and being a body of water that's about the right amount of salinity um, to use this type of material uh, in a way that creates a moment of seclusion. So this is a perspective looking northeast um, and essentially 
with the graduation towers, the thought is that you take these thick walls, which are three feet, and you create sort of a secluded garden that responds with mass one being here, mass two being here to the city scale beyond it and allows passage through and creates sort of a moment of seclusion uh, as a transition to the beach. Uh, here's just elevation of the north facade, or sorry, west facade. Here's the north facade. Uh, and this is a the first floor plan and you can this perspective is taken here, looking this way, this way, uh, and having these moments where these tall walls are uh, creating these microclimates um, that, uh, as the seawater evaporates down, fresh water rises, which creates a great uh, area for plants to grow, and creating sort of a garden space in that. And this is a courtyard perspective. Uh, the thought was you have these per perimeter moments, which are more for staying and looking out into the central courtyard area. Um, the central courtyard area has a tower which um, sinks below to the bathhouse. Um, and this is a good time, I probably should have started with this, but the bathhouse is uh, accessed through this building. Uh, there's an entrance here. Uh, let's see, entrance here and then exit here. Um, and this is sort of that view looking down those stairs where these uh, walls continue down uh, and then lead to the pool beyond. And then this is a view of what that the, uh, one of those pools could look like. This is in this corner looking this way. Um, and since these walls can get up to 100 feet. There's a lot of surface area for water to percolate down, which makes a really high concentration of salt water. So the thought being that you could float in these this submerged sort of bathhouse. Um, next, we'll go into the housing and commercial. Um, Pat will talk about it. Just to add in quickly, there is a certain culture of that with the Dead Sea in Israel, for sure. And if, if he hasn't explained it that, that, well, at some point you should explain what the material reality of those graduation towers are. Sure, yeah. yeah. So, so um, the- oh, oh, Go for it, Pat, sorry. Okay. So one of the most difficult parts of this was to figure out how to mitigate the kind of intense hotelization along the shore where they, you can kind of see the Getty's plan versus, you know, these three hotels um, and how we were trying to create, you know, our scheme and understand that we want to continue out, but we also needed a way to transition. And that part of the reality of this is that this is, you know, amazing seafront views and properties. Um, so we wanted to kind of ease into the, the, the the scheme with a building as, as such. And one of the opportunities we saw in, the, in, in pursuing this building and in general with the site is the grade change. So by leveling off Kikaret Tureem, you get around be between 24 and 30 feet of grade change. And when you start at the top, as you can see, you know, when you're here, the building is meeting the street, but then the first floor floats on pilates like you see throughout the city, which allows you to slip under the building and creates this moment of an inner courtyard. And then also the idea was to have a restaurant here that looks out west onto the scheme at large, which you see on the perspective, so that you would be in this, you know, restaurant and looking out with people playing in the pool, the whole Ben Gurion going out to the sea, the sailboats, the mass, the sun setting, and etc. And then um, you, 
see in plan how the building bends around and uses kind of the existing fabric to transition from the hotel to the, uh, the grid of Tel Aviv and how the grade change creates this interesting moment when once you slip around, you can get into it to create an inner courtyard, um, kind of riffing off Habima um, Square, which is another major square in Tel Aviv. So next we'll talk about two buildings which are separate, um, but in a similar area. So we'll talk about them at once. Uh, the greenhouse and the sailing school. Um, the greenhouse is, um, Kevin mentioned this briefly, uh, it, it utilizes that same graduation tower um, material, um, but central to, before we get into that too much, it, one of the main thoughts behind this tower, um, we kept, you guys are familiar with the term Campanile, but it's a, it's a cultural tower that represents a community. Um, and they're usually in Italy. Um, and so we were thinking, okay, what's the culture of Tel Aviv? How can we represent it? And it's a garden city. The Getty's plan is so about um, the fauna uh, and flora of Tel Aviv and just the greenery. So we, we really thought this in making some type of greenhouse, a vertical greenhouse element um, could be a great way to uh, reflect and attract the culture of the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, and then the sailing school, I talked to it a bit before, about it a bit before, but uh, it's when it was previously more private and secluded in the original uh, key cart at Turin, uh, our approach is to make it a more of a public uh, amenity. So here's a perspective uh, looking south, uh, down towards Jaffa. You can sort of see it in the background here. Um, and then in plan, so what you have is this is that main thoroughfare, Ben Gurion, um, and, it, and it, our tower juts out, is actually pulled away from the grid, um, which creates sort of a visual interest when you look down uh, Ben Gurion to attract people. Um, while this garden, it, it, uh, it, this greenhouse offers a unique vantage point too from the top where you can get sort of sweeping views uh, of all of Tel Aviv, um, but then there, so that's one element and then the separate beat, the second being uh, the sailing school, which is this building here. Um, I guess now, oh, we can talk about that actually in a bit. There's a better slide for it. So here's an elevation. Um, this would be the Eastern elevation of the two elements. And here's a section, um, and this is where we are, Kevin was talking about the culture of saltwater reuse in Israel. They're one of the foremost leaders in water desalination. Um, and originally we toyed with the idea of making our whole site a desalination plant, uh, but it was very cumbersome. So we looked for other methods and the graduation tower was a really, I feel like a unique material opportunity to do this passively which was essentially just bringing in water from the Mediterranean, um, pumping it up, and then as it evaporates down here, it produces a salt water brine um, that can be used for creating salt, but then fresh water actually rises up. So this whole tower would be filled with fresh water. Um, and the thought behind that being that it's sort of this, this greenhouse that you can uh, walk up to, get sweeping views, but also um, walk through a sampling of all of the Gettys plants that Patrick Gettys designated for the city. Mm -hmm. um, and here's another double section, maybe not a necessary drawing. Um, and then this is the sailing school. Um, we were looking at the program of sailing schools and they're really, we first, we kind of took a dumb approach to it, thinking it needed to be a school with classrooms, but it doesn't make sense for there to be classrooms when the school is actually happening out in the water. Um, that's why you go to sailing school to learn how to do it here. So the, the building more became a use of a way to uh, solve some practical needs of a sailing school, which is you need a place for sails to dry, you need places for staff to stay. Um, and that became an opportunity to create this sort of sectional quality where 
the roof rises, allowing for varied height sails to be attached um, above and dry out uh, and create sort of a visual play along this walkway here. Yeah. And so they, oh. Oh, sorry. Don't look. <laughs> sorry, Aaron, did you uh, mention the material of the brine wall? Yeah, sorry. So maybe going, yeah. Um, so how that materiality works uh, is as in Europe, they do it different ways depending on the local species around, but they use blackthorn branches. And it's essentially just a loose frame. If you look in the plan, it's like a very loose frame that you just stuff full of sticks. And as water drips down it, it percolates and evaporates. Um, yeah, I probably should have started with that. That's all right. All right, let's keep going. Um, so now we're going to transition to the city pool. And um, the pool is really inspired by well, what was once there. All right, next. Yeah, yeah I'm done. So what was there was this, you know, magnificent pool that had a weird relationship to the sea, I think. But, you know, at the time, people were flocking to the water and you can see the abundance of you know, Israelis and maybe tourists that were there in these pictures taken from, you know, the late 50s. Um, and, and I thought this was, you know, beautiful. And I think that that interest in swimming and the relationship to water um, is is kind of on the re a resurgence again, like the Lidos in Britain are being um, renovated and people are flocking to them. Barton Springs is, you know, still an amazing place. We're really trying to understand what makes these places great, which is largely just having a lot of space and people. And so you see here um, the kind of experience I'm going for with the pool. And um, one of the big things with our project is we're destroying what was there. So using the destruction of Kikar Atarim to actually rebuild this groin, this breakwater into the sea and this building. So the pool house itself is um, in plan is in the center is these heavy rubble walls built out of the destruction of Kikar Atarim flanked by these light um, platforms held up by thin columns and kind of enclosed with light fabrics that are providing shade and more of just a viewing platform. Um, and then in this, drawing, you get an idea of the kind of materiality of the rubble walls and how when you're entering, you're in this space that is heavy and light and it views the dis in the distance, you could see the rest of Tel Aviv to the south and Yaffa. And yeah. And so inside the pool house, you get these moments of, you know, kind of the extreme of the open air and being in these rubble walls. So when you go to shower and rinse off, you're surrounded by these rough textures and the crisp sky above you. And that leads you farther down to the end of the extension, which is a moment of under, so you would slip under the ramp to this moment of being at, at front with the sea, which, which so to the, and the perspective, you know, to the left is south and those columns open up the light to come in. And in front of the four months, foremost break, breakwater, there's a pool. So the rough sea is blocked. And when it's rough, the water would be splashing in, but always, right here is a pool to collect water. So that way there's a reflection inside that would create these interesting light caustic conditions. And it's, it's kind of the, at the end of the dock, it's you and the sea kind of alone. And it could either be rough or it can be quiet, but regardless, there's gonna be um, kind of a sensory experience like so. And here you can see, understand and plan this is the ramp, the ramping up, and then you would slip under to come under. And yes. 
And then when you get to the very end of the dock, or sorry, of the extension, there's you come up and you look back upon uh, the city of Tel Aviv. And what I really thought was interesting about some moments like this, there's other moments in the city, like uh, there's a sculpture called The White City by the Israeli artist Danny Caravan. And it's moments like these when you have a chance to actually, the project is about the city and not just about the sea and that view, which is under you, but a chance to actually come up and be at the same elevation of Ben Gurion's house, which is, you know, a thousand feet the other way, and to look at the city that is upon you and that is being extended onto the sea. And to finalize the kind of bookend of this is Ben Gurion's house right here at a similar datum to being up here over the canopies and looking out upon the city of Tel Aviv. And I think that concludes our presentation. So we basically started the presentation up here and walked our way down to the end and then looked back just to surmise. Could you bring it back to the original urban plan? Uh, hold on. Right. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, I'll I'll just start off. Um, this is a really really smart, well thought, well developed project. And in that sense, although I I think uh, architects we all should be more humble. I think this is one of those moments where you should be extremely proud of what you've done. I'm, I'm, I'm quite opposed to the idea of, of the road going under and I've, I've vocalized that, but in your specific case, it just works because you complemented the Gettys plan and you actually, uh, you did mention that uh, um, the relation between the sea and the city and, and part of the Gettys plan was this idea that the boulevards do end in the ocean and you get that kind of journey towards and you actually complemented it by extending it in. Um, so so I, I think based on all the proposals I've seen from the round table, which was uh, an event done by the municipality in order to get some ideas, they brought all the architects in to think, I think this is by far one of the best proposals I've seen um, more so from foreign architects, students that really um, just picked up on what they needed to pick up from the city and created it. Uh, regarding the program itself, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more skeptical if it would work. Uh, I, th I think the bathhouse and the spaces that you created, um, even though the concept and the connection to the Dead Sea is, is great and I, and I love it and I would definitely keep it, um, the spaces on the ground floor and these kind of uh, seclusion spaces, I'm not sure how much Israelis would feel comfortable in such a space uh, uh, or how much that would be promoted. Um, so that's something to think about. And, and, and with the tower, uh, even though I, I actually like the concept, uh, 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 I'm just not sure. Uh, and the sailing school, I actually have to disagree with you. Classes, there is another sail scaling school around on the Arcon and they do have actual physical classes. Uh, it's something you start at a very young age in Israel and if you develop a skill set to it, then you join the, the uh, Israeli army unit that actually is connected to the sea. So they actually do study it quite intensely. So I think that could be something that you could have just improved on in that sense. Um, so it's not just a place that people go and, um, and uh, get equipment and just, you know, sail or enjoy it. Um, besides that, I, I think that um, the, the moments, the, the, the extension, the new pool, the reuse of materials, they're all, you know, um, yeah, you, you sold your project well and it does work really, really well. I think your last drawings, because everything is presented amazingly, but your last drawings were not the best and they sort of a bit hurt. So you we went up and then sort of went down a bit uh, and sometimes it's better not to. But that being said, 
I would kindly ask you to write a two page in English summarizing your project so I can translate it to Hebrew and then um, present it to the mayor because I do think that this uh, project does, um, you yeah, know, some acknowledgement should be taken. So please do that and I will spend the time on that. Um, the last thought I have is that maybe your boulevard that extends, um, knowing Israelis, they're gonna occupy it and that means that you're gonna have uh, uh, street uh, artists and you're going to have little people, you know, wanting to buy booths to sell their, you know, it's going to become a thoroughfare of its own. So maybe could have been a bit wider just to accommodate this kind of people taking it over and making it uh, uh, for themselves. Um, yeah, but that's a great project. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm really um, happy to hear the, uh, previous comments and do do agree. Uh, just speaking of Geddes for a few moments, Geddes is a very important figure and he was extremely well received in Tel Aviv. And um, I think, as you know, he was uh, a botanist, uh, one of the first people ever to talk about uh, the uh, role of the relationship between botany and city and architecture. Uh, one of the first people to talk about clean air and health in the city and people understanding uh, what cities could be. So I, I agree, I had to struggle a little over the bathhouse but Geddes has a very important point that he writes about under the heading of cloister and um, feeling acts of detachment as well as acts of social space and this interplay between the two. So there may be something in that that you could capitalize upon. He, he then uh, particularly uh, developed understandings in, in what was his work was different from the Garden City movement, but, but related, but the idea of a green space and botany in the city. So I wanted to come, I've got two or three questions, concerns. Uh, the first is uh, the most remarkable tower. So I can look at it and say, you know, this is part of an architectural language where we're trying to find a way architecturally of creating buildings of distinction with height rather than buildings with little purpose in height. And it's something that we perhaps haven't addressed very much. Historically, height had a very important symbolism of purpose often leading to spirituality. So I'm seeing this as a multi-purpose tower, but in all of this, you didn't quite define what the greenhouse is. So I'd like you to talk about this more. Yes, we understand uh, the water, though I wish you'd have talked about the way that maybe you could have introduced solar energy of the way of moving that water, but that's a very, in a way, a small point. But what goes on in the greenhouse? How, how is it activated as a social and botanical space? So, um... The, I don't want to go back through all the slides. Um, the, so the ground plan, um, it, it, the tower was more designed to be not necessarily a social space within the tower element, but more used for maybe a handful or so staff to use it as a greenhouse, but then use the ground floor area as more of a market to sell that produce. And while there is a function and it, it does allow people to go up to the top to peer out, that's not the primary function. Um, the primary function is more of, uh, we have imagined it as more of a uh, one of like producing for people below. Okay, Erin, let me interrupt you. That is a really important point and particularly in your, your address to the mayor. Israel has been one of the, the leaders in developing uh, agricultural research. 
and to really address this as a way of an education and productive um, resource and to put that as a symbolism of the city, I think there's something really quite poetic about uh, what you could capture there. I, I love the graphics of that as well. They have a, they have a, a very strange patina to them that I find really quite conducive in terms of what you're trying to say. In other words, you haven't addressed this project as being glitzy and glaring in the sun, but you've addressed it as something that has, I, I think, a, almost a semi-reverence as well as being a social space. So now moving on, the 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 whole point of Ben Gurion, and and I think the way I read um, Tel Aviv, is very much in the way of um, a Richard Senate principle uh, that democratic space is is literally that that it's about the meeting of people who are different and accepting difference and embracing difference. So ex extending this with the promenade and the pool, I think is really important. But you didn't say anything really too much about the social environment of this promenade, mm -hmm. which I think as it's addressing the sea and laterally the pool, or also the climatic environment of it, I could see that it could possibly, unless you treat this very carefully, become um, uh, environmentally difficult to handle with the, mm -hmm. with the glare of the sun. And I'm not seeing anything that you're talking about in terms of social solar protection. So could you address that? Yeah. Um, are you talking? Yeah. So what, what's interesting, Aaron, can you go to the slide that has the 2D plan? I think it's a uh, yes. farther down. Twenty-five. This one. Uh, server twenty-five, please. So, yeah. So to your to your point, um, it's it's, it's really it was hard to draw and kind of nearly impossible. But Ben Gurion has on the north side this darker hatch here. Yeah. Is a bike lane. So that is continued down. And the lighter hatch is this, it's really an intricate fabric of pavers that are going from hard to soft um, that kind of allow for growth and people walking. So the idea, and it's, it would be, I mean, it just, it's, it's a really thought out plan. It's almost like the high line with these fragmented pavers. But the idea would be just to take that great existing condition and continue it out onto the extension. So I'm just showing in this drawing really kind of pragmatically that the bike lane and that existing condition of soft and hard kind of mix is continued out. The biggest solar protection is the pool itself has the, the like the sitting area is protected by um, by a, a floor on one level and then a light shade structure on the top. And then the extension itself is, it's kind of, it's um, not kind of, it is green up until roughly this point and the protection comes from the trees. And then when you get to the end, it is kind of, not kind of, it is a square in the much more uh, like plaza sense where there isn't much protection. The sun coming from the south would protect you a little bit from these colonnade here and the ramping up, which would cast shadows into the plaza here, but there is no formal um, shade structure there. But that's like the end of a peninsula. I mean, it will be windblown and I mean, you're really yeah. sticking out yeah. this farther than anything else. And I, I think that is an issue was to have this, you know. I, I think that the end line. is what it is, is trying to be a very different expression. I simply think that if you can to really bring out the, the um, social and environmental quality of why you're on that, maybe a section 
of what I'm calling the promenade, uh, mm -hmm. I think would really help your project. Mm -hmm. and maybe yeah. one in really detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we had one of those earlier, um, just to like delineate with sort of the Jan Gale uh, cross section. Uh, but yeah, it, the main moves were really continuing what did exist and doing so the primary shade being from deciduous trees and coniferous trees. Um, one thing that we also did, uh, I'm gonna clear this real quick. Um, there is, so we continued the deciduous trees down Ben Gurion, which is something that's unique to the city, but then along this running pathway, there's always palm trees for some reason. Um, so that was a way we kind of tried to offer shade to this, but I, I do think you're, there, there's some potential for it to be pretty, pretty bright. Yeah, I mean, Aaron, can you go to the la very last slide? Just to see, I mean, it's hard of the digital. Uh, can you just zoom in on the promenade out to the city? I mean, it's still kind of rough. It's been, we try, we try to make our presentation work on a digital scale, but so the idea when you're out on this promenade is there's the kind of datum of the pool house floors, which are right above the tree lot canopy. And then there's the canopy itself, which is just below what you would be viewing at when you get to the final point. And so to your point, Simon, like I think it's it would be like a drawing like this, but really much more experiential of what this mm -hmm. what it is what this is is if I'm uh, understanding you correctly. But just to be clear, like much of the identity of Tel Aviv is these incredible tree lined boulevards um, with dappled light and the, all the life that's happening in them. And I think one of the things that is so powerful about this scheme is this idea that you would, instead of concluding Ben Gurion as it does now, which is this kind of fizzle into the into a, a really not very interesting place, is that the 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 ground of the, the street becomes figure as it comes out and becomes a pier, but that same dappled light condition and everything would exist almost until the end. Yeah. I have a couple of questions about the pier. Um, you, you mentioned the height at the end of it. I love how um, the gradual incline and you get to look back at the city. But when you mentioned that the height was established by um, trying to match the home of a influential person, I I question that. I mean, I think that's notable, but I think for the vast majority of the people that arrive at that moment, um, they're not going to know that. And so, I think sometimes the criteria is it's if that's the right place to stop and that's the right height for you know what you're looking back at. Uh, I think that's good, but I think I I mean you can. I'm just asking about that really, but um, I hear that a lot in reviews where things are referred to because of something of significance, which I'm not trying to downplay the significance of his role, but I think that if you're placemaking, um, that viewpoint should be, there's other criteria that's probably yeah. more important. I and, feel like I maybe shouldn't have said that just to be like, it's more just about when you're up here, you are seeing over all of this which you, yeah. allows you to look back into the city. And that, that was more the point that, that, that it's more coincidence that okay. that house is there. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. And also I was gonna say in the same, it's part of that extension. And the I have a question about the pool too. These mm -hmm. are minor things, but cause I think this project's really strong. Um, on the pool, it's, it, it had, I love that orientation and how you could get in there and you could just swim out to sea. Uh, almost toward the horizon, so to speak. And, uh, but at the end of it, um, it stopped short of clearing uh, the pier. And it's just such a low wall. I, I was wondering why you didn't, cause I want to swim to the end and have the full sort of 180 panorama and be feel like I was out there at the edge along with the boats. It's sort of a place of vulnerability yeah. being out there in the water. It seems like, I was just wondering why did it stop uh, short. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point and question. Um, it's funny you mentioned that. I actually, that was a change I made. Originally, the pool went out to like here. Um, 
And that was, and the idea is still now, like, you know, there is, it's not complete 180 at all, but you are still vulnerable and the waves would be crashing. But one thing that I, I thought was funny, and this might've been too much of a formal thing was that if the project was really about Ben Gurion, then I, I told myself that maybe that it should take precedent and that it should be the most farthest thing out into the water. And so I pushed the pool back in to give the prominence to the, to the actual street itself and not the pool. Um, so, and I, I think that was something I grappled with a lot and Kevin knows that because a pool, this, this relationship was mirrored as you just said before. Um, but I, it was trying to, you know, you have this moment where the, the existing groin is kept and though there's this little dinky lighthouse out here and these are all the rubble or sorry, rocks of the groin. So you have these moments of just being completely windswept, the kind of being more, you know, kind of harness in between the ramps and then being again out at sea and kind of being rocked by the, by the waves in the pool. And it was hard to know where the push and pull and, you know, does the pool go farther out? I, I don't know. I, I decided to make a split section decision to pull it back in and let you know, the, the street be the farthest out, but it, it was a hard decision. Okay, jump in. Um, it's a it's a lovely project. I think we saw one earlier um, today that also took the, the tunneled um, road and, and resurfaced it, which I think is a really smart thing to do. Um, this, um, so we, we've never met. So I'm, I'm going to step out of character for a moment and talk about some things which have to do with composition. Um, I, I think there are aspects of the project, the, the project that is at its heart and the, the thoughtful response to the Geddes plan and the archival photographs that you dug up, um, you know, is, is just such a great way to start the project. And at the heart of the project is, is making a pier as a conclusion to the boulevard. And in a way, you, you, I know the other project, the, the sort of uh, the scale of architecture projects are a little bit more uh, gestural just because of the time and um, constraints that we're working under. Um, but I think the pier itself is uh, undernourished maybe this goes back to Simon's question. I can't think of any reason why the, the bathhouse, or not the bathhouse, but the, um, the kind of changing room building should be symmetrically disposed. I can't think of a single reason why the platform for lying out and lounging in the sun should be uh, both opposite and um, symmetrically disposed in the other um, vector. Um, I, you know, I, I know nothing about the culture of Tel Aviv, but I can certainly imagine that the pier, um, left to its own devices would start to accumulate other kind. it would be a kind of armature that other kinds of, um, you know, more or less regulated construction would start to happen. I mean, you know, what's the point of a pier if you can't get a cold drink and a, you know, and, and something sweet to eat? you know like where, where do you get the ice cream where do you get the melon mm -hmm. um so i i guess you know all, all of this is easy to say in hindsight but in a way i wish you'd um you know kind of grab the bull by the horns and and taken the pier on not as a sort of um uh, uh what's the word you know, like a kind of, oh, well, that's landscape. And then we just extend the, the landscape of the boulevard out under the pier. But there's a moment of transition where it becomes something very dif different. Um, there's also a moment of transition in, in terms of time where, you know, you show these, what I can only guess are cedars of Lebanon um, as full full grown creatures, but, you know, the, it would take it would take a considerable amount of time before the dappled light that Kevin alluded to would occur on this pier. So that seems like a kind of interesting study. Um, 
So that that's a kind of low hanging fruit, I suppose. Um, the other thing that I think, uh, could you, if it's easy to do, if you could go back to the historic photograph of the, um, uh, what do you call them? The the thing that that, that makes fresh water and collects salt. Oh, yeah, sorry. Graduation tower. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, um, Kevin was just chatting with me um, on the side and uh, asked if I'd ever seen these before. And I had a German student years ago in, um, when I was teaching at SciArc who introduced me to these things. And they're, they're pretty remarkable, but I cannot think that there's an architect alive who would see these two images and then in their rendition of a contemporary version of one of these graduation towers, uh, not understand the role of the, of the timber scaffolding, which seems to be completely edited out of your version. As far as lateral bracing or? Well, and part of the pleasure of the, of the artifact. Anyway, yeah. passing comment. Um, and the, the, the last thing I would um, uh, back onto my composition role. So I, you know, the, the, the kind of forays into, you know, the bathhouse and the, the section of the, um, the kind of courtyard next to the sort of version of the Ville Radieuse, which has been grafted onto the Geddes plan. I have to say, uh, apart from the lack of the lateral support in a kind of technical sense, I wish the tower was a circle in plan. And, and I wish it wasn't available to the public. And, uh, and the idea that it's a greenhouse seems inconsequential to me. Patrick could. Anyway, that's that's my remarks. But it's a it's a beautiful um, project that the two of you have done, um, yeah. and uh, I congratulate you on that. Uh, and and there's, you know, as I think the the one person who's more familiar with Tel Aviv than certainly I am, um, remarked it's something that uh, in its in its kind of clarity of intent, I think would be. Um, useful in, in helping others to visualize the potential of that site, which is certainly not living up to um, its position within the Gettys plan at the moment. But I mean, seriously, look at this image. How can you not have that structure as part of your, your project? <laughs> yeah, so I, honestly, I, I saw them more as walls as opposed to these and this really works whenever you have a long extrusion, which is what these ones are made for, like pure salt production, and they'd stretch for miles. But our project, it, it was so much smaller, and it didn't really seem, it seemed like it would stick out quite a bit. Um, so it was trying to be more of a reduced form. Um, and the, the form comes from having like a higher wall here, lower wall here, so that you have more surface area for more evaporation. Um, so you have, then when you get to the pool beneath it, you have this area, which is the highest point being super condensed. Um, but it, there is a very a beautiful element to the wooden, uh, buttresses isn't the right word, but that bracing is quite beautiful. But I think what's nice about it is its rhythm and its vanishing point. And that is something that's achieved, I thought, in length. But I do agree, they're unbelievably beautiful and it's hard to replicate. <laughs> Aaron, can you go to the plan again? Sure. The one, the pool. So to oh, wait, just this one. I mean, it could be the axon. No, no. Uh, oh, I'm sure. So to just uh, respond to a couple of things you said, uh, Chris. Um, Chris, um, is that the? I agree about the ice cream and vendors and the kiosk which exists on the boulevard and I need to go out. And I don't know if it just, it's hard because as an architect, not urban planner, how you draw these things and how you get them fit in. But I totally agree with that point and that should be there somewhere. But compositionally, it was largely 
one of the main things was trying to position like on the actual site and the context, the building so that it sits in between the breakwaters and so it gets doesn't get blocked by these kind of things. So you can see here as the beach comes out and ins and out, this is where this is sited. And then when you look at other precedents of things going out into the sea, I was kind of looking at um, the ruins of Sisara, which are just a couple hundred kilometers north of Tel Aviv and how the, the Romans would do it. And, you know, the way you deal with corners and edges was, I thought, I, I thought it was the easiest way to go about this in a composition with having the, the heavy mass in the middle that allows to break up the long extension and then having another one at the end to bookend it. Um, and and I, I didn't, I, I felt that pools in general kind of are these, you know, you look at other famous pools like the McCarran Park pool in, in New York or other major pools. And they have, a, I mean, it was also because of the time period and how they built those public buildings. But I think the, the monumentality of the symmetry puts the emphasis on the, you know, it, on the water. And it, I think I was trying to balance a kind of classic composition with um, the materiality of the old city, which you saw in that elevation. If you can go to that, Aaron. Yeah, and no, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, uh, I'm not trying to undermine the logic that got you to the point of the design. But for instance, I mean, e even just in the, uh, your appreciation and, and kind of response to the Gede's plan, um, it, there's, a, there's a sense of orientation and kind of prospect so that there are things which are tied to the land and then there's the idea of the horizon on the sea. So, I mean, there could be just a simple thing of saying that the heavy aggregated in more or less enclosed space is something which is more to you know gravitates if that's the right word towards the the landform and the ethereal shade structure is something that is more to do with the ocean and i i, I understand exactly um i should have said that i, I understand that you're positioning the, both the building and the kind of lounging platform inside the breakwater but but also it's it's probably true of most um uh, especially public venues like this, that there's more than one way to skin the cat. You know, I mean, there's the person who wants to go out and be in the breeze beyond the breakwaters, you know, quietly reading a book in the sun. Um, and then there's, I don't know, it's like it, we have a, um, so in Vancouver, we have one of the most beautiful public swimming pools that I know of, and it's called Kitsilano. Pool, which is K I T S A L A N O. It's a sort of Anglo anglicized version of a First Nations um, word, and it's it, it's interesting. It's it's sort of the opposite of um, Deep Eddy. Instead of having the shallow end on the the narrow side of this, so instead of having the shallow end here, the shallow end is on the broad side. So it's here. And the shallow, the shallow end then looks out across um, across the inlet to the mountains, and it's. I'm trying to remember what the dimension is. It's but it's more or less like Barton's, maybe about half of Barton Springs in length, but broader. But it's an enclosed pool. But there, you know, there's even within the simple diagram that I've just described to you. There's probably twenty different very specific geographies that exist on the perimeter and um, against all of that. And it has a, has a really kind of funny, you, you, I'm sure you can find it on Google, but it has this funny condition where one end of it, the end that looks, one side of it that looks back onto the city is mm -hmm. actually facing south and is a, um, uh, a, a, a kind of, sort of an amphitheater that looks down towards the pool and again across at the mountains and uh, has a stage where not so much anymore, but um, used to be a place where in the summer they would have kind of sort of funny things like people doing hula dancing and putting on shows and things. Um, 
which, uh, which is a, which sorry I'll, I'll finish it's a, a roundabout way of saying that back to Simon's point is that as a, a kind of the, the, you know the, the culture of the peer and and trying to bring some sense of your albeit brief exposure to the culture of Israel and, and Tel Aviv uh, in into the into the frame of your project mm -hmm. um, I think would be helpful Anyway, yeah, uh, that's good points. If I could jump in here, maybe I, because um, <clears throat> the, uh, the photos of the uh, desalination apparatus are certainly very compelling. Uh, and, you know, I think there's a, there's a, there's a wonderful proposition lying in the, just a, a blanket appropriation of the of that apparatus in its current state that um, you know it keys into this wonderful essay I, I read once about provisional architecture. I'm trying to remember who the author was, but uh, the uh, as a side joke, the author was Professor Alter. Um, the the notion that somehow you know, something that's not completely fit to and this was my takeaway from the essay. I'm probably going to bungle the kind of overall, like the depth of that essay here and just kind of very the modest application of it. But you know, the notion that you know, something like program could be flexible enough to, to wrap around you know, something alien and reappropriate it such that both activities, the, or the artifact and the activity be reinvented in the process is a wonderful moment where you know, our faith in architecture is kind of reaffirmed. Um, and that's the promise that I see within um, uh, uh, Professor McDonald's suggestions. Although in the project's defense, you know, this, the simple idea that that texture um, might be lifted from that, the texture of the branches and its, its affiliation with this, the heritage of the, uh, of the Tel Aviv's industry at some level might be appropriated uh, just as a kind of, as a benchmark, I think is an equally kind of provocative proposition just because the texture itself uh, presents a kind of more flexible idea um, and as a result might have greater uh, application. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, the, uh, the building itself, uh, the bathhouse and it's kind of wonderfully sensitive and intimate spaces there. I just wonder whether or not it's scaled appropriately for a place like this. I, uh, something about the images are wonderful in terms of the kind of the palpability of the space and the atmosphere that's captured in them. Um, but I also think there's an issue of scale at play there that I think is, is was very astutely crafted. Um, and it makes me concerned that, well, you know, the number of people present in those places, there's, there might be a discrepancy there. Um, but I just don't know, like the other day, maybe the bathhouses are exclusive enough to support the kind of intimacy that we see in the images. I just want to say that I really love the images. So yeah, I think that they, they present a very compelling vision for what it might be like to be in that bathhouse. Um, it's just, it seems a little discontinuous with, with, the, with the, the bustle that, I, that, that is implied in the image that's on the screen at the moment. Um, I also found the overall approach to the site to be wonderful. Um, you know, the simple kind of extension of the avenue directly into the, uh, into the sea is a lovely gesture. Um, the arrangement of program and its kind of various manifestations on the, either side of the pier, I think provides the appropriate level of variety and kind of punctuation to that sequence. Although I, I have to say, I think that you heard a moment ago some really great suggestions about how you might rearrange that such that the building fabric kind of participates in a more kind of coordinated way. But we get into pretty subjective territory at that point. And I think that um, while I, I, I can think of volumes to say about how you, know, you might change the appearance of the buildings to make that more appropriate, I'm not really inclined to do that only because I, I feel like you know, there is some outstanding work there that, uh, or work, let me I just say work, it is outstanding. <laughs> to get to the point where we really understand how your intentions tie into what we see. That said, I just want to offer one point of criticism. Oh, the pool is fabulous, by the way. Um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, what's that guy's name? The Heatherwick like gesture of the building at the end of the ramp is something I have a little bit of a problem with. And I don't often use uh, or drop that name in a complimentary way, only because I feel like there's something a bit vapid about that kind of formalism. Um, 
yeah, I, I, you know, I can appreciate the drama of lifting uh, the end of the avenue as it goes to sea. And I, 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 I realize this is you know, pretty subjective stuff, territory we're into here as well. But I would just offer like the idea that the avenue would just go out and then die into the ocean in a way that suggests the lack of an arrival or a lack of a kind of way, waypoint being established at the end. It seems to me to be more poignant in a poetic sense. Um, and if the architectural kind of interventions in this case, like the Campanile and the bathhouse and the school just are, are moments along the way, that seems to me to be a more um, uh, apropos approach that supports the, 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 um, uh, the, the baseline idea behind your approach to the site and the notion that the city somehow disconnected the sea in a way that is quite direct. The infrastructure plunging into the ocean at the end of its or at the end of the sea, and forgive me, uh, at the end of its trajectory would be a, uh, 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 a beautiful thing, kind of open-ended way to, to, to so, wrap though, things because, up. No? No, because it's, it's a sea, it's not like a lake. I don't know, it's, if it was just this thing diving into it, it would just be this thing, like there would be all these weird, you, there would be no way to understand it. It would be at once, I don't know. It, it, to me, we thought, I mean, Kevin smiling because he suggested a similar thing, I believe. And I, I kind of went the other way because I think of the sea as, you know, it's, the waves are crashing. And if you just dove into it, it I don't know. It just seems like to me that would be so anticlimactic and, and almost like, what, when, when does it stop and when does it begin? There's no real terminus if it's- uh, Patrick, forgive me, that's exactly my point. And I mean, honestly, I feel like the way you just described it just kind of reinforces my belief that that's what it should have done. But like at the end of the day, we can agree to disagree yeah, about no, that. It's, it's a very, it's a very well-crafted project. I, uh, I just think that, you know, leaving that kind of open end to mm -hmm. your scheme is in the spirit of the kind of provisionality that makes urban spaces like this great. Mm -hmm. I, I, we talked about this earlier in the day that, you know, architects are, are, take on a tremendous amount of liability when they attempt to coordinate urban spaces like this one. More often than chance, they're just trying not to screw it up as opposed to kind of coming up with a state, a, 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 a confident formula for, for precipitating the kind of activity you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think um, is you, you have to, I think in most cases you have to, you have to know when to stop coordinating and stop dictating in order to allow that spontaneity to take place. And that's what makes those places usually pretty great. That's why I think, you know, this, this open-ended thing would be in, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the place's best interest. Sorry, I was talking over somebody a minute ago. I apologize. I just want to finish my point. No, jo sorry, John, I was interrupting you, but um, I, I think I would say that the, the, the it's a, I, I agree with John about the, uh, the inflection of the end of the pier seems kind of gratuitous in a way. Um, but, you know, if you, um, if again, going back to the kind of choreography of what might happen along the pier, and it's probably, uh, I agree with John, that it's probably not a, a good thing for architects to dabble with. Um, but to at least imagine that things would happen in a kind of ad hoc provisional way. I don't know, there's a pier um, that goes into the, uh, off the beach near where I live. And I don't know how long they've been doing it, but anyway, as long as I've been living here for so 20, 30 years um, and people catch crabs there. And so it's, even at the end of Santa Monica Pier, for instance, uh, it, you don't need to architecturalize or design the kind of conclusion of the pier. You know, it's the place that you go with the ice cream that you bought two thirds of the way along the pier, or it's the place that you're far enough from the shore that you can catch a different kind of fish, or it's the place that you go, you know, on a first date, or do you know what I mean? Like, it, yeah. I think you can, kind of, you can hy hypothesize the, the manner in which architecture is supportive and uh, and indeed tentative about its relationship with the events that might occur there. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think it's a you know it's a good point. It was a good article. Yeah, and I think that both of you. I mean, I, I totally hear what you're saying, and and I think and I and there was sketches and schemes where it did that, and I just want. And I think something that me and Aaron talked about was the idea that this is this project we wanted to be 
like architectural. Like we, we did want this to be a thing at the end. And, and I, and I hear what you're saying. And I think what we're in my head though, the balance is that what you're talking about where you catch the fish and you yes. go out and those experiences, those are all happening in that non-architectural way with the existence of the, you know, existing, you know, groin out there that is just, you know, windswept and the sea comes and goes. And I feel like that's one thing that we were balancing was that this thing itself is part of a city and therefore it is curated in the experience. And the, that ability to do all those things you're describing and have that ice cream and that isolation alone on like a little lighthouse is happening out here still. So I just, and I, I hear what you're saying and I've ran through those thoughts and I guess I want to be able to pers persuade you that this as a scheme is the right move and that all those wonderful moments that cities create are happening with the way what we are you know, proposing it. And, and I, I agree with it. And I think it's an interesting discussion. And, and I don't know, I hope I'm not trying to be argumentative. But I just, I feel like that is where we're leading. Hey, you're just being steadfast. Coach. No one can blame you for that. But the, um, the only thing I'd, I'd point out is that, um, you know, where you would use the term architecture, I would simply use the term building. And um, I think that there's a broader definition for a practice that includes the kind of spontaneity and provisionality that suggests intervention can sometimes be as um, uh, uh, or, or more problematic than the situation that we encounter to begin with. And it's important to be sensitive to that because I, I don't think a lot of city planners would argue with anything you just said, Patrick. I think that by and large, intervention is typically the prescription in you know, a place like this. But so it turns out, you know, in, in living in Austin or studying in Austin, you probably know this well by now, like sometimes it's best to simply curate the, what's found. Uh, and to do that takes an enormous amount of humility and sensitivity to, to get right. Um, probably a lot more skill than the injury. I'm going to let John have the last word that I, I apologize. I've let this go on too long. It's, you know, Patrick is, is right in that that was a kind of interesting conversation that we were having. And this question about to what degree these things are architecturalized or actually let, left to be more defined by the way they're inhabited is a kind of fascinating and kind of very rich conversation to continue. I'm, I'm not gonna, I had lots of things I want to say about this, uh, but I'm just gonna say, I think it's an extraordinary project. We need to move to the next one. Um, uh, and I apologize that we let this go on a, a, a long, but it, I think it was a terrific conversation and I apologize for cutting it off. Um, we're gonna move to, to Anna and John and Chris. And I wanted to also say to, to, to thank you guys and then to welcome Frank Harmon, uh, an extraordinary architect from North Carolina from Raleigh who joined us. And I think I probably was in the waiting room longer than, than he should have been because I, I got, I, I missed it earlier. So I, I apologize, Frank, I don't know if you saw the chat I sent you when you brought in, um, but uh, welcome Frank, a professor as well. And um, you know, uh, we should move to the next. And you guys are probably gonna lose me halfway through this next presentation. Thank you so much for the invite. That was a great project. I think there's a lot of great work today. And uh, it's always great to see uh, old faces, uh, not that, not that they're old, but you know, just old acquaintances. We're old. Wow, I mean, by that. Uh, so it's been always a pleasure uh, to have a chance to chat with you and Kevin. Thank you again so much for the, for the invite. Thank you care. guys. Thank you. I don't know, somebody. I was going to say somebody has a hearing some background um, stuff going on from somebody's mic. So if you're not involved with talking, you might be muted. All right, can you see my screen? Yep. In the interest of brevity, I'm just going to go ahead and start. So what I thought, this is the city of Tel Aviv. This area within the green loop is the old city, the white city. And the green line that I've outlined is the primary tree-lined boulevard consisting of Rothschild Boulevard and Ben Gurion, which ends at our site. Right now, this green promenade on one end sort of lacks an end. And so we've endeavored to create a new end of the public space called Kikar Trim that currently exists at the end of the promenade, which right now is a largely undifferentiated, wide open public space. And so we've tried to break down that space into a series of smaller areas. 
Right, so in this diagram, you can see um, how we decided to break up the program. Um, initially, everybody's um, gut feeling was to continue the boulevard, but upon further inspection, we realized that was quite a wide space and it was helping it become more derelict. So we decided to thin it out and move it next to old Cacard, defined by this garden. Um, and this amphitheater meets the boulevard in front of the garden to either take you up or take you into the garden. And following Ben Gurion, we then decide to turn the circulation toward Jaffa, which is one of the most successful parts of the existing project, um, is just this step promenade going down with the view of the old city. And how we're demarcating the waterfront is moving what used to be Gordon Pool and creating a new set of pools um, inspired by Alvaro Siza's project um, that would then look over to the marina. And the old Kikar building, um, we are repurposing as a bathhouse, um, but keeping the existing structure. Um, and then the pool house of the pool decks come out from it. Great, in this site plan, you're able to see, sorry, the site plan just disappeared. Um, in the site plan, you're able to see that we've incorporated this metal structure that would house foliage and provide shade. One of the current uh, conditions of the site um, is that it's just too hot. Uh, the whole thing uh, is unshaded. It's an elevated uh, plaza, which gets tons of sun all year round and in the summer is quite unbearable. So to mitigate the heat um, year round, we've provided shade, uh, a cool place for people to relax. And the idea of an oasis is very strong uh, in our project. The idea that this is somewhere you could go and relax and feel comfortable um, is really the opposite of the sense you get um, in the project or in the, the current Kakar Plaza. So this, sorry, having some technical difficulties with my computer. Um, this section, you can see that we've rerouted the highway to a lower elevation underneath the garden in the existing building of Kikar Three, the hotel. And we've hollowed out the inside of the hotel to create a bathhouse and preserve the graffiti on the inside of the walls and use the existing floor plates of the hotel um, to create bathhouses that are elevated above the level of Ben Gurion, which is here. And then the garden is set at a level below the walkway of Ben Gurion in order to create a public space that's set down and is more private and intimate. And we picture the character of this garden as being something that it's as if a garden existed a long time ago in the city of Tel Aviv and the city has been built up around it and this white wall that wraps around it is protecting this public, this natural space against the uprising of the urbanism of the city. And so the, the level of Ben-Gurion, which the promenade, the three, the rows of three trees that you can see in the background, you can see that the, the promenade is then shifted against the building um, between the wall of vendor spaces within the, wall, the thickened wall of the garden and adjacent to the open public space of the inside of the bathhouse. This, this view here gives you um, the idea of what it would be like to go down Ben Gurion Boulevard and then eventually enter, um, enter into the project. You can see the garden on the left. There's an amphitheater and plaza space for um, street activities. Um, this is something that was touched on earlier in the day, but there's all sorts of um, things that people will do, group dancing, um, events and things that are held out in public in Tel Aviv. Uh, and these things typically get pushed to the side or they pop up wherever they can find the space. So in our project, we wanted to provide a space for the public to still gather um, and then also for people to be able to sit and view those types of, of um, cultural events. So this is the prime, what our, our ground floor plan of the project. So you can see Ben Gurion Boulevard ending in that amphitheater space. And then the walkway that is adjacent to vendor stands and the access into the bathhouse. Um, the primary floor of the bathhouse is elevated above the level of Ben Gurion Boulevard and is at the existing level of Kikar Atarim, which is elevated eight feet above the, the walkway. And so these are like the stairs that lead up to that pool level. 
and then there's a ramp that brings you to the top of the garden a staircase leads you down into the garden and then as you continue to the end of the boulevard you arrive at the public stair that leads you down towards the view of jaffa Great, this is a view inside the bathhouse. We wanted to change the way the inside of the bathhouse felt, but remain or keep the elements that um, really make this space an interesting space. There's a, an expansive skylight that runs almost the entire length of the building. And there's, um, for more or less of a better sense of the word, there's an atrium on the inside, which we've opened up to allow um, to be like the main area of the bathhouse. Um, while inside the bathhouse, you'd be able to see out. Um, it's a little bit hard in this view, but you'd be able to see out to the garden, to the steps, to the marina, and to the ocean. Um, and the current Kakar is quite closed off. When you go inside, it's a little cavernous. Um, and so we wanted to, I guess, mess with the layering or the, the view out with the foliage um, and not have it be so um, concrete uh, in the sense that it's more of a interior atrium, but in the sense that it's a, it's an inside outside space that's seated underneath this canopy of, um, I guess, a brutal remnant or an, an artifact that's left on the site. In, in this view, you can see the staircase here that leads up to this floor plan, um, which is the, the hot baths um, inside the existing building. And then you can also see the top of the garden wall is a promenade, almost like, um, I can't think of the word, like the, you know, the walkway at the top of the castle. Rampart. Yes, yes, exactly. The rampart that wraps around the, lo the lowered garden is a full loop. So it could be, you could use it as sort of an exercise, um, like running around that loop, around the green space of the garden. And it also acts as a, an elevated view out over um, the steps and over the pools, you know, towards the ocean. And on top, this, this elevated area also has you know, seating arrangements and views down to, in, into um, the public spaces, such as the vendors that are housed within the wall of the garden. And then, so you can see this is the level of the rampart above the lowered garden area. And then you can see this is the level of Ben Gurion Boulevard, but the, in, the floor plates of the bathhouse are offset um, from that level. And so the next floor plan is cut through at the level of Ben Gurion, but you can start to see um, the support spaces in the basement of the bathhouse building. Have we got a technical issue or are yes. you? Yes. Yes, sorry. Um, my computer seems to be having problems loading the next page. I'm really missing our school's plotters right now. <laughs> Should have plotted them all out and sent a package to everyone. That's probably how we'll have to do it next year. Okay, so finally, <laughs> finally loaded. Um, it, it, you can see it's a very heavy file. Yes. Yeah, I have a, my, my personal computer is very old as well. So I'm missing the access to the school's resources during a time like this. See that at the end of our new promenade, you arrive at this green roof, which is the top of the pool house. And that green roof is elevated 18 inches above the walkway, which creates sort of a barrier that directs you down a stair or into the inside of the bathhouse. Um, and you can see a view of that condition here with a view down the public staircase towards 
the old city of Jaffa. And first we create like this lowered plaza that's wedged between um, this wall of the pool house and the wall of the garden that then opens up into through the pool house towards the pools. And as you continue down the staircase, that public space gets wider and wider. We having more technical difficulties? Yeah, I may need to open the document in a different PDF viewer. I'm not sure, but would it make sense for John or someone else to to, to be doing it? That might have a faster computer. I think if I stop pointing with the mouse, um, okay. things get better. But this is a view um, from the highway back towards our project. You can see that the road would dip down below the white wall but there's openings through the, the white wall into the garden um, to, to draw people's interest so that it attracts them to visit the site, you know, and realize what's inside that large white wall. So you can see the view of the wall from the highway that is in the previous rendering is towards here. And the next rendering is a view down the staircase that leads into the garden. So you can see that it opens down into this curving, through this curving, Boolean into the wall, um, into the natural space within. And so so in you, this plan, sorry, Chris. No, go for it, go for it. In this plan, it's the, um, it's the level underneath Ben Gurion. Um, you can see the saunas and lockers and things underneath Kakar and um, how you would enter into the pool house and then get onto the decks for the pools that um, that line the stairs. The right. pool you can see on the um, on the lowest step or on the area uh, next to the lowest step is more of a beach um, a beach condition that would slope right into the pool, be very shallow, and then the pools um, that would go up the steps um, eventually they get deeper, and as you get to the top, then that pool would be used for laps and more of a fitness rather than recreation. This is a section through the public stair showing the levels of the pools beyond and the opening through the bathhouse, as well as the relationship between um, the, the service spaces within the bathhouse, the lowest pool, which is actually a plan using water similar to the Dead Sea, and the relationship of the spaces um, within the top of the bathhouse to um, the um, shade structure, which is covered with vines that would hang down into that space. There's a view looking back up that public stairway. Um, you picture this wall of the bathhouse as being the water draining across this green roof would then drain down this wall and create sort of an algae covered surface. And this is a, a vertical section cutting from Ben Gurion through the garden, through our public stair and the bath house, the pool house, um, and then eventually through the pools. And so you can see the highway passing underneath our site, um, the lowered green space within the garden and then the portals that we create within the garden wall um, that allow for activation, such as sitting and you know, occupying that space, both above within the wall and inside the garden within the wall as well. And this is a view through that portal. If there are any drawings that were um, 
um, that you need me to look back at because of the, the, the rush and some drawings have technical difficulties, let me know and I can turn back to what you guys want to see. Well, I think we're ready to talk about your project. <laughs> and uh, it's a complex discussion. Um, because I have concerns uh, in terms of composition and meaning with with your work. Um, and I think it's important that you begin to address these because finding the central purpose, it may be a problem I have, but I'm I've been searching as you've been speaking and almost the technical fault might have helped me. So let me launch in a particular way. David Ben-Gurion was more than just the primary leader of Israel. He represented a set of ideals that are relevant today. And where you approaching this and you did begin with the great move of the boulevard but then as i saw it you came into something of a compositional confusion because you introduced a, a form of organic space that did not seem to have a particular thank you particular meaning to it uh, you broke the boulevard I didn't see where the references were or why Jaffa was necessarily a key reference. And so I have to say I was left with a confusion over meaning, identity and composition. To me, the, the role of architecture in addressing a, a situation such as this it is moving around um, the way that we balance social space and the central importance of Israel as a community and the refinding of the spirit of community and society and a reverence, a, a reverence that um, has in a certain sense of the word, a spirituality to it. So I am slowly moving and making that um, not very well articulated statement, a question mark, which is about the garden, the amphitheater, uh, the, the rampart that has turned itself of 90 degrees, and then somehow an access through the bathhouse and then the pool itself that wasn't really mentioned. And I think you need to, and again, my colleagues may may have a want to stop this and say, no, we're very clear and happy. But I think it's something you didn't address, and I think you need to address. Miss Simon, you, you bring up a kind of interesting point. It was really the, the focus of the one pinup that we had in the, in the class, and the students were actually, they didn't do a very good job in the presentation today where they focused more on just describing what they did rather than the conceptual apparatus behind it. But when faced with similar kind of critiques, the, they were very clear that they were interested in, I can't quite remember how you guys put it, like the sort of fascination with a collection of surrealist objects more in the realm of, or surreal objects, more in the realm of, you know, realm cool house than Patrick Getty. So the wow. sort of fascination with the existing structure um, with this kind of very odd building uh, or garden as building with the, you know, with these this three elements, I think is uh, it, it's less a continuation of Gettys's ideals, but actually this other interest. So I don't know if you guys want to address that. Kevin, that, that needed to be their lead. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I guess I guess I'll touch on that. Yeah, I think you'll educate us. You know, I'll take the blame for that, having delayed the start of the of the review with the, the last one. So then it probably flustered them. But it, it, Simon is right. You guys are doing a kind of radical project and didn't explain any of the conceptual apparatus so yeah i think the 
the, on the first slide, there was a technical difficulty where it I don't know what happened. It changed before I was ready. And so it sort of sent me off balance for the rest of the presentation, but I'll go back and touch on that sort of um, conceptual nature of the project rather than, so I'll start off by saying that this is a very different sort of project than the previous group. Um, we, you know, in the beginning, we thought that, you know, let's continue Ben Graham Boulevard, let's pull it out towards the water. But we decided that in order to do that, we would need to demolish the existing building, which we hold dear, near and dear to our hearts. Um, we believe that the aggressive br brutalism of the interior of that building actually is one of its strengths. And so we wanted to preserve it. And because of that, we felt that ending the boulevard early in the sort of open space where you're forced to look inwards and then directing that boulevard against the wall of the building in sort of a more narrow condition rather than the wide open expansive um, open space of the current site we felt that that move was necessary in order to force people to experience the jarring nature of this um, solid wall with these rather strange curving openings against this field of columns that would sort of be covered in the palimpsest of the walls that are removed from the existing building. And we felt that the existing pool, which is its own sort of object away from the public space of Kiko Artenrim, we felt that that pool needed to be wedged up against these two objects and that the circulation path needed to navigate its way down amongst these three players. And that we felt that rather than re, rather than considering the view out towards the ocean as being the most um, near and dear view, we all agreed that the view of Jaffa is actually far more interesting because the old city, there's sort of a tower, there's an icon that catches your eye. Um, let me go back to that view down the stair. Um, Chris, go to the perspective looking down uh, Ben Gurion where you see the existing building. I mean, let's be clear, that's not a building that anybody else but a few of our students have a great love for. But there's a kind of fascination <laughs> with this kind of um, relic that has incredible graffiti and, you know, and I think like there's a kind of um, idea in this thing that is not about um, whitewashing the existing condition, but embracing this kind of ruin. Sorry, I didn't mean to hijack the conversation. Just, just, just. No, no. I think I think that you're exactly right. Is that we do embrace um, the ruin of the site. I, I mean, certainly compared to the earlier projects that we've seen today, I mean, it's uh, uncharacteristic to, to do so. I think there's something um, interesting about disentangling the, uh, one of the things that we've been talking about on and off today is the, the extent to which the conclusion of the boulevard is the beach and, and uh, the degree to which that then uh, helps a, a kind of speculative project about how to make that transition. And, I, you know, I think there's, there's something to be said for, um, as I say, disentangling the, the manner in which one goes down, you know, the, the topographical transformation to go down to the beach and, and the conclusion of the boulevard and concluding the boulevard in, a, in this, you know, kind of uh, latent uh, performance space seems, um, you know, I'm not, I could probably quibble about some of the uh, design issues, but it seems like an interesting point of departure. And certainly keeping the existing building, uh, uh, the one thing we know about uh, buildings wherever they are in the world is that uh, they go through cycles of being adored and, and reviled. And, uh, you know, I think you've made a good case, uh, particularly in the interior perspectives, for arguing that there is a, a residue of the initial impulse to build this building, which actually provides us with a, with a space which will never be built again. I mean, I live in a city which is about the same age as uh, Tel Aviv, just a little over 100 years old. And for me, the the whole discussion about preservation and conservation uh, hinges on the on the issue of are we are we going to take away a space which we are extremely unlikely to build in the future? So, for instance, at the moment there's a uh, there's a kind of paranoia because 
I, I'm in Vancouver, sorry, I should should have mentioned that. But there's a whole paranoia about we're we're due for a big earthquake. So public schools, for instance, um, were not built to anticipate that eventuality, and so many of them are being torn down and uh, replaced with contemporary buildings. The reality is, is there are spaces in those schools which we will never see again. You know? There are uh, single story shops on high streets that are replaced by uh, the first floor of a you know, mixed use building, which essentially is a, you know, a kind of 7-Eleven space. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I actually applaud you for um, finding a kind of affection for that uh, that structure and its potential to be uh, a kind of unique and compelling idea of a, of a bathhouse. Um, no, it's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not so so clear about some of the issues to do with vertical circulation and uh, uh, perhaps a more refined sense of how the program infiltrates that structure. But um, anyway, I, I think that's very positive. I, the, the collage of the other elements and the abruptness uh, of the uh, 90 degree turn to go down uh, through your public stair, I'm maybe less happy with, but here we are. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate, so appreciate you, you, you talking about that, Chris, because I think it is about the same age as Vancouver, and but it is nested within this country where, you know, history is of paramount importance and uh, but but it is like anywhere else with the current economy what the highest and best use tends to mean let's get rid of the old and and it, it you know replace it with something new and even with this thing that has a kind that is sort of reviled like there to find its value is interesting on the one hand and then to treat it as this surrealist object i think is also a fascinating like um approach as well i i think there is a degree of finesse that is just starting to kind of show up the, uh, the interior perspectives. Yeah, thank you. That I think, you know, need some more expo ex exploration and they're just learning to kind of find some techniques to, to demarcate what was old and what was new because there are substantial changes. You know, they're lowering the ground floor of this because it's the current situation is up at the, um, up at the, the elevated plat, um, elevated uh, uh, Kikara Tarim level. And I think those conditions are just fascinating. But finesse aside, I think that there's virtue in the approach. Yeah, and I mean, just the, the sort of visceral um, intrusion of the new program into the existing structure is, you know, a, like a three people studying for a semester in and of itself. So, you know, I appreciate that uh, it's the nature of the studio and the and the conditions that we're operating in, but you know, many of the building proposals are, uh, remain a bit gestural. But nevertheless, there's there's a there's a kind of um, what's the word? There's a, a, a for me a kind of interesting idea of this group that there's some potential here which could be untapped, and quite how to do it. Um, is another thing, but uh, even just to recognize that potential, I think is really admirable. I do wish the graffiti that exists now stayed in this drawing though. You can see it a little bit more in this view, you know. Have we already lost John Zott? Sadly, um, uh, yes. I don't know if he saw it. You want to, um, uh, well, you want to explain why that's important to you? Uh, the graffiti? Well, I, I just, I had pointed them towards John Zott's work. I don't know if any right. of the other critics know the building he did in Soho, the theoretical project that has a proposition where you would, you know, build a frame in concrete, let it go for some years while it gets graffitied and tagged, and then finish it out later to get that sort of contingent sense of occupation and unplanned decorative elements like graffiti. And I think that was an inspiration. I think the issue Chris brings up about the degree of finesse of how you engage that is a is a very difficult thing. And from my own perspective, like I, like I'm interested in this delicate thing weaving through, I find it uh, distressing to see those 
kind of huge columns come down in like it seems to me it, it, like it's uh they look like something that's holding up an elevated uh, uh train rather than this sort of delicate trellis that slips inside but Could, could maybe one of the authors speak to that? Because I was also uh, somewhat perplexed. So that the, the columns that support the trellis um, yes. o o occupy a, a, a lot of area, a lot of floor space. And uh, I, don't, I don't mean this in a necessarily pejorative way, but um, could be seen to be decorative, but you know, if I imagine this drawing, sorry, I should do my annotate thing here. If I imagine this part of your drawing, um, all of a sudden uh, populated by, I don't know, what, four inch diameter pipe columns, um, it's a different creature. And I, th I think potentially a more interesting creature. Hmm. It was like that until the presentation, I think. I guess uh, this view, you can see the columns, the growth on them, I guess would make them look meatier than they are. Um, the, the piping, you, you mentioned the four inch pipe, those, uh, they would be like three inch or so if there were no foliage on there and they, they would blend away. And I guess uh, I imagine the structure as being something that was light and delicate and um, almost like a cloud dissolves and flows um, around the site and down the stairs, but then as something that's overgrown with this green and then provides a shade and a dappled light underneath. And I guess, yeah, it, it got carried away with uh, kind of the thickness of those columns. Uh, they could they could be thinner, um, more spread out. Um, but I guess in the attempt to make this structure flow down to the ground, um, the columns became I guess almost the same kind of framework um, and structure system as the I, canopy itself. And just to speak a little bit more to that, I mean, I think our original idea stemmed from the need for shade, um, but we wanted to take the opportunity to do something with that, not just provide any canopy. But yeah, I think we all agreed that ex the execution wasn't really matching our intention, but. Um, it was supposed to be this um, very porous, intricate shaped structure that followed your journey down through the steps. No, and, and as I mentioned earlier, I appreciate that um, at the level of a kind of architectural resolution, of course, much of what we are seeing is um, schematic, you know, maybe more schematic than one might, might like. But you could imagine taking even just this view and saying, uh, notwithstanding the idea to make shade and to have vegetation kind of overcome the, the architectural structure, let's have as little stuff, as little architectural stuff as possible and, uh, and ob ob observe one extreme. I mean, sometimes, you know, um, as a teacher, I'll often say to students, you know, you have an idea, test it to destruction. You know, like find the extreme position of the idea that you have and and you may draw back from it you may say oh well, that's ridiculous but i mean it could be a trellis of tiny tiny little bits of uh metal on um uh, actually it reminds me of a so i'm excuse me the digression i'm just i'm just going to make uh one comment and you could maybe look at it afterwards there's a project by um, the architectural practice team zoo in uh, uh, i can't remember the name it's a, anyway it's a, a town hall in in japan and they did this thing which was extremely elegant and beautiful at the time and they made a very very light structure on top of a tiled roof i think it's in okinawa and um, and then they they had these kind of dumb I think they painted red concrete block columns and they allowed vines to grow up and then vines to grow on the roof 
and eventually the whole roof was covered um, with this whatever vine they planted. And Okinawa is uh, kind of semi-tropical, so it, 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 it's, it's warm, uh, and when it rains, it really rains. Anyway, they were kind of, um, I don't know, I read in the kind of uh, introduction to Tel Aviv that it rains very seldom there. Anyway, this project in Okinawa was interesting because ultimately they had to uh, stop the vine from growing because what happened is that when it poured with rain in a monsoon or something, uh, the weight of the, the rain that was collected by the vine was literally about to destroy the building. And uh, I don't know, there's, you know, it, it's one of those things about being an architect and uh, um, thinking about landscape. I mean, landscape, thinking about landscape projects your vision into the future in a way that thinking about buildings doesn't always. Um, but you imagine, you know, how this is maintained, you know, how are those plants being fed? Where are they growing from? Uh, what's their relationship with the architectural apparatus which makes the dappled light? Anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm not being critical of the project at large. I'm, I'm uh, I guess, just hopefully pointing out some um, arenas for um, further discussion. Yeah, I had the same reaction from the change of materials. It was almost, uh, it took away from the, I think what you guys were describing, you were trying to attempt. And it, the wall around the garden looks like um, some sort of metallic weave. And then the inside of these circular cuts are blue. And um, this sort of forest of columns that are kind of a framed abstraction of the concrete columns because they're sort of the same size extending out. I think what you liked about the old building was this sort of relentless concrete structure there. Everything was concrete and someone had come in and um, graffitied it and the randomness of sort of that happening. And then you talked about growing things on it, which you see in a lot of ruins or even a lot of buildings that are still active. I think if you had just stayed with the same palette and, and set those materials up in ways where they could be graffitied also, and uh, it doesn't take much. There's lots of vines and things that grow on almost nothing. You get them started and they're woody in nature and they'll hold themselves up and they can almost take over And if you wanted that kind of environment. I kind of like the random column. You know, when you talked about turning and having everybody view in this direction, it's not really much of a view. You've got a bunch of, st it's like being in the woods and looking out towards something. But I kind of like that because you have to wander down and find your way uh, beyond. I still wondered about, and on another theme, about how high that wall was around the garden and how important that concept was of having a garden that was being protected. Because when you're experiencing the city, you're also going to experience that highway that goes underneath. And you'd feel like you were clipping the roots of those trees every time um, if you knew there was a garden in there. Um, you know, like why right on top of the highway? I guess that would be my question. Um, where they why? have to dig it even deeper. You're asking but, why I put the garden on top of the highway? Yeah, I mean, I do like that you had an event there at the end, so you know, to um, a place that gathered people before they went on and through this sort of forest to get um, out to places beyond. But um, putting the wall around it, yeah, what is the significance of that? How did that make it better? The wall, I'm sorry, you're asking about the wall or the highway? Or are you asking about both? Well, primarily the wall. And just the placement of, like, when you, you have all this property and you choose to put the a sunken garden right over the highway where you have to dig the highway even lower. I think for me, the, okay. No, there you go, go Chris. For, oh. Well, for me, it was just the, the idea of being in the sunken garden with this high wall it has such a mass to it and a thickness that you'd really feel a sense of seclusion or of separation um, from from the city. And so um, it's kind of this like antithesis of the idea of reconnecting the uh, the boulevard to the ocean. It almost takes 
uh, the opposite approach and gives you a moment of solitude or a place where you can almost um, forget about all of those things. Um, th that's the way I was viewing um, that sense of being secluded or being walled in inside the garden. Chris? As far as the reasoning for the placement relative to the highway, we were interested in the sort of surrealist nature of it. Like you're driving on the highway and you see this garden within this thick wall. And as you're going under it, you're thinking to yourself, you know, is that even possible, you know? Like, and so it's, it's sort of the non sequitur nature of that move that attracted us. Well, that's, I can believe that. I mean, you could even put holes in the bottom and allow the roots to grow it out in there and search around and sort of reach down at the cars or something. That would make it even more surreal. Um, but you put holes in the wall. So it's it's like, and there's big tall buildings around there. Well, not, there's some that exist. So I don't know how secluded you're, I'm still questioning that, how secluded you'd feel in there. I mean. Um, so um, one thing I guess we didn't touch on in our presentation well enough were the designed spaces within the garden. There's, um, there's almost one at every single turn in the wall. Um, but you would be able to find these moments of isolation or of reflection inside the garden. There's almost a space that resembles a Terrell space where the, the light pours in from above you. Um, and I know that, yes, there are the tall buildings and you know the, the traffic noise. Um, so maybe standing in the middle of the garden, there you, you would miss out on that moment of seclusion. But I think for the people who are willing to search and find it, you, you would be able to find a moment of isolation or seclusion within the design spaces within the garden. Uh, this is Frank Herman. I don't know if you can hear me. We can. Um, I've never been to Tel Aviv, but I'm relatively familiar with the area around it in the Middle East. And I'm surprised you all haven't said more about the climate. For example, which way do the prevailing winds come in the summer? I believe the south and the west, and which in, in this plan would be the bottom and the bottom right. And in winter? Um, I believe the north and the north, the northwest. You believe? Well, um, to me, that would be a great starting point for the design. I, I really appreciate that you made an effort to provide shade. I think shade in Tel Aviv, just like it is in Texas, is an essential element to outdoor life. And I, I really like it that it's a central part of your proposal. But I also think that the experience of coming to this beach is going to be very different in the winter to the way that it is in the summer. It's mm -hmm. very true. It is from the north, by the way, in the winter. But if it is from the north, for example, you would possibly want to be able to bask in the sun without being disturbed by that wind. But in the summer, you would certainly want to catch every zephyr of a breeze that there is. And that might help you with your thinking about uh, where people sit out and where they walk and where you place the columns. That's really interesting to think about. I don't, I know we thought about the sun um, and how the shade would would be cast during during the summer as opposed to the winter, um, but I didn't think as much about the wind and how how to really harness those breezes and then also to reject them in the winter time. Um, I think we were lucky in the sense that the way our project was laid out, um, it is a lot more porous to the south, um, enabling it to catch those breezes in the summer and then a lot more closed off to the north rejecting those sure. breezes in yeah. the winter. Yeah. Typically in a hot climate, the winds start to come from offshore onto land as the day grows longer because the land heats up mm -hmm. and it draws the cooler air from the ocean. 
and it's very pleasant to sit out there. I think it's one of the main reasons people love to go to the beach is that it's cool, but it's also sunny. Mm. Another interesting observation I would make is that it seems in beaches that I've gone to, people bring an awful lot of gear with them you know, umbrellas and things like that, uh, coolers, uh, boom boxes. Um, so I have two questions. A, is that true here? And B, uh, if it is true, how, how does that become part of your experience of going to the pool? Yeah. So we've uh, we've incorporated into these steps also a ramp. So they're more of a stramp, for lack of a better word. Um, there would be a way to wheel your wagon and your two-year-old down to the beach um, from Ben Gurion Boulevard. Um, I know that when we were there, we saw people with all sorts of things taken to the beach. Um, but a lot of people at the beach, um, they come in the summer typically, and that's when it's most crowded. But a lot of people will go year round. It's part of their routine. Um, they may just be walking by the beach. They may not be bringing anything. Uh, I do think our project addresses both the person, you know, packing a picnic and packing up the whole family for a day at the beach, and also, you know, the more casual beach goer who maybe they're just they're going somewhere else and they're gonna walk by the beach, or you know, they go down every Tuesday to play soccer with their friends near the beach. I think our project does. Uh, maybe not the best job of making it easiest on people carrying a lot of things, but it would, would give, um, would give them an easy way to wheel, wheel their things down much easier than it would be currently to, to ascend a car and then go down its steps. That's good. You know, some people like to swim every day. I have a friend who swims in the Atlantic ocean every day of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, other people in London swim every day, all year long, in Hampstead Ponds, they're outdoors. So that's another part of the ritual here. You know, bathing has been a ritual for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, one thing we did to try to um, lend program to the everyday um, swimmer, um, which we observed when we were at the site in the Gordon Pool, um, and we knew that removing the Gordon Pool and replacing it with these three pools, we would need to um, we would need to lend program to those swimmers who would come here every day. This would be where they get their workout from, and that's why the pool that is longest um, on the left here on the screen would be the lap pool, which is directly serviced by the locker rooms and um, saunas, those things underneath the building in Kakar there. I think that it's true you've given it a lot of thought. One last question I would have for you. Um, it's about the whole issue of coming to a, a, a place like this, fully closed, undressing, storing your gear, going to the water, and at the end of your visit, coming back again. That can actually be a very beautiful sequence architecturally. I, I'm thinking of Peter Zumthor's thermal baths at Val's. They're fantastic. Uh, I'm also thinking about Barton Springs. You know, that that changing room is one of my favorite buildings. You know, just the experience is so unexpected that you're going to change clothes outdoors. Well, of course you are, because you're going to go swimming outdoors. So, you know, that, that could be another thing to think about. Mm. Couldn't agree more with the Barton Springs changing rooms. It's like, that's fantastic. And I think that sort of sort of sense of sequence and the rituals that are involved with all of those things are are kind of incredibly important. I, I do think, in fairness, the, the those were things that it's it said weren't really kind of um, grappled with. And I think a, a lot of that was for the moment when the rug got pulled out from under us, we um, uh, like delayed some of that. Um, and it took a little while to kind of get to a plan where everybody was happy with this. But that is part of the pleasure of a scheme like this, you know, is that, that you can start to imagine how the architecture or inculcated in the architecture is an idea about those rituals.
I, I don't know um, if anybody has more to say or not. Um, uh, we could, we were scheduled to take, take a break, but we since it's not lunchtime, we could stay for a little bit. Um, I was just going to say uh, um, that I do appreciate the desire to kind of push against the tide with this group. I mean, the, the, the thing that Simon was articulating at the beginning was exactly the kind of criticism that got kind of brought up at an earlier stage. And you guys were really articulate in saying it's actually not what you want to do. You were interested in this slightly more, um, I don't know, kind of uh, jarring version of an architectural um, intervention here. And, um, and I really respect that. I think there's some fascinating things that are happening with the project. I think, you know, like all the projects, it, it, it could have used some more time to finesse the architectural yeah. interventions. And in particular, it's like, like when you're dealing with something existing, so much time has gone into just understanding the object that I don't know if it would have been better to have had a little more time to figure out like the, the, um, the way in which you touch that and explore it in the kind of perspectival drawings that have now appeared really just as kind of, you know, final things. But, um, but I respect the agenda a lot. And I, I feel really kind of happy about that. I mean, I, as much as I'm critical of Mr. Coolhouse, there's sort of inspiration there as well. I think, you know, um, I think it was a comment I made about an earlier project that it's um, unusual for me to talk about composition per se. Um, and, and somebody, I think it was in the last review, um, uh, talked about the fact, and, and this may come from working in groups perhaps, um, and so at an early stage, there's a sort of identification of, you know, well, this is my project and that's yours and that's the other person in the group. I, you know, I think the project of the, the sunken garden with the um, vignette kind of openings into it uh, is, is quite a beautiful project and the uh, perspectival drawings of it are uh, quite compelling. I think it has nothing to do with the urban design uh, aspect of this project. Uh, I think the the preservation of the existing structure and its adaptive reuse um, is a project in and of itself. I think the idea of terminating the boulevard with some kind of uh, informal but um, uh, you know, kind of latent but inviting uh, notion about a public space in the city is a, a great project and interesting in and of itself. Um, the transition down to the beach, um, but it's the garden is, is the piece that to me is less, uh, less integral to the overall project. Um, but you know, easy, easy for me to say. Fair enough. Well, well maybe with, we'll let Chris have the last word on that one and take our kind of um, prescribed break here. We'd give uh, people like Simon a chance to uh, take a breath before he moves to his next reviewer or Mel. And thank our kind of critics and, um, yes, thank uh, you. and students. I, th I think um, we're going to start again in, in about 20 minutes. And I think I think Chris is sticking around with us. I think Mel and Simon are off to other places. And I think Frank is going to stay with us as well. And he tied. So um, uh, we will, we will you can keep signed on. Don't, yeah, don't sign off. We had enough technical difficulties earlier, but we'll, we'll kind of take a break and see everybody um, at three o'clock for Eleanor. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. So um, let's see, we have a little shift in critics, um, uh, but I should introduce everyone. So Juan Moreau has joined us, um, who uh, on our, is on our faculty, had been a, a dean, is a, um, a practitioner of some, some note, a big book's about to come out. Uh, um, uh, Juan, I don't know if you and Itai have met, Itai Friedman is an architect from, originally from Tel Aviv, practiced in Berlin and currently in San Diego, teaching in- Hi, Itai. Um, Chris McDonald, uh, I think Juan and Chris know each other, and you, you saw and Chris met earlier. Um, uh, Noah Winkler is a graduate of 
um, our school from a few years ago, currently working in Portland um, and is very familiar with, um, with Tel Aviv and interested to, to kind of be part of the last, the last group. And um, uh, who else do we have? I'm just looking here to see. I think is that I'm going to look back on my on my schedule. See, if there's somebody else. Oh, Frank Harmon should be still with us, but he might have signed off. Um, uh, is Frank on the call? Hi, oh. Chris. I don't know. So, so Frank Harmon was. Um, I know. Was uh, uh, hopefully going to come back and join us as a extraordinary architect in Raleigh and a longtime professor, uh, a um, mentor to, to uh, Cisco. And um, uh, John Ronan will come back, I think, uh, for maybe the last project. Hopefully he's finishing, he'll finish his, his project. And, and uh, John Reed, I think, is going to join us again at some point as well. Um, uh, we've got a couple hours. Uh, we're going to start with uh, um, Eleanor, who is the one student in the class that sort of broke off on her own. Are you there, Eleanor? Maybe. Yeah, okay. Hi. Um, uh, and then we're going to move from that to a, a group of three to conclude the day. So, um, Eleanor, are you ready to share your, your screen? And just uh, Juan, uh, and Noah, Juan, you sent me a note. Thank you, by the way. Um, uh, it seemed like you kind of read through the Description, um, um, uh, Noah. I think you did as well. Do we do we need to do some more orientation to the site? Like, um, or are you feeling comfortable? No, I feel good. The only thing that maybe clarification about what you meant when you said that Leonor went on broke on on her own. Uh, fair, fair enough. So, um, and because we've been doing this all day, like one, you know, and, and it looks the same to me. Um, <laughs> the, the one that thinks you have the whole history of the day. So the the, the studio was set up where um, uh, the students were originally in kind of groups working on a kind of um, urban scheme. And the original idea was that they would, um, the groups would do these kind of urban designs and they would either stay in groups and develop uh, the project together or they would break up and have, and each develop a building on, uh, as part of the sort of larger urban plan. Um, I say larger urban plan, but it's not a, it's not urban design the way urban designers do it. It's more like a kind of localized urbanism, you know, okay. blocks, not, not um, you know a square mile, um, uh, and Eleanor started with a group, but kind of broke off on her own to do her own urban design and um, and kind of development of that. And so, certainly okay. have the firepower of two or three people. The rest of the class of fourteen students are either in groups of two or three. And what we'll see this afternoon is uh, Eleanor is going to show work she did, which is development of the kind of overall scheme and uh, the development of, of the pieces. And then we'll see a group of three. Um, who who work together pretty much um, kind of interchanging the different pieces and and that will show a you know um, that two single projects but one with a, a group of three and one with a group of one so okay. um, uh, and Joanna is now rejoining us I think all right is everything showing up all right to everybody yep yeah. All right, so um, so just to open this up, uh, the goal of what I wanna accomplish in my project, which is similar to the rest of my peers, is to revitalize Kikar Atarim. Um, let me, oh, there we go. All right, so this is a image that someone, like a local gave me as I was in Tel Aviv. Um, I don't remember the exact time. I, I think this is a picture from the 60s, but this is just to communicate that when Kikar Atarim was first um, designed and established, it was very, uh, it, it was a very, you could say happening place. Many people, as you can see, would go there and they would stay there. And um, uh, however, you know, even in our recent trip to uh, Tel Aviv and in our, um, studio discussion and our own personal experience when we went, we see that it has become kind of like a dead end space. It's only a path for circulation now. Nobody stays here and, you know, hangs out um, as you see in this photo. And so, um, so we're exploring ways to, to bring back life to this uh, public square. And so, um, yeah, so when I was in Tel Aviv, um, also very similar to um, Anna, John, and Chris. Um, I was very inspired by this brutalist hotel building. 
Um, I know, I know when we were speaking with them, um, I believe his name is Amnon Richter. Um, he's the son of the original architect of the Kikar Atarim. And he, he was saying that uh, one of the reasons that um, led to, you could say the fall of this place is a, uh, I guess, lack of maintenance. And so you can even see here, there's a, you could say there's a lack of maintenance, but you can see architecturally, there's a nice quality to this space, even with the light coming in and the, the different um, levels and elevation. And so uh, with this, I just wanna communicate to you uh, the initial idea that really drove my design, um, you know, uh, taking advantage of this pre-existing, um, this hotel building, it's actually the Leonardo Art Hotel, um, which is present on the site and using it to bring uh, relaxation. So here there's an idea of um, uh, creating a bathhouse. And so, and so this is a, an initial sketch that I'm gonna use to kind of break down to you um, my main concepts here. This shows uh, the diagrammatic intervention with uh, reforming Kikar Atirim. And so there are three main parts. Uh, you have the have the bathhouse, which is originally a, a hotel building. You have the extension of Ben Gurion Boulevard. And then you also have this sunken garden to the south, and this just starts to explore the different areas that are around it. So, um, in this diagram with you know these uh, light fill colors, we start to see uh, we we start to understand what are all these things going on around this project um, because. Something that I was really um, considering even initially was, okay, this is a very, uh, um, a very busy site. There are many things happening, you know, to the north, it's very, it's very urban, it's very dense. Um, oh, sorry, actually, um, towards the, uh, the east. And then towards the west, it's a lot more spread out. It's, you know, you have the wonderful beach and, and um, so forth. So how do we um, address all of these things? And so, um, this kind of just shows uh, the making the bath and the garden. So um, this is a site plan where you can start to see uh, the intervention just uh, in, within the whole scope of this part of Tel Aviv. Um, again, to the west you have the beaches and to the east you have the more dense urban context. And so, um, Oh, actually, okay, let, let's stay from here for now. Um, I wanted to just say before going forward that um, my, my goal in making this a sunken garden is to provide insulation um, to this project and to this particular part of the site. Um, you know, it's right on top of a higher con boulevard which um, also serves you know, nearby Satellite City. This is a very important road, even for uh, commercial purposes. You have um, Ben Gurion Boulevard, which is a main form of circulation. You have this very busy beach um, and so forth. And so as you're going to see um, in my further drawings, I want to achieve a sort of, um, you could say a haven. Uh, actually, I like to call it an eye in the storm that kind of um, gives you a different, more calming uh, experience in contrast to what is seen around you. And so, um, well- Eleanor, was that your bathhouse in the middle of that site plan? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So the, the bathhouse itself is more of an adaptive reuse project. Um, so the, the roof plan is uh, the same as the uh, original Leonardo okay. Hotel, yes. Um, and so these are just some, quick precedents, um, really was inspired by the National Library um, in Paris, and this is uh, Tainan Spring in, in Taiwan. They, they were just basically helping me to even um, address the connection between uh, this bathhouse and the sunken garden. Uh, ben Gurion is ultimately the, the connecting factor. Um, this this uh, precedent here, this is a I, I'm starting to forget the, um, anyways, it's, it's actually the White City Center, the Liebling House, right? Yeah, Liebling House. Liebling House, yes, Liebling House, or you could just say the, the White City Center um, in Tel Aviv. 
so this is more specifically um, in response to how I was intervening in the bathhouse. I really thought it was pretty amazing how they just uh, cut out and like how they depicted um, cutting out um, the walls of the original building. And so essentially how they differentiate the old and the new, but still giving a sort of respect to the old. Um, the, this is a precedent more towards the garden, but um, all right, so this brings us to the main plan. Um, I'm gonna be presenting you uh, to you today uh, two plans and a longitudinal section. Um, I, I wish I could present more drawings. I would say it was kind of challenging to do it on my own, but I'm happy to present to these ones. And so, um, so this is the main floor plan. And so now you start to see the bathhouse and then you see the, the canopy of the trees uh, in the sunken garden. Um, and so these are, these are meant to have um, more, uh, they're, they're there for, uh, as, as a haven. I'm just trying to find the, the right word. It, it's essentially meant to be a haven, um, you know, towards here on the right with the bathhouse. Um, there is a central pool right in the, the middle of the building. This is a room temperature pool. Um, just a, it's more, I would say it's a bit more public and playful. Um, however, as you go uh, to the, in this direction um, towards the west, you have some more, um, you could say a tucked away spa area. So this is where you'd find the heated water. And um, my favorite thing about this space is that um, since it's right next to the, the edge of um, this building, it has a direct viewpoint towards uh, the Mediterranean Sea. So as you're uh, spending your time in here, you, you get to have that visual connection with the main body of water, the Mediterranean, which, which really brings uh, people to this site. Um, and so um, as well, you start to see, you know, just some normal changing rooms for everyone. And, uh, and, and many of the, these spaces are uh, primarily to provide food and just uh, community spaces, just places for people to be with one another, whether it's their friends or their family. So yeah, so this plan mainly expounds on the bathhouse. And then uh, this one gets into more of the details concerning the garden. Um, it's meant to be uh, a more organic experience. Um, something that I like about my, just the way I intervened with this, there's a very clear diagram of um, uh, old, mix of old and new, and then new. With the bathhouse being old, it's you know, a bit more of an adaptive reuse approach. And then this garden is completely new. Um, however, and, and also it's an organic experience. It's a more natural experience while the bathhouse is a, it's an unnatural experience regarding the, the, the built environment. But um, so this uh, garden, it's, it's quite large. It takes uh, those who are within it along winding paths and they're surrounded with shrubs and, and trees and some little uh, um, ponds added for the, um, just, just to create that atmosphere. They're not meant to be really entered into because that's what the bathhouse serves regarding entering water. Um, and so, so this is the idea with the sunken garden. And then this section starts to pull it all together. Um, when I was uh, in the initial stages of developing this project, again, um, I was dealing with the Higher Khan Boulevard uh, originally, Higher Khan Boulevard would essentially be at the level of where the Sunken Garden is now, but it, I decided to lower it. Um, and, and also, as we know, uh, Kikar Atarim is, you know, on this level of the bathhouse. However, I also decided to lower that so that um, you wouldn't have to go up uh, a ramp or a set of stairs uh, in order to access the site. I wanted to keep a continuous line of circulation to make it more, um, I guess, not, not only practically accessible, but more free flowing. Give people direct access um, to the bathhouse and the sunken garden, and then also direct access to the Mediterranean. Um, over here, um, you know, to, to the left, which is the south, um, this building, it may be known as the, the Pussycat, 
I, I'm calling it the Coliseum because that's what it was originally um, named. Um, you know, it used to be a strip club and then, um, well, actually originally it was a pharmacy center and then it became a strip club. And now it's actually used for women empowerment. And so um, in my keeping this building, <laughs> Um, you know, I was even considering like, okay, I don't know if this is um, necessarily along the lines of um, Oasis and Haven, but I felt like it was a very interesting um, aspect of the site and something that um, evokes a remembrance of what was there before. I mean, I would say it's a pretty striking building. So, you know, along with um, women's empowerment, I'm envisioning it as a, as a lecture hall that's a uh, um, kind of a placed above above the woods, so you get uh, a nice view of the canopies of the trees and and these trees um, that are a continuation of uh, the Ben Gurion Boulevard. And so that this section kind of starts to pull things together. And then this is just a very uh, quick, um, just a axonometric view, just to help um, to help understand how all these different aspects come together. Uh, just to put it in context, but um, yes, th these are some of the, I mean, to be brief, these are the main ideas of my intervention in, Eleanor, in this area. Can, can I interrupt just, will you point out what are the existing elements and what, what's, the, what's your intervention? So I know one of the interventions is, start, is lowering um, the plaza level of, mm -hmm. uh, of Kikara Tarim. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but maybe when you look at the building and look at the different drawings, you can just point out what's existing. Definitely. All right, let me see if... Did you do that drawing? You, you, you talked about doing a drawing that would make the distinction clear, but I don't know if that was... Yes, I, I, it is, this, the information is present in this plan, but I guess it is, I admit it's hard to see at this scale. I'm trying to see how you zoom maybe, in. Maybe you can just, maybe you can just point to it then. Okay. Yeah. Cause um. Okay. Well, in this in these wall conditions, so the the ones with poche are are the new walls, while you know, just the the white walls are the original. Um. I I do. Yeah. I, I don't know if, if that's not clear. I can just exit out of this and zoom in on normal okay. InDesign. If that helps to to view that. And then also another comment that I'd like to make about this bathhouse. Um, so in this plan, you also start to see these dotted lines. So um, back in reference towards the Liebling House, the White City Center, um, this is where you would start to have the effect of stripping away pre-existing walls, um, just to have that remembrance of how the bathhouse was originally um, constructed. Why at that spot, Eleanor? Sorry? Why at that particular spot? Why at this particular spot? The having the pool? No, no, no. Having the the remembrance. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I this particular instance or just in general? Because this is reflected throughout the whole the whole building. I think the idea is everywhere she's taken out a wall. There's a there's a she's just left it raw, right? So yeah. the, so there's a palimpsest. I think, if I understand correctly, like that element is a is a new hole you've cut. That is a that is the, the pool mm -hmm. that you've yes. cut out that area and put it down at the level of the plaza, right? And then all this in there is, is new stuff, right? Yes. And yes. then there are, there are some bits of glazing and things like that that are new, I think. Yes. Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah. So yeah, no, to answer your question, it's not just in this area, but it's essentially all throughout the building. It's a continuous uh, dialogue between old and new. So, uh, uh, Eleanor, I have I have a question. I am trying to understand. I mean, I, I've seen the site in the information that Kevin shared, but I, I don't know enough about this the site to understand some of the things that you've done. You're saying that there's a there is a highway that runs under the site here. Yes. And you have lowered that. Yes, I've lowered it. So, uh, and there's this plaza level here. Is is uh, I know that you have lower also the the plaza, but is 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 this level also lower this plaza here than oh. than that has been lower as well? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, for this, I'll go to the, the the section. So yeah, that plaza you see it you know being cut 
through here. So on the one hand, it's actually an extension of the Ben Gurion Boulevard. Um, you know, if you want the specifics of it, it's like 10.1 meters above sea level. Um, but the original Kikar Atarim level um, was closer to the bathhouse level. It was actually at about 12.5 meters above sea level. So that was cut out, not necessarily lowered, but just um, cut out and the, uh, the boulevard was extended. So you're saying that the original plaza was at this elevation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the, and the is the section cut. Oh yeah, the the section cut. It's um, I, I tried to make it not too out there, but um. Can you show it on the site plan? On the site plan. Oh, yes. Let me go, go back here. Yeah. Oh, like to show you the section cut on the site plan, Noah. Yeah, just a line where the section's cut. Oh, sure thing, sure thing. Okay. So it's, I cut it to show different aspects. There you go. It's going okay. Through. This is helpful. Okay. Yeah. And and you're saying. Uh, Eleanor, that you lower that you lower the plaza to make it at the same turn it in, at the same level as this boulevard. Yes, exactly. So how how did people get access to that plaza before from the boulevard? So originally they would um, there was this ramp. It was simply um, a, a ramp that led you up onto Kikar Atarim. Um, I can also. I'm just going to pull something up real quick to, to show you that in a more clear sense, but uh, all right, there we go. You said that you had another section in another direction, right? You haven't shown everything yet, right? Oh, um, no, the, the, those are the drawings. Uh, that okay. I okay. So you have one section and two plans. I thought you said two sections. So you have one section. So you don't have a section in this way, right? Um, no, no, not, not a completed section. Okay. Can you go back to the plan? Yes. So I'm trying to understand. So people will be entering from the bottom here, right? Yes. Then the way, let's see. And the ramp was somewhere in that area. Yeah, so the, the original ramp um, was right here. Uh, you would go up like so, but, but now you can just walk straight. And so um, with the circulation that's now presented, um, you know, there's the main axis that I wanted to retain, you know, going straight towards um, the sea. But then now um, with, uh, the uh, Ben Gurion being the the main central, I guess even you know circulation space and kind of activation uh, between the the garden and the bathhouse. Um, there's now also this axis um, where you can start to address how you enter into the building. So this is a you know very simple a staircase that gets you um, into the bathhouse. Uh, the way that's addressed towards the garden uh, is more so with a, a glass railing so that you can have a view towards the, the trees, a bit of a more revealed view. Uh, but then with the actual entry, you would go through this corridor. Um, it's like, and then the, you will uh, come down this way. The reason why I wanted to have it a bit more, I guess, um, concealed rather than just out in the open, it, it's a reference to, um, this precedent here towards the left, this is the, the I believe the, the court, the square of hope at the Yad Vashem, the Yad Vashem Museum in Jerusalem. Uh, I really thought this was, uh, I guess a more poetic way of entering the space and regarding that, you know, it's, it's a garden with a, you know, an experiential aspect to it, that that's how I, address that circulation. And then uh, the other forms of circulation are all addressed within 
the the walls the walls of the, the garden it's essentially a double skin wall so this you can go up the ramp to get into um, the Colosseum or and then on the other side kind of mirrored you go down to get into the garden yeah I hope that starts to clarify yeah some yeah yeah you, you hadn't talked about the ramp so this wall the, the the wall that you have at the at this side is uh is what one story high how tall is that wall I guess it captures that that ramp going one floor up right at least yes. or how much it goes up yeah so um the the wall starts at essentially eight feet ab above your head um you can kind of start to see that over here yeah. but then it does uh raise up by about another 10 12 feet to to reach the coliseum do you have any elevation any elevations from the ocean side looking looking towards the project uh, no no I, I don't have a, a a completed elevation I have um many working drawings but these are these are the oh, Lord, you want you want to look at your your model like is that that gives you some sense of the overall sure sure um like the in Rhino or the one no, that I no, the one that Sorry, come again? Just the one you presented. Oh, OK. Let's go to that drawing. Yeah, per okay. yeah perfect. Mm -hmm. your, baths are, your baths are happening fully contained in the building that's existing. So you're proposing a renovation to the building to the north, right? Exactly. OK. Do you envision, Eleanor, that, that these two spaces, the bath and the garden, are um, uh, like you're paying for reservations before you go, you're going online and booking a, a, a time slot, or do you imagine that it's kind of city property or how, how have you thought about the business aspect of the two? So yes, I've definitely considered this a lot. I, I don't want anyone to have to book anything or you know pay for anything. It is, uh, it's definitely a public space, the, the ground floor, of uh, the bathhouse is completely public. Um, you know, as you go up on the, the second and third, fourth and fifth floors, um, I'm imagining having, you know, offices and um, shops. Um, and maybe those can start to take on a bit more of a, a private aspect, but the ground floor is public. You don't need to pay for anything. You can, you can just go in and jump into the water or, you know, if you wanna have a view of the Mediterranean within the spa, you can go towards uh, the West End. And, and same for the, and same thing for the garden. Um, the the main idea here is that since Ben Gurion itself is already such a such an active axis, and then the the boardwalk that basically um, borders the beach is already also an active boardwalk. Um, this uh, it it just naturally uh, brings people in this direction. I mean. I... Maybe I, I, I shouldn't be the first one commenting because probably all of you know the site much more than I do. But one, one of the things that I think I feel uh, uh, um, that you've mentioned in passing, but it looks like it's very important for your scheme, is the, is the, is the notion that you are lowering the height of that plaza and in terms of like the way, I mean, this is a very important avenue, right? The, mm -hmm. the boulevard, the Borean Boulevard. And it looks to me that this view looking down towards the Mediterranean. I mean, I'm, I'm really amazed, Eleanor, that you are not showing us a section through there, you know, where you, you can see the Mediterranean that you keep talking about, the, the beach, the plaza, and then the boulevard, because that decision looks like it was a very important part of your scheme, you know, to, and, and without knowing, it looks like it's much better the way the boulevard ends into your plaza than having all of a sudden a ramp that would basically would probably mean that before there was no view at the eye level from the end of the boulevard right so that's a mm -hmm. significant improvement it looks like it should be in your presentation not something that you needed to be discovered there should be some drawing that explains how lowering that is a it's a it's a big undertaking that but it's worthwhile because of what you're trying to do which is to connect into the beach so this boulevard takes people into the beach, into the ocean, into the sense of view and connection to that side. 
And uh, I, I, I wish I could have been a little more clear from your presentation in terms of showing a little more of the context in the section and the, 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 the before and after. It would be very easy in a section to show, even if it's a dashed line or a red line, that you can just say, okay, this is what it was before, this is what we have now. So it would be very easy to see how much you have lowered. So that's, that's I think, is a very good move, how to lower that. Uh, I was trying to get a sense of what you see now, and that was what I was asking for that wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That I think the double wall is a very nice move. It's a very nice way to take people down with these very long ramps that prepare people where they're going. I don't know if I, you know, why you combine it with that little little stair. You know, in a way, it feels like if that's taking care of the ADA. You know, uh, I don't know if the other stair, you needed a stair to be an op to give people an option. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, it's something that you, uh, architects like ramps, but most people, if they given the option, they go with the shorter route, you know, and, and I think it's, it's, a very, it's, it's a very beautiful way that you're inviting people to go down. And I wonder if it could have been the, the, the main one, the one that you are expecting everybody to, to, to go through because you are clearly enjoying the sense that it's a very beautiful experience to go down be between those walls. It could have been also easier to just have maybe some quick renderings or some quick uh, views from the model. It looks like you have in the model a lot of information that could be part of your presentation. And I know that you're working by yourself is hard, but uh, that's one comment in terms of the little stair that is there. I mean, I think it's nice that you have that balcony that looks down into the, so you know where you're going, but then to get there is a big effort rather than just having that other stair going there. And uh, the other thing that I feel like is not fully developed is like what happens in the plaza itself once you lower it. Mm -hmm. You have those very big trees. You're showing trees that look like they're 100 years old with these huge trunks. And, and uh, I, I don't know if you are uh, probably running out of time thinking what happens in that plaza. You might need more like a, like a paved area. But I mean, when you look down the boulevard, I, wanted, I wonder if you want people to be able to see the, the, the blue of the, of the Mediterranean rather than blocking it with the trees. Once you have those trees in the sunken space, I wonder if that plaza is more about just opening that view from the, from the boulevard and not necessarily about putting trees there that will create that disconnection. So those are quick reactions. And as I said, you know, I don't know the site enough, so I'm learning a little bit, but I would say that one thing that is probably like a little casually mentioned is the notion of lowering the highway a little more, which you're not saying is a big undertaking in terms of the ramp that will, it will extend for a long time to in both directions to be able to get all those trucks up to the level. So it's, uh, it's sometimes good to have a section that takes you before and after in terms of what those, what those, uh, those retaining walls would need to be and how it could, it could work. I mean, it's obviously a nice idea that it's already sunken. I think that that's already a great victory for cities when they can manage to get these things to happen on the ground. I don't know if it's an easy sell to say, okay, we're going to lower it even more, you know, so, to, to get the sunken garden. I mean, and the question is, could, could the idea of the sunken garden happen even if it's, I mean, the wall that I was asking you about is already tall enough that it's blocking the view from people at the end of the boulevard. So I'm just trying to understand what that engineering effort is giving you that you cannot achieve with walls themselves. So those are my comments from now. Um, I, I think that um, the idea of, of retaining the architecture and working around it, that's a really nice idea. Um, a lot of the times we come in and we just bulldoze our stuff and, and here you are trying to preserve it. So I think that's that's a really beautiful uh, um, uh, movement. Um, again, a lot of what you're telling us, we can't really see in your drawings. We have to sort of figure out for ourselves. And that's a, a language that uh, if, if it's missing, then uh, your, your presentation just lacks that, that power. Um, like one said, you know, to see the, the, the line of the ocean, to understand the, the, the journey. These, you're proposing a really interesting project. At the same time, it's almost like unsolved in, in the sense that we can really have these kind of anchors that we need to say, oh, this could work. Oh, yeah, this could work. It's just uh, uh, um, too open-ended in, in that sense. A as for the, the sunken garden um, and, and the moment uh, 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 and the journey into it and this connection between the two 
uh, structures. I think that's quite an, an interesting uh, idea. I think that it would be a place that uh, Israelis and Tel Avivis, Tel Avivians would, would enjoy. They would actually go there. I'm not so sure about blocking it, blocking the view to the ocean. The sunken idea is great, but this idea that I can't see the ocean from the garden maybe is, is a bit of a, a, a weak point. But um, yeah, but overall, these are sort of my first initial comments. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Eleanor, what, um, what, what are, what are your feelings in general about the project right now as it sits on the site, like through through visiting the site, through the background research, through just whatever depth you got into it through the course of this semester? What are your feelings about the site? And, and I wonder if at the same time you have some answer to like, is there like a core to this project that, that was like part of, in your mind from the beginning after the visit, this was like the seed of, of a lot of the moves that you made. Do you have some kind of like thesis to the project? Mm -hmm. Two-part question. So you're you're specifically asking about the original site of Kikar Atarim. Or just as it is right now. I mean, you showed a picture at the beginning of, of the site in its heyday. Um, and I think uh, from my understanding, from what I've read, the big issue right now is, is um, uh, there's a maintenance issue, there's a property ownership and development issue. But a big thing is that, that the city still owns the majority and it's expensive to maintain. And so it's fallen into disrepair. So when you walked around it, like, you kept the two buildings, which is really cool. You kept the two, the two kind of iconic pieces of Kikar Atarim uh, right now in your scheme. So, do you have feelings about just the vibe of the site, the 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 soul of it that you're trying to re-expose or something? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because I, I, I personally, um, I, I usually I tend not to, I guess, side on destroying. Um, everything when it comes to a, a project, <laughs> um, I feel like there's a there's a lot of value in what was um, already here, and even a lot of that came out when I was, um, you know, even in the initial uh, phase of design and you know figuring out just even in general how does this existing building work, and just seeing um, just all the work that the the architect put into it, and you know what he he was really trying to um, create in this space, especially with the the different levels and like the the light coming in and the clear story windows and, and so forth and then even um and then oh, we could even say a lot about the coliseum which you know most people you know the pussycat um i i think it definitely got uh more of a a, a bad rep um when it became a strip club but i think as a as a you know you could even just say as architecture i think it has value but then, so, but going back to the, you know, the initial problem, you know, the space has fallen into disrepair. It's not used as a public square, which is, um, which was the original intention and it did originally fulfill that. So, so um, to answer your question, uh, so, okay, in basic terms, yes, it's meant to be a revitalization that, that brings people in, but then, okay, how does that happen? Uh, well, um, so definitely when we were here on this site, um, there's not necessarily a lack of people. There are always people running through or maybe sitting around walking, um, but not any activity in this area. Um, so I wanted to provide something in this design that could, um, you know, I guess benefit, especially the, the community aspect um, particularly in this bathhouse, but when it comes to um, you know the the cafe, which I, I know it's not in a key in the plan, but you know the cafe and the the pool, um, the spas, um, you know so forth, food, um, just to because because these are things that um, I, I say food brings people together, and um, and then something um, with this uh, this this dialogue with water it kind of also response to other things going on um, in the area. But then as for the, the sunken garden, it's, it's pretty um, distinct from everything else. And that is my intention. It's meant to be distinct from everything else because it is essentially an insulation. Because this is Tel Aviv, it's a very dense young city. But 
um, I was thinking it would be a, a beautiful idea to provide um, a garden just for people to come and relax in and essentially get lost in nature. It, it is 31,000 square feet. It's quite large, so you oh. can. <laughs> I, I need to bring this conversation to a close, um, uh, but I was gonna say, and, and if somebody has a last comment, that, that's okay. Um, I, Noah may have wanted to, to say something after his question, um, but I, I was gonna say, I think there's a kind of clarity and a, a, a kind of poetry to the, the idea that you would take the two iconic pieces, albeit reviled at the moment, but treat them with a kind of level of respect and, and start to kind of adapt them for use, I think is a really lovely thing. You're, you're doing what Simon had asked for in the, the last project where you ran the boulevard straight through. I think Juan was a absolutely kind of accurate in, in that being a major move. There, there's like a couple of things that are happening here. One is this kind of, uh, right now the boulevard ends Juan in a kind of fizzle and you get no view of the sea or no real connection. Yeah. To up and wander and turn and, and end up down there, but she's making it totally straightforward. The boulevard continues and then there's a big set of steps that get you right down to the beach and it's kind of clear and powerful. Then keeping the building to the right, but adapting it and then uh, keeping the, the iconic building to the left, although repurposing it and surrounding that with this sort of poetic reflective garden, I think has incredible potential. I, I do think it's a, sh like, what, a, what does the teacher say? Like, if, if I'd seen how much you could accomplish in the last days, like, earlier, I, 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 I would have pushed you much harder er earlier, because I think there were a lot of, there's a lot of time spent kind of within decision as opposed to development. And they're, they're lovely ideas, but one is left desirous of, like, seeing how it could be uh, how, finessed. Does anybody have a last comment before we move on, or...? Well, I was looking at the pictures again that you sent, uh, Kevin, since, you know, I had looked at them, but it's much easier now to understand what you're doing with the picture. So I'm get, I have a better understanding. And I, and I agree that highlighting the, the, the essence, to me, there are three ideas, like the, the, the keeping that building and converting it. I agree that building, if, if, if love is given back to that building, that building has the potential to be back alive, you know, and a good contribution to the city. But the, the section that Eleanor is surprising, that's the first section that you should have had for us. You know, I can see now how complicated it is to go down to the beach from that plaza, the existing one, and the ramp taking you up, and now you reduce the overall drop. So one idea, maintaining the bill. Second idea, very good. The third idea that is very nice, which is the idea of a garden that is, you know, inward looking. That to me is the hardest one for me to understand in the sense that I know that this, this now the reaction to this place is like, oh, there's too much space, too much paving, too much everything. So you have a temptation to just say, let's create something completely different. But I still feel like the notion that there's a connection to the ocean about the city and this place being about that, that, you know, is, 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 is a beautiful idea of sunken garden. Who, who's against a sunken garden full of trees with a beautiful way to go down? It's very hard to be against that. The, the question is, is this the right place? to put that from the point of view of like all the potential connections with the city and with the view. So, and especially when it involves this major engineering undertaking, it becomes more problematic in my mind. But I think that the first two ideas is very clear, very strong. The third, you created a beautiful way to go down there. I just don't think it's the right place to, to put it. Right. Let's let Juan have the last word. And um, Oh, Chris wanted to have the last word. Well, I mean, not, not to be the, um, horrible person who doesn't like sunken gardens, but I, I think the, the project would have benefited, the, the decision to keep the two existing buildings um, is, is a powerful one. I think to make the drawing that shows the carcasses of those two buildings bereft of any other intervention in the context of the city, which is a new site that you you know after all you've you've invented you've you've um, chosen to make that the site for your intervention and i i can't imagine that either the abrupt and rather straightforward nature of the passage down to the beach level nor the sunken garden would follow on from a careful analysis of that new site that you've discovered. Mm. So I, 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 I applaud the um, 
appetite to um, reconfigure the site that was given to you in a, in a way which is uh, refreshing and, and uh, tantalizing. But my, my sense is, is you, you didn't linger on that newfound reality uh, long enough to begin to initiate a, a, a powerful architectural response. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess, and, and this is a, a, a kind of procedural comment really, but um, you know, if you, if you make a, a commitment like that and you say, I'm gonna keep the, these two existing structures, I'm not really particularly bothered about the car parking and underground freeway and all the rest of it that, that goes along with that. But that by doing that excavation, by doing that, um, uh, taking away of, of some of the things that are problematic about the existing site, you open up new opportunities and you're working in a group and everyone else in the group says, oh, that's a ridiculous thing to do and we hate these buildings or whatever. Um, you, need, you need to kind of step back a bit uh, critically as, as a, a participant in the project and say, you know, really, really try and understand, well, you know, sometimes what, as a designer, sometimes one acts on kind of intuition and impulse. This is not a bad thing. You know, this is potentially one great thing about being a designer. But it, you know, if you find that um, you're not finding support within whatever group you were um, placed in, I, I think it's incumbent on you to then come back and, and say, what, have I, what exactly am I proposing? And what exactly is the potential of, of what I'm proposing? And how can I respond to that in a way, and even in a, in a kind of bloody, bloody minded way, and you just say, because I'm gonna prove that these are the people that I was originally placed in a group with don't know what the hell they're talking about, because I've got a better idea. And uh, I, I just feel like at the architectural scale, um, the project is kind of, piggledy piggledy and uh, at the urban the, the first primary decision that you made which is to keep these two buildings um, exca essentially excavate the site and see the latent potential there is is a kind of pretty brilliant and strong you know like powerful um, uh, way forward um, but you, but you have to let that kind of settle. Sorry, I have to raise my hands. I just let that settle in a bit um, to in, inform your action as an architect that follows that action. And, and certainly build off of the things that are hard to move. Like one, there's no reason the garden couldn't have existed with the with the underlying um, highway at the level it was at. And, but it becomes a constraint. So anyway, um, thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, critics. I'm sorry to move us on before the conversation is over. Thank you. We have one more project for three people that we are supposed to get through. So. Good to thank see you, Eleanor. Yeah, thank you. Thank good to you. see you, Noah. Yeah, thank Maybe you all. Maybe stop sharing the screen. And get, um, the last group can go on. Um, uh, so th this is um, uh, Colin, Raymond, and Andrew. And uh, I think they've got some pretty good documentation of the, the site as well. So Juan, I'm sorry that like I, I didn't do you justice by giving you the kind of lay of the land earlier and explaining the but you That's okay. I was I was I was opening back the photographs of the that you sent that now made more sense because I could see the plants and everything. But I think Chris's description uh, it with yours is, is right. It was a kind of very quite a brilliant idea to kind of keep pieces and and excavate um, the stuff that wasn't was in the way and problematic. Do you guys want to start sharing your screen? Andrew, Colin, Raymond. Raymond, are you two quarantining together? Uh, sorry, what? Are you two quarantining together? Yeah, we're we're quarantined. So, we've just been working on studio. Yeah, nice. 
been a good there. time. Yeah. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Raymond Castro. I'm Colin Stack. I'm Andrew Wynn. And uh, this is our project. So starting off, uh, looking at basically just the site in an urban scale, looking at its relationship to um, Yaffa. These are things that are really important, things that the current site um, is attempting to address. There's this moment of recognition between um, the beachfront and Yaffa that we wanted to look at. So this relationship between the two is important. Um, this kind of gives you an idea of the scale um, of that relationship. So it's like roughly two miles. Those larger blocks are half mile um, grid markers. Looking at that relationship between the, the old city of Yaffa um, and then the newer city and then starting to also map out. Um, it's kind of tough to see just because this is a larger drawing, but um, at a smaller scale, looking mapping out um, some of the cultural places of emphasis in the city that we hope to that or that we use to start to orient um, our programmatic um, uh, how we were building up the different programs that we wanted to um, have on our site. Yeah, uh, and looking at the site, we wanted to kind of mention the cultural, um, like, is it feeling of Jaffa as, as the old city and, and the new part of Tel Aviv with uh, all the like newer development structures going on along this beachfront. Um, and as, in examining the site, we noticed that there's like a change as you go along the path in development over time. So this relationship between the old and the new is something that like isn't isn't like of our own just creation. This is actually something that like like going back to the Getty's plan for the city was something that was important um, for how the city was developing. Um, Getty's was looking at how this relationship between the old and the new, how there's a moment of recognition between the two, um, this old really old character of Yaffa that exists to the south, and then this you know new offspring character that um, that this that the rest of Tel Aviv hopes to establish. Um, this plan also talked about this idea of a garden city, um, emphasizing open spaces. This starts to look at it in a in like early, mid mid 1900s. Um, looking at these idea of boulevards, these open spaces, how that promotes um, physical health, how that promotes activity for the city. Um, it builds a city, gives it a sense of character and vibrance. Um, um, and then another thing is uh, maintenance for these kind of pathways and in, in incorporating the public center along the street is much easier with the, this kind of maintenance. So. You see this all around Tel Aviv. Um, this kind of this is its current condition in, in the 1930s. This was when they were planting. Um, Gettys was also interested in the like the revitalization um, and resurgence of the coastline, um, how this city connects to the coastline. So we felt that part of what we're doing on the site is recognizing the coastline at an urban level. Um, so the city has a lot of cars in it. There's not as much parking. That's something that we'd like discovered in our research and talks with Itai. Um, so part of like our scheme is um, the development of this tram line that connects the old to the new, connects our, our center um, in Kekara Tarim to the old kind of area of Yaffa. And so if we zoom in more to the site, um, just to get a scale. So this is Kekara Tarim here in the middle and we'll show more imagery and everything, but just to note some of the programs that are going on here, a bit of a market space and it's kind of a, a bit of a dead space here in the middle as you, as you drop down um, a series about 20 feet to get to the ground level uh, where the pool house and the marina space is in its current condition. So after we were at the site and examined a bit of it, there was a few moments that we were there that we really wanted to make sure that we incorporated or acknowledged in our project. The main one being the boulevard, uh, Ben Gurion Boulevard, which has that Getty's plan type structure of the boulevard. And so this on the site is 
all the way, extended all the way to this conclusion here at Kikara Turin. And we notice that uh, it kind of dies there as you ramp up and have to turn the corner to get down to the site. It's an issue that we wanted to address in, in the design development. Yeah, and then uh, one of the other aspects of the site was down at the beach level, Gordon Beach. Um, it was just a very active area um, with uh, sort of like volleyball courts and just um, uh, these active like sports areas right next to the marina. Um, yeah, and we noticed that uh, while they aren't linearly connected, the path that you would fall to get to them um, kind of connects it in, in the procession, in linear procession. So that's another thing that we wanted to address in, in designing our site. Um, one thing that we noticed, that these two are our biggest attributes that we wanted to acknowledge, the beach front and the boulevard. But in our opinion, Kikara Tarim is, although it's quite unique, it's, it's a bit in the way and has, has causes some differences that we're not quite fond of. The structure of the, um, Boulevard is nice and programmed in the sense that everything is aligned, but there's a lack of structure in the placement of Kikara Tarim and the uh, programming of the site. But there is some cultural uniqueness when we examine the site that we really appreciated. Uh, one being this road condition underneath uh, this major artery of transportation, it does raise the elevation a bit, but it allows for cars to go underneath the site. And then also the this kind of weird cultural um, acropolis, and then also the, uh, the strip club here and, and the-, the Marina Hotel. There, there are certain aspects of the Marina Hotel where it, it emphasizes like verticality and expression of structure that we also wanted to apply to our interventions on the site. Did, did you say that there's a strip club in that building? <laughs> yeah. Not, uh, not anymore. Not it anymore. closed six months ago. It's a nonprofit now. Uh, but in its past, yeah. it was once a nightclub and a strip club and- Really? <laughs> it was one of the ideas that they thought to revitalize. <laughs> <laughs> to bring back that student. Okay, got it. Uh, so we thought that in getting rid of the site or getting rid of Kikara Tarim, there is uh, an issue that we have to deal with in reconnecting these two spaces that we, we adore. And our main issues with reconnecting the spaces is the street condition of the major, major artery. So there's this moment where the this major thoroughfare that runs along this, the coastline that connects it to Yapa, um, there's this moment where it dips underneath the site and then it comes right back up. Um, and so there's this very large disconnect between this, this residential neighborhood on one side and then this beachfront. There's, there's really lacks a connection. So one thing that we were doing that applies to kind of the urban, urban level of, of what we're doing with our scheme was allowing that boulevard to go under, underground like it currently does, but then continue underground, which then opens up the space adjacent to these hotel buildings. Um, it opens up that space at the ground level to then actually create some, some sort of connection um, between the neighborhoods and the beachfront. Because in terms of access between the, the two areas, you have to walk pretty far in either direction, north or south, to actually come to a moment where you can go up and actually transition across that space. So basically leveling out and lowering the, the road. And then another thing that is important is we realize that there's a, a sectional change from the boulevard to Gordon Beach. About 21 feet to get to the beach level and then about another nine or so feet, depending on where you are on the site, to get to the waterfront level. So it's another issue that we have to deal with um, in our intervention. And so one of the major things is that we thought is just, just bring the boulevard all the way out to the sea. 
and extend it past the existing breakwater. The existing breakwater comes out about right here uh, where my cursor is. And to do that, to jut past the existing breakwater, we'd have to go out 1,600 feet. Um, what this will do is reconnect the uh, boulevard to the ocean front in a new condition. Um, and what it also does is the, uh, it splits the site into two. And one thing that we noticed while being there is there's kind of this public beachfront and then another private beachfront on this other end. And we thought, why not merge the um, private programs like the voting, voting program with the uh, private beach and then merge the public programs like the pool area with the more public side of the beach, which faces Jaffa, which also faces um, the more active uh, scene of the beachfront. Is the private beach, the, when you say that there's a private beach, is a part of a hotel? It's, it's more in its condition where it's nestled here uh, with the elevational change and it's pinched by the land constraints. So, it's, it's a much more private, it's and then not privatized. It's not privately owned. Oh, okay, it's so uh, it's just more difficult access. More difficult access, more constrained, and and then uh, that's why it's more private. And we also programmed it with uh, moving over the marina, which the boats you know want any just anybody going near your boat, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other thing that we thought is, if we have these two programs on either side, we need to, when addressing the bar, uh, we need to ad address it in like a sectional change. And when, since we have the length, we might as well drop it down to the ground. Um, so we have like a 21 foot drop to the programs on either side. But we also need the access between the yeah. two. So, so these two moves um, are, kind of conclusions that we drew from conversations with Itai talking about um, Israeli cultural like um, dislike for these elevational changes um, or difficulty with, I don't, um, using those like elevational changes that are forced. Um, so allowing there to be some sort of like very gradual um, transition between this boulevard level and the beach level was something that we felt was our hope was to um, find a, a point of resolution with that move that um, address kind of a little bit of like the culture of the area. And the other thing that it does is we recognize that in drawing this out in a way we're bisecting the site, but we wanted to open it up so that it bisects but does not disconnect um, like visually either side of the site. Um, there is the programmatic distinction between the, the, the smaller beach and this marina um, on the Northern side of the bar and then um, the kind of like the little park, the sports park and the other beach um, program that happens on the southern side of the bar. So separate and distinct, but still accessible. Uh, another thing, so this is kind of our, our conclusion to that diagram. Um, the bar continuing all the way down and then with the supporting programs. And then the end conclusion of the boulevard and how it would meet the water's edge. Is that, uh, uh, okay, so it's the steps, or is that a ramp? Is that a Sorry, ramp? This, this is a, a ramp here. Okay. And there are steps on, on either side. Illustrated. Do you know if there's a certain slope if it just leads straight into the water? <laughs> I'm just uh, yeah, there, there's, I don't remember the exact amount. Oh, I'm sorry, Raymond, I was joking. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Is that the last image or do you have more? No, no, there's, there's more. <laughs> there's a lot more to show, so you guys might go through that. Yeah. Uh, so the original site in the original uh, Bangarian section we looked at and the major moment is we wanted to uh, bring that to the water's edge, which is illustrated here. This is also a moment where we're kind of like recognizing the two different sort of planes 
levels that we're working with, one that's like very much on the ocean level and one that's at this boulevard level, there's this kind of like moment of in between as well as on top of space um, where like, this action happens and this movement happens. So we're trying to like the end conclusion of it is a moment where you can be on top of it or on bottom um, and you either are within this field or kind of above it, but there's a recognition of those two um, kind of organizational planes. And then the two supporting um, sides of either site, we have pools and uh, sports fields, sports centers. This is looking at that island moment as, as you see between the two sides of the sports area with the marina on either side. Um, here's a, a section of the structure here where it's one continuous um, concrete structure. And then here's a, an image there in the island moment as, as it drops. And then the elevation picks back up here towards the end of the. A little bit about, I mean, the marina, we just kind of went into like programming that on the other side. There's a relationship between organizationally kind of how these two sides are, uh, are related in plan, looking at drawing these kind of lines between how these bays where the boats are organized could relate to how these sports fields and pools are organized. Um, and then and then lastly, there's an existing bike path and pedestrian mm -hmm. walkway. Um, and we wanted to make sure that this thoroughfare is continued through our site. So we created another one of those eyelid moments where the mm -hmm. sports or the, the bike path runs through. And then in that curve in the arc, we're able to create another market space, which relates back to the old market space of Hikara Turin. And then getting into the this tower portion of the site, this program was a result of kind of like our research of Tel Aviv as this, it's a newer city. Um, what is its identity? Um, what is this site's uh, like relationship with the identity of um, the city as a new place, a place that's happening? So like this incubator tower was an idea that allows for, you know, it's a tinkering space. It's a, it's a space of creativity. It's a space where um, people are, are able to come and like create new ideas. Um, and it's very like tech um, oriented, like in our very tech heavy society. It's kind of like speaking to that relationship. Um, is that tower the only one, uh, is, are the other towers existing or? Yes. Are, yes. So you are proposing just one of those that we saw. Correct. Yeah, that tower um, is kind of a like a book in a moment almost where you're kind of ending this rhythm um, that continues along the beachfront of these like hotel towers. Um, the program will be different for this, but it it's similar in like in volume to some of these towers. But it's also a moment where you're kind of able to see um, you're able to like occupy it and look back upon Yaffa as well as upon the, the programs that we're creating down on the beach level. Um, this, the tower is also like one thing that we wanted to make sure is that there's this adjacent kind of park space, um, that also addresses the, if someone doesn't want to take that whole boulevard and to go down, there is a means of access to the beachfront, to the market level, um, that is more gradual. It's, it's subtle. It doesn't, it doesn't take away from the kind of power of that larger move of the bar being pulled out towards the ocean but it still allows for that accessibility. It also provides shade, which is something that we feel is in dire need of on the current um, site condition. And there's a relationship in plan between how these, how this kind of like subtle park space is organized in relationship to the, the tower space. Um, as you can see, kind of like there's this kind of continuation inside and then how that develops the groundscape is something that we also were looking at. Um, and then we're also looking at crafting these spaces that are kind of these volumes that are emphasized. So what you're looking at right here is this, this maker space that we're trying to emphasize. Um, there's a moment where you can view into the space. There's this big LED wall and it puts things on display. And then behind you have kind of this workshop space um, where people are able to build, to, be, to create, to present, to share new ideas, um, to collaborate. Um, so there's this, kind of like very, there's this openness in one sector to what, what's happening. Um, this section is also looking at 
the relationship between these three volumes here, the maker space, this larger gathering space, this flexible open gathering space, and then this presentation space. Um, trying to look at that relationship um, in section and then how it relates to kind of like the bar coming out in this sectional difference um, on the street or on the beach level. And then here's just looking at the, the lobby, created like a rendition for the lobby. Um, and then looking at the sectional relationship between um, this program of the tower um, as and the performing arts, something that we really wanted to emphasize. There's also this relationship between like this continuation of this, this tree line and then kind of how that can like flow into um, this lobby space, flows relates to the structure. There's also looking at that current condition where the, the, high, the uh, thoroughfare drops underneath. We're proposing that we extend that. There's also an ability to connect that to parking underneath. So there's current parking on the site. We want to maintain parking um, as a public kind of amenity. Um, so there's this sectional relationship. It also starts to speak towards how we were kind of like forming these, these, um, these masses. There's a relationship in section between the two. Yeah, so that upper elevation for the theater uh, responds to um, the balconies and like uh, highlighted maker spaces in the tower um, and also um, opening up that lobby on the ground floor uh, and facing, they both face the boulevard. Um, and then zooming in onto this uh, performance space. One of the things in Tel Aviv that we noticed is that there's a lot of um, sort of highlight put on these professional um, sort of uh, performance spaces as these uh, sort of uh, cultural monuments in the city. Um, but there's sort of a lack of uh, arts education for uh, younger uh, audiences and, um, and, um, and students to actually go out and um, sort of learn. And um, the space is intended as this uh, performance arts um, educational um, facility. And uh, there's these three main volumes in plan, which uh, pick up on some of the existing geometry of the site to the north and uh, to the east with the residential areas of the city. And then um, there's the main performance space in the center, um, which responds to the geometry of the tower across the boulevard. Um, and the main entrance is underneath that main volume. Um, and then there's this uh, large staircase in this main lobby, which uh, highlights just this opening onto the boulevard with this glass lobby wrapping around the corner. So just for me to understand, you're proposing a program because you believe there is a lack of it in Tel Aviv? Um, well, I don't think it's just because of lack of it, but also like, um, just like a need, like there's, um, there's a lot of emphasis put on um, professional performance. And we think that uh, there could be a facility that highlights um, sort of the education of artists. Okay. What do you, do you have a drawing that shows me what's happening with that thoroughfare that goes along the beach? Where, where are you doing? You said that you're extending, you're sunken it more. What, what, where, what is exactly that you are doing? This section, I don't know if I understand where it is now and what are you proposing, or if there's a plan that you can explain it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little hard to read in that section because the boulevard underneath, or not boulevard, but that thoroughfare is curving. We're um, looking at Ben Gurion's house, technically, on the boulevard in your section. This, this is where it's going down now, more or less, right? Yes, yeah, yes. Is. this is the existing point where uh, the thoroughfare goes underground. So the existing building that you are removing is more or less replaced by this one? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so then it continues underground over this building mm -hmm. and, and, and it the other building? It continues yes. underground past those hotels. If you remember the, like the, the larger tower yeah. um, image, it extends a little bit like past those, that end of those, that hotel line. Mm -hmm. Where's the hotel on this plan is just cut off on the bottom of the drawing, right? Mm -hmm. I think so. North is up. North is up on this. And is up. You're yeah. just showing this is just more a drawings thing. they want to show, I think, too. Oh, yeah. Okay. The thoroughfare goes through there and cuts. Yep. And then it reemerges at the end of those that Can series. You show of where, where does it reemerge exactly? At the end the of Gordon? that series of towers. Um, there's a change in the landscape right. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But you're leaving that more or less as it is, correct? Guys, you, you, the, 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 the higher cone, when it goes down, you're yes. not particularly changing that. Yes. To the north, yes, it's it's staying much the same. We're just allowing it to continue going at that same level underneath right. the site, rather than, because it, it emerges like right up here, um, like right kind of in between there, in, um, the, current in the current condition. So we're allowing it to continue underneath, which then opens up this, this area above, to be to allow access for that tram line as well as pedestrian access that oh, no. crosses the space. So, so yes, yeah, they they are extending it, Kevin. Uh, no, no, no. I know that. I, I, just talking about the north, I, I know the scheme. So that that they the, the the urban part of their project is is taking this area that had been a kind of trough that uh, that you couldn't really cross and turning it into something that was more, so we say, pedestrian oriented, and you can you can cross across it now. Mm -hmm. yes. But the other, the north side is staying the same. Yes. But then, technically, if someone asks you, you could still make work a lot of the things that you're proposing, even if it goes up at the same exact same point that it is now. Your project is not dependent on on no. on that. No, it's independent. Mm -hmm. Correct. But that that was kind of something at the urban level that we wanted to create more of a sense of connection between between the neighborhood and then this, this beachfront, which as it currently is, it feels very disjointed. Yeah, it feels no, no, I agree. Disconnected. No, I think it's a good thing. I think they took a kind of primary interest in, you know, I'd set the project up and said, you know, one of the oddest things about Tel Aviv is it's on the sea and there's this big, beautiful beach, but the city fabric doesn't engage it. And so the mm -hmm. major move of taking Ben Gurion out as a peer it is um, the primary thing, but then the, there are other elements like that covering up a part of the, the kind of um, uh, dug in the highway to kind of reconnect that part of the city to the sea is, was part of that as well. But we guys just maybe finish the presentation? Mm -hmm. um, just sort of to wrap things up, um, again, similar to the tower and highlighting those uh, important spaces um, Similarly, in these performance spaces, using glazing to um, open up these views um, out towards the water and the uh, extension of the boulevard. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah. And now we can sort of go back to. Yeah, could you, could you just stay there for a sec? Um, if, if I might just jump in. Um, this project is, is, is by far, uh, I find an extremely intelligent project, the way you manage to sort of intertwine all these different uh, public uh, um, activities uh, with this really intelligent um, um, boulevard that continues all the way through. Um, I, 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 by the way, I did talk to you about this idea that people don't really like to walk up to a second level. People, humans tend to like to exist on one plane. Uh, uh, this is true in many places in the world. Uh, just in Tel Aviv, they just, they're very stubborn. They're not willing to go there. So, so I, but I do think that what you have proposed um, is more like a journey and, and I could see that actually working uh, much better. My my really own concern uh, about the project is is that the, the the scale of your buildings and their relationship. It's almost like the the urban suggestion is really powerful, whereas the building, um, if you look at context, because 
you spoke about Kikarlin being in the way, which is very true. That's what everybody, ever since I was a child, everybody referred to it for being in the way and why did they do it? And there were a lot of arguments about, you know, again, going to uh, this idea the architect had and was it really in the benefit of the city, et cetera. And then you're proposing a, a, a very large structure. Um, I'm talking about the, the, the tech area. On, 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 on the beachfront, uh, where the tech zone is actually in the Gan, on the border of Ayalon, that's where the, the tech zone of the city is. That's where Microsoft is, where the large companies are. Um, so it almost feels a bit disconnected in the, in the way of what everybody wants that area to become. It wants more you know, connection to the, to the city. Maybe that program could be uh, adjusted. Um, your performing arts center, um, oh, the performing arts center, I think it is much more uh, of a gentle intervention and I think a powerful one and one that would work because one of the things that make the, the new uh, um, uh, development in the North Harbor part uh, uh, fail is that they just bombarded it with shops and it worked for about two years. Everybody was going there and now it's becoming like less attractive because it's not the place to go anymore. And by, by in certain cultural aspects, you're really making sure that it's not just about the shopping or just about, you know, something that will eventually uh, uh, dissipate. But, but the thing is that I made a comment about Habima becoming this white elephant that they all call, how, how Tel Avivians are, are really uh, critical about mass structures, um, sort of being out of scale a bit with what they love and, and this pushback from a lot of people in the city not to allow the city to become this high rises. There was a project uh, proposed here for uh, high rises and, and, and it got canceled because people were like, no, we don't want this to become for the rich and powerful. We want this to be a part of the city. And therefore the scale has to sort of, you know, have that dialogue. Uh, going back, your urban design does that. Your buildings sort of maybe if you just tone them down a little bit, it would, it would just be more powerful. But uh, besides that, I, I, I really enjoyed seeing this project develop, the process and the result. And, uh, you know, you guys should be really, really proud. It's a great project, all in all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's obviously like very accomplished in terms of the, the overall development and the presentation maybe it was a little too long you know you, you could have condensed it a little bit like you know saying the same thing without missing uh you have a lot of renderings some of them are great some of them are a little less great but uh the 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 project is very ambitious and i think that you you took it all the way so you 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 really address some of the self-imposed challenges that you that came along with this great ambition it has a little bit this kind of feeling and and i think itai probably can speak about it you know and he already did a little more like from the point of view that it's going to have more people on the kind of defense because it feels a little bit like a more of a big real estate operation that is you know bringing this grand scale that every city in the world has this dream of of, of this grand scale so so from that point of view, I can imagine like some of the, the, the scale of the city that it comes along with Ben Gurion Boulevard is this, I mean, that's one of the things that makes it a UNESCO World Heritage Site is that the scale of that space is so unifying and so unique in terms of like, there's nothing like that anywhere in terms of the consistency of that scale that I think that this project could have worked if, if, if at the level of the boulevard, you maintain that sense of like, it's not only the boulevard that we're gonna continue, but we're gonna continue the scale of the fabric that came along with the boulevard all the way. We're gonna be tempted, not tempted with the towers that are already happening on the edge of the beach. So the, the, the beach brought those towers, but the fabric of the city is a very different thing. And that the boulevard, I think, could have come with the fabric with the scale of the fabric. So I, I think that you probably could have worked without the, the, the tall tower if that became, con became controversial. So that's one comment. The, 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 the other comment is that there's a lot of beautiful moves that you did with the, once you went ahead with the idea of the boulevard extended at the high level. So it, it gives a very beautiful destination. So the view of the water from there is clear. 
The only thing it's done is that it has made a much more of an effort to get there. So when you think about the boulevard and all the activity that there there is in the, on either side of the boulevard, in this case now you are asking for a, a long you know stretch to get to the water. So in a way you have pushed. It's one of those moments that cities push the the, the kind of uh, water line farther in into the ocean, right? So the notion of how long does it take to get to the water is now being pushed uh, significantly far. And, you know, to get to the to the public beach is, is, is more or less the same effort. I don't, I mean, even before it's probably about, you know, it's not necessarily a more clear path to get people to the public beach. But uh, I love the way you have brought down that zone of the, of the boulevard to be able to allow for easy flow into this very rich uh, environment of you know sports facilities and all those kind of amenities uh, I, I think that in a way I miss a little bit the closeness of the ocean to the to the fabric of the city and 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 it's almost like one of those things say well that's the price that you have to pay to gain all these other great things that you're creating so from that from that point of view I'm trying to look at the the potential readings of this project from the point of view of the locals and the and the concerns that they may have. Beautiful project. It has a little bit that kind of heavy hand of big real estate operation coming into a town that has a little bit that more nuanced fabric that is a little less about big moves, but more about the the, the scale becoming, you know, very uniform and anonymous in a way. So that's that's my kind of reaction to it. Mm -hmm. One thing I think um, that's interesting is that it does seem like the studio set up in a way to develop an urban strategy and then maybe that urban strategy becomes a bit of a master plan and then you develop that master plan to the extent that you're able to. I think the project that you designed is even through the expression of the, the main three elements, not to mention all the rest of the site elements, it has sort of three different expressions, which I like a lot. You're not trying to tie it all into one gigantic swoop that makes up all of the architecture, but but you have broken down the scale into essentially three projects with a lot of site work, a lot of public beachfront work. You've got tennis courts, soccer, basketball, all that stuff, which all feels very appropriate culturally, which is really cool. I think that the the, the one thing that um, I feel like if I was if I was sitting at my studio desk and Kevin was over my shoulder halfway through the semester would have been something to do with um, connecting your urban your urban planning move maybe from the first half of the studio or first week of the studio and actually making that where you where you developed your master plan i think this this drawing right here is is um exhibits very clearly that you know obviously you guys did a beautiful job the renderings are awesome you've explained whatever is going on in your minds really really well it's all on the page there's nothing to argue about there but your kind of lingering urban plan move is off to the side undeveloped a big big infrastructural project still i mean you have to continue the highway uh, uh at a low level for a while and cap that whole thing and that whole cap becomes a metro and all this stuff that you're talking about a huge pedestrian experience and so if you're proposing this as the master plan and that as just another idea then they're a little bit incongruous like one wants to be the other you want this to be the project or that to be the project um i think all the moves that you did on this one were great one thing that i think would be really interesting maybe just a little, a little uh, mental game to play would be, if a city took on a project like this, I imagine, um, uh, I think like Juan and Itai were kind of saying, I imagine that it would be a master plan that's a 20 year project or something. I mean, this would, this would cost Tel Aviv a lot of money to, Tel Aviv and developers a lot of money to put together, it would take many years. So I wonder if you have any strategy for a possible phasing um, a phasing that, that really makes sense at every phase so that the city doesn't end up with a construction site that lasts 20 years, but a phasing where they get the first piece and that first piece works super well. That could be the public spaces, the soccer field, stuff like that. The public space works super well. And then after that's developed and the city gets happy and starts to incorporate into that public life and it starts to become kind of a cultural, a cultural spot for the city and the beach life, then the extension of the boulevard comes in, then the this, then the that. But Maybe you have some idea of how it's phased over a long period of time because it's a huge undertaking. But in summary, I mean, it's beautiful. Whoever did the renderings, I, I don't know if that's all of you. I, I kind of like the idea that each of you took one of these buildings. Was it something like that or? 
Yeah, it's it basically that. Okay, we, okay, we that makes sense. Sectioned I've... off a, a portion of the site. Since we're in quarantine, it's hard to collaborate. Oh, for sure. Uh, we're stuck here, so. The so one of you is you... the local architect and the other, the other <laughs> architect or something. Um, but you guys did a great job. The renderings are awesome. It's a project to be proud of for sure. The one note I would make on the drawings is that your line drawings are all awesome. Like your, your architectural drawings, section plans, elevations, they're all awesome. But if you just filled the poche rather than, rather than kept the poche white, if you actually filled it with the blue that you're using, they would read so much better on the page. All the drawings are great, but you would read the spatial, the spatial uh, feelings of those drawings a lot more if you filled in the poche. Awesome presentation, it's really good looking. Thank you. Thank you. And please uh, produce a two page in English about the project so we can, uh, can have that translated. Um, and I know that today's the end day, but if you guys want to tweak some stuff up, you're more than welcome to do it. If, if it goes to the, you know, to the uh, mayor, you know, it, it's worth it. Okay. Hi guys. Um, it's just a, it's an incredibly accomplished project as everyone has been talking about. Um, and um, I watched a few of the um, projects in the interim um, on the YouTube stream. And so it's been interesting kind of seeing the different takes people have had on this um, site. And um, the extension of um, Van Buren is uh, I think the most logical um, way to, to do this project. I, um, you know, drawings, renderings, all of that is um, really great. And I, um, I do, um, similar to Juan, feel like you um, potentially overbuilt the site a bit. Um, there's an element of, um, this is like the foster and partners solution to um, the brief. Um, and um, I understand that this is a, um, to get something built of this scale would require a really massive public partner, public private partnership. Um, and so building that makerspace with um, kind of tech offices, it, maybe that's your solution for how you might begin to pay for um, some of what you're building. Um, but I think, um, I think the project would be a stronger um, gift to the city without that building. And if you pulled the sports fields back so that it, um, it would bring the coast closer to the city and from that neighborhood and from um, Van Buren, you start to actually be able to see those sports fields probably at, at points. Um, so I think those are a wonderful destination. Um, I don't know if you talked much about um, rising sea levels during this project, but um, this was one of the first projects that really kind of aggressively is at the water line and isn't, you know, those 10 or 20 feet up. And so that does start to be something that you have to think about with the floodplain. And um, if you would start to lose some of this or the, um, the cost required to, um, to build out into the ocean the way that you're proposing. Um, I also think that the powerfulness of that um, extended boulevard um, would actually be even bigger if those playing fields and sport fields brought, pulled back so that when you were out there, you were really, really, um, out there and feeling like you saw the ocean at least on two sides um, rather than um, having the pools right there. I think um, that would be uh, incredibly powerful um, in terms of a gesture. And then um, I also agree that the Performing Arts Center is just a really nice building. I think it, um, it fits really well scale-wise with the rest of the city. Um, it seems to work really well with um, of how you would flow in and out of it off of those public um, spaces. Um, but for me, the, um, the pier is really the, um, the shining star of your project and kind of you've negotiated the different levels and opened it up in places, created views in between um, that it's incredibly complex and very accomplished. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. I might oh, say, oh, go ahead, Chris. Well, I was just going to say, and I, I guess, am I right, Kevin, this is the last project we're going to see today? Yeah. So maybe this is a kind of roundabout way of um, wrapping up as much as a kind of comment on this particular project. I mean, the, the, the project is incredibly um, accomplished. Um, 
I, I salute you. Um, I, I would say of all of the projects that we've seen, the one um, strategy which I have not observed is uh, maybe, maybe something implicated by the Gettys plan or not, um, is actually the, um, you know, when I, when I think of cities on the Mediterranean um, and the Mediterranean as a, as a kind of uh, cultural hub, uh, I mean, Ferdinand Burdell wrote so beautifully about it as, as being a, a place where, you know, all of the cities along the coastline are, are kind of joined since Phoenician times. Um, but the idea of a kind of corniche, of a, um, uh, a kind of urban space which runs parallel with the coast and acts as a kind of point where all of these boulevards and, and cross streets collect and offer a multitude of ways of um, navigating that sectional differential between the, the level of the the city and the level of the beach. And uh, I mean, I've been impressed by two or three of the projects which take on this idea of the boulevard becoming a pier. Um, but as the day has gone on, I, I keep, I, I, I still don't understand exactly the character and quality of the thing that people describe as a boardwalk. I still don't understand the uh, many and numerous or infrequent ways in which the city um, has public access down to the beach across, let's say from this site to Yaffa and beyond um, to the north. Uh, I, I've uh, applauded the, the two or three projects that we've seen that have actually raised the the sunken uh, um, thoroughfare back up to street level. And I just think there's, like it's a way of reframing the, the notion of the site to think of this as one place in which the city um, intersects with something which is longitudinal and, and lateral. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I don't want to, you know, kind of dwell on it, but uh, that's that's the the kind of overarching comment I would make at the end of a day's um, enjoyable readings of all of the uh, spirited work that's gone on in the studio. But uh, there's been probably half the projects that have made a point of making some kind of connection between this site and the um, historic center of Yaffa. But I, I haven't had any vivid sense of what that means, of how it's used now, of what, what the uh, collective set of um, uh, relationships between the beachfront and the city uh, as they exist. And, and so I suppose if one, let's just imagine that one had a, a greater sense of that, one would understand this site is one of many, uh, uh, some of which are rather discreet and um, even banal, some of which are more kind of triumphant. And then I think you could, you know, you could start to take a proposition like this and, and several others we've seen that have these, um, notions of the boulevard extending um, towards the Mediterranean as a, as a kind of pier and put them in a kind of meaningful context. So for me, uh, at some distance and certainly an extreme distance removed from Tel Aviv, um, that's, um, that's the thought that uh, engages me at the end of these projects is uh, not just what happens here, but how is this site um, part of a family of conditions of the city coming down to the ocean or the, the Mediterranean? Um, but I, I mean, I, I don't want to diminish 
my praise for this particular project, which I think is extremely accomplished, uh, um, as has been said. But that's, you know, maybe, maybe that's a question that I could open up to the, this particular group or to the other panelists is, um, you know, there is, there is a tradition in urban design and planning and, uh, and, and, and not just planning as a, as a kind of uh, uh, exercise, but as a, as a kind of way of assimilating a certain kind of cultural practice of being, you know, on a, on a street that overlooks the beach or you know, the Pacific Coast Highway in Los Angeles, or, uh, I mean, I, I could rattle them off. I mean, a, a million examples I can think of that have, um, on the one hand, a sense of continuity and their geographical relationship with the relationship between the, the ground and the sea and the horizon, um, but also with episodic distinctions that um, locate quite specific urban localities within Anyway, that's all I have to say. In my case, I would say that I, I, I didn't have uh, as many projects. Uh, I only saw these uh, these two really in terms of even if this was three projects working together. And uh, um, I appreciate even more now Eleanor's uh, courage to basically say we're gonna we're gonna keep this building. You know, the previous project. I, I didn't understand what was coming, so I didn't know if everybody had to do that or I mean I didn't know how open Kevin you were about what to do with the existing uh, building. But I think it's interesting that uh, Eleanor put that on herself. I know that it's very tempting to basically say let's just start from scratch and I think it's it's good that you guys did it. You know, Andrew, Colin and Raymond. And, but I, 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 I have to say that I think it's interesting to, to have that dialogue within the studio. So Eleanor, if you're still there, I think it's, especially when this is going on in the studio, I think it's, it's very interesting for you. And I think Chris mentioned some, something along those lines when, when, you were, when Chris was saying, hey, you need to just prove that what you're doing can accomplish the same things by, by keeping it. So I think that, I think it's good that the studio kept that dialogue until the end by having projects that are so radically different from basically this one and, and that one. Because at the end of the day, I completely agree with Chris. I mean, the, 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 the challenge of most coastal cities is always the same. And here we don't have the railroad, but always cities have to deal with this issue of how we get this line not interfering with the flow that you want from everybody that's trying to get to the beach. And, and you constantly find cities all the time finding themselves disconnected with the sea, with the, disconnected with the water. The reason that they are there is because of that connection and all of a sudden harbors grow, highways get built, railroads get built. So I agree that, you know, in general, I don't know enough about uh, Tel Aviv. I've never been to Tel Aviv. Now I definitely want to, to, to go there. Uh, uh, but I, I would say that I agree that it would be more beneficial for the city if, if there is, you know, a constant sense of connection along this whole fabric, even if it's, even, even if it's a different strategy where, where you can say, well, are you benefiting more people by having, you know, a, a strategy that goes along the whole front? And, and I know that that's not the purpose of this project, you know, but in, in a way, I think that you are doing that by having these moment when you say the, the underground is continue and the question is should the, should this thing be underground from here to here like some cities have done like in in, in in Madrid for example they like to bury a lot of the things and it's amazing the impact that it has in mind that that, that thoroughfare is, is buried from there all the way to to whatever end is that the the fabric can really flow would that investment be more beneficial for the city that a more concentrated you know, a beautiful moment, you know, in this particular place. I don't know. I don't know all the issues, but I, I have to say that that's one of the things that any city will need to kind of deal with in terms of where is the investment going? Because I just wanted to say, just going back to incredible accomplishment of the project, I just wanted to go imagine like what will happen if this gets into the kind of real world. And one of the things that I think it will happen very quickly, it will be, the questioning of the need for this to have two levels. So when I look at the boulevard coming down, I don't see a huge difference 
in whether this can step down here and be from here to here at grade level. You know, it will, it will definitely create less opportunities for this incredible flow of up two levels. But what's happening now is that the, the place where people get their feet wet, get to the water, is a very hard place to access with not many people really get into it. And, and the edge where you really get that, you know, super wonderful view is, is relatively concentrated at the end. Spectacular in that regard, but more concentrated. So the experience of walking along this space here, you would argue that it's almost the same when you have the ability to be at gray and, and relate to the water and to the events here, but it has a much beneficial impact in terms of how you experience these spaces when you don't have this element in between you and you know in mind like in terms of like how the blocking of this is is having an impact so there's a clear impact of this elevated walkway so if the boulevard is the goal to finish it you can finish it by from here going to the beach going to this going straight but it is a big it's a big uh, element there so it, it it would be questioned at some point not only from the point of view of the cost and the, the involvement that it takes to build it, but for the kind of sense of what you are setting to accomplish when you do the diagram of Boulevard continuing, it doesn't need to continue at that plane. I mean, once you get here, the stairs going down here and allowing you to see out will be an amazing place to step down there and just see all this and the view and then it could be very, it could be very celebrated. So I just want to add a little bit of critical point of view to the to the project from the point of view that the accomplishment is so impressive that it's very hard to not just start with praise and you know stay there. The renderings that you have are the places where the building is less visible. A lot of the renderings that you have that make this building a spectacular are barely seen by anybody experiencing this place, right? And you know how beautiful that rendering is. You have it at the beginning and at the end, and I understand why. You know, obviously you can see it from the water, but it is it is worth kind of not being, you know, trying to bring this kind of sense of, okay, let's just look at it. Let's not get too excited about all the things that we are doing when you're doing it, because you guys are very good. And that's that's makes me proud for you to be able to do these things in your last semester. And, you know, so knowing that you guys are going to join the professional world with these capabilities is fantastic. But I just wanted to point out to those things because infrastructure is very costly. Cities connecting to the water is very you know, complicated. And I think that this could be a place where you say, well, you could achieve a lot of the same things and maybe benefit more of the overall connection of this fabric. And I just wanted to bring it up to the, to the table as a, as a point of consideration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing in, in relation to what you were saying about how this, this relates to kind of this overall urban fabric um, that I think this project really needs that we've, that we talked about it at Urban Scheme, but never drew it. Um, I think we got to a point where we were like, oh, we just really need to develop this. And like, we kind of put, you know, those urban level drawings on the back burner, but I think it would be very, very helpful and would kind of help justify to a certain extent some of the things that we're doing. You talked about these these moments of connection going through part of like our initial stages with this was this idea of these green fingers that that exactly like you were drawing kind of like protrude through this more residential um, neighborhood along the, the coastline and then kind of come to these moments along the beach. So I think you're you're absolutely right that it needs it needs something that um, shows that it's something we thought about but not uh not drawn which i think we would definitely benefit from um from drawing that and showing that that relationship okay. I, I guess sorry i'll just interrupt for a sec but i guess one of the things i'm um suggesting is that that could that could have been the project mm -hmm. it's the 101 ways in which you can get to the beach between here and hatha you know? Mm -hmm. and, and the, um, um, I don't know, it's, it's uh, just, just something kind of lay out there for your consideration, but um, the, the kind of presumption that there's a, a certain scale and degree of authority that is rightfully the property of the architect 
is is always interesting to to kind of challenge. I mean, I know I know um, even in my world, there are there's a piece of the coastline, for instance, uh, between myself and the downtown of Vancouver. And Vancouver has a incredible network of um, public property parkland along along the waterfront. Uh, one of its most predominant kind of um, urban conditions. But there's, there's a, a certain portion of it where there is no public access. And you really, um, I mean, it's really significant when you're in that quarter of the city that you can't get to the water. Um, I think of, you know, in, in the United States, I mean, the extraordinary um, action, which included a bunch of architects as it happens, uh, to ensure that the, the coastline of Hawaii is entirely public. Uh, so even if you're in the Ritz-Carlton or the Four Seasons Hotel, the beach that you go to is in fact part of the public domain. And, you know, someone can, you know, I don't know, be a chambermaid somewhere else and come down with a boom box and a, a, a cooler and set up a picnic next to you. And this is a beautiful thing. You know, this, the idea that the coast is uh, a kind of exemplary instance of a democratic landscape uh, just, just seems to be something that uh, I would probably argue is inherently a virtue um, but also within what I understand to be something of the uh, precepts of the state of Israel, um, also probably an important consideration. You guys have renderings on 32 and 34, pages 32 and 34, that I think explain some of the things that Juan was saying maybe aren't depicted in, in, in the majority of your renderings, but I would say uh, just, just can you can you go students. can you go to those pages? Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. No. Recently, and went out into the working world. I think when you guys put this in your portfolio and use it to use your renderings to explain the project, because you have so many renderings. I go, I'll wait till you get there. Are you in InDesign? Yeah. <laughs> Thirty what? Thirty two. Thirty two. Yeah. Thirty two and thirty four. Yeah, so I think for these two, because this does explain this one, and can you jump to 34 as well? So because these two, even though this one's obviously a lot about the tower that you designed, because these two do make the, the big public spaces that any casual person walking along the beachfront would experience, I would say when you get these into your, into your portfolio and you kind of sum up this project, because you're gonna have to pick renderings, of course, um, I would say if you dress these up with a lot more life, because these beaches do have a lot more life, they fill up. And if you make a popular spot along this beach, people are going to come to it for sure. And so if you dress these up with a lot more people, a lot more activity, the kind of things that would happen on a Tel Aviv beach, I think these explain your project in a major way. These were, these were some of the most powerful renderings. I think this one, for, from my experience of, of the beach in Tel Aviv, you like nailed the scale of what um, uh, kind of intervention would, would actually work. Something like this could, could come off as way too small or it could come off as like, you know, mega, mega city that just doesn't fit. But I think this feels a lot like Tel Aviv. I think this one's really great. Yeah, right. I, I mean, I, no, I would, I would just add that at the same time, when I look at this uh, uh, rendering, it's a little bit like one of the, the, the problems that I have, you know, with the project is that I look at this and, and I feel like there is a, still a hard sense of, of what it takes to get to the beach. It looks like it's, it hasn't really become easier to get to the beach. I mean, uh, where is the beach here? It takes like, wow, it makes a, the boulevard is there on the left, but uh, I, I don't see how, and in a way, that's what I'm missing a little bit from the renderings. There's like, what is like when someone is going from the beach to go up to the, to the boulevard? So I, I, I don't feel the, the city here. I mean, I have almost the opposite reaction. No, I don't feel the Mediterranean. I don't feel the beach. I don't feel the boulevard. I mean, I'm feeling something that is like a series of towers that are not uh, giving me a sense of place. And I don't understand why those towers don't even look to their water. You know, they have like a blank wall looking into the ocean. It's just like crazy, you know. You know, so I, I don't get a sense of directionality to the beach, to the water, you know. So to me, this rendering has a... 
very little sense of place, you know, that relates to 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 the things that I've, 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 I'm attracted to in terms of the fabric of the city and the beach and the sense of beautiful Mediterranean light and beach. So that that to me is uh, something that probably is the one thing that the renderings don't don't convey the sense of how this beach is now easier to get to because people want to get to the water. I mean, when you're in this, you get to you and you wonder where can I get my foot in the water, you know? So, and it's, you know, here you see it, you, you know, you have to, you, 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 you may get to the very end and you say, Oh no, you need to go back and you need to go. So there's a sense of uh, disorienting aspect because of the ambition of the two levels that it, it gets a little bit in the way. That's one of the things that I, I was saying before. It's so beautiful and so well accomplished that sometimes you can get distracted from some of the original goals. Will you guys go back to the axonometric for a minute? Yeah. So, uh, this is actually my least favorite of your drawings. Um, uh, like, there's some stuff I just want to point out that uh, like, I, I so appreciate Chris McDonald's comment about the whole, the project could have all been about these kind of fingers and how the whole city uh, engages the water. And in fact, that was a kind of conversation we had early on. And you guys, like, just like your, your presentation started in this very thoughtful way about how the whole, you know, city might engage the, the um, uh, sea. Like, you were really clear that you actually were interested in being, I'm not using the right terms here, but being more heroic with the architecture. The architecture actually would, would play a significant role here. And as much as, like, Chris makes this very interesting point that, uh, and is made earlier in the day as well about, whether that's actually a, a good response. Like it is, it's actually kind of surprising to me to, to, to see how you guys have um, finally presented your project uh, because I feel like uh, there, are, there are some reactions that you had that, that were very powerful. And, and just for clarity, and maybe uh, primarily for, for Juan and Joanna, that the existing breakwater condition is like here, right? So uh, now they could have for sure taken the, you know, given more water to the, the city, but, but they're not taking away. Um, and um, the, the, the conversation that, was, that, was ha that they had along and the things that got very interesting to them were, for example, the way that, that Ben Gurion, certainly it was an option and it was a conversation about whether this was more like a single story that would descend into the water. And this sort of aircraft carrier became an important element. And this thought that this tree line boulevard would continue, that ground would turn into figure, but would dip down and then re-emerge. That it, that it plays with this sort of idea of figure and ground and that it, um, and that it had this kind of poetic presence to it. Like for me, you, were, it, you guys have been constantly interested in on the one hand, the, the power of this poetic gesture and also engaging with a kind of architecture that is, you know, often held at arm's length in an architecture school, like this sort of desire for, I don't want to say highest and best use, but for, for, for not just saying, well, let's keep the scale of the three-story buildings and pull it in here and ignore the developer version. That there was a sort of symbolic importance to you all of like having a kind of tech presence. I know it's not the tech district, but that at the most important boulevard in Tel Aviv, name for the you know founding father that it would instead of fizzle continue in this kind of dramatic and monumental fashion and that it would also kind of create this square that was surrounded by the arts and by tech and the things that are kind of that, that are you guys were kind of important that it was important you that, that this was like a powerful presence of the state of israel as manifest in a fairly muscular version of architecture i think one can be critical of that but I think it's just odd to see how the, that sort of monumental presence that was clearly part of your agenda has kind of faded into a certain desire for logic. It's this kind of like, it's the thing Bjark Ingels do, does where there's clearly a desire for doing something monumental uh, and yet it's all explained as if it was child's play. Like if you, just, if you follow the logic, it happens. I think there's a kind of great degree of intentionality about this and the drawing like that I really miss is the perspective looking this way where you start to, to understand that this weird thing is happening, like an earthquake is happening and you see the ground turn into liquid and, and it dips down and comes back up. And the, yeah. when pushed to it earlier, when pushed to like, why isn't this something that just descends into the, the, the sea, for example, you guys were really pushing back against that. You wanted the architecture to, to kind of 
have a presence. And like earlier in the the day, Chris brought up this thing about like why does the kind of social occasions, why do all these things have to be kind of architecturalized as opposed to the architecture might be more of a prime you know, uh, canvas against which other things take over. And I would have thought your answer to it, because it was how you responded to those similar kinds of questions to me earlier, was that this is what like we like to do. This is architecture. It is actually asserting its role. So it's, it's weird to see you all back off from that now, from the poetry and the authority. Is the, on that note, is, is it the kind of, like, is it kind of the clutter, maybe like visual clutter of, you know, what's happening here and here that kind of detracts from, from that, like the power of that. No, I'm just talking about, just. From, from my perspective, it, it's like, it's actually just this way the conversation is, is happening. You presented it as a logical argument. Mm -hmm. and then it's being actually- Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. All the ways it's not logical. And the criticism is correct. There's no reason for a tech, uh, like a, a building to be here. This kind of, you know, um, you know a hub of activity except for its symbolic reason, you know, or for it to be like that scale. There, you know, there isn't really a good reason to take this out as a peer, unless it's actually something that has a kind of monumental thing for it. It's unlike like Patrick and Aaron's project, which actually I think the criticism was right on that this kind of idea of a peer that would, the life would be better and more like the way Chris McDonald described it as something that, that was less architecturalized and more like you know, engage with the, the little bar that sold you a beer or, or, or you, you know, you got a snow cone or something along the way. I feel like you guys have been, you've pushed back against the kind of logical criticism in this idea of, you could say poetry or you could, you could say kind of monumentalizing. And well, I think that, so, so Kevin, if I can, because I think bringing B.R. Ingalls is a good point. I think that sometimes what happens is that Students hear all the time that they need to be true to the concept, the diagram, the part T. And I think that sometimes that gets a little in the way where, you know, I can see how beautiful is the, the moment where you discover that you can go down and go up. But in, the, in reality, I mean, that's not the best way to go down to the beach or go to this, this, these places. I mean, when you get here, I mean, people will want to go down you know, right there, you know, so I, I don't know if I want to go there to go back to where, where, how can I go to the marina? I want to go to the marina. I want to go like this. I want to go to this. I want to go to this. I want to go to the beach. So couldn't this be a more like a series of platforms that it can step you down from a beautiful end to this boulevard that has this view of the, and then all of a sudden you have the, you have the boulevard there. I mean, you can continue, but it doesn't need to be elevated because you want to be able to connect the beach there. So I think that here you you have been in a way trapped on your own diagram that it was very much about this boulevard literally going at the same elevation. And then you need to create the problem of, I mean, solve the problem that you have created of like, oh, I need to go down. Yeah, you need to go down, but you didn't, you didn't need to go down by having this complicated platform. You could have gone down much earlier in a much more simpler way. So well, you, but they, you get pushing against that, like that, and and I think with a with a good argument, and they've solved the problem. You can get down over here in some stairs. You come down here. Like there are many ways that you can get down in here. But but when pushed against the, the the kind of logic that you're presenting earlier, they actually resisted, and I think they resisted for like quite powerful reasons. I'm not I'm not saying that that's that's the right thing to do, but it's just interesting to see how demure they're being because. Uh, and then why I brought up why I brought up Yark Ingalls in, in the end, the stuff is not logical. There's no reason to do buildings like that. And, and in the end, if you find that we're compelling, it's because it's badass. It's because it's doing something kind of monumental and interesting in, in that way. Not because <laughs> well, and normally it's because it's very one liner like. So it's a, it's a very much like a very kind of like you said, like a kid can get it, you know. So I, I'm going to do a spiral here. And then, okay, that's the project. And there's less nuance. But I mean, they, they've been extraordinarily good about solving the problems. And if you went through, you know, you'd see that 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 it's not actually so hard to get down. There's a stair here. There's a stair here. And both, but but the, but then the thing is, it's it's this that that I've appreciated, although it's not my inclination as an architect. And what I've appreciated about this is this sort of belief that architecture is important enough to to actually be more um, present than the, the the logic. 
And then there's this weird thing that you guys have done is you've explained it all as if it's a logical thing. It's not. Mm -hmm. it's, you have this vision. And the vision is very much in, like about that pier is about the poetry of this sort of the key line street that then dips and comes up and you find yourself out, you know, on this boardwalk like the end of an aircraft carrier. And like, uh, uh, so I'm not, I'm not actually criticizing the project by saying this. I'm, I'm trying to kind of put words in their mouth to be like, why are you guys being so demure? Or why are you relying on logic? I mean, I know the history of architecture is that way where me says form follows function and it did not. And, you know, you know, Corb does the same thing, these kind of salesmanship things. Like, I just feel like when you push on them, those things go away. And what, you know, I, I love Mises' work and I don't love it because form followed function. I love it because it was sublime. And I think that was your agenda. And I feel like you've got a little lost, like in the, the articulation of the, the kind of, you know, that building and that building. And like, they, they start to become these um, projects that are more about a kind of um, architectural bravado. But at the heart of the project was this, was this sort of idea about trying to do something very, very powerful. And I think- No, no, it's very clear. I mean, and I think, I, I mean, I applaud it because sometimes I was look in school is where you have the opportunity to say, okay, I'm going to put my, I'm going to self-impose this kind of goal. And, you know, it may not be the same in the next project, but I think you went for this, you took it all the way. I'm just giving you hmm. just kind of points to think about, you know, in terms of like how sometimes you can, you know, uh, become very, you know, focus on your own creation and some other points may get a little more lost. But I think, you know, you did one of the things that I always recommend to do in school, take the studio, get this go all the way and resolve it. And you did. So my, my comments were to open up the, the kind of discussion in terms of what this could uh, be if this really were presented to the city and where and I, I see very easily this evolving in ways that the main ideas are preserved and it can be more toned down to you know I think it has a little bit like the Dubai feel of like having in a very kind of place that they're looking for that spectacular thing I don't see uh, uh, Tel Aviv looking for this kind of thing but maybe I'm totally wrong but uh, that, that's what I'm saying, that it could be toned down and do all the things that you could want, you would want to do for the city, which is the main driver, which is that extension of that boulevard. And that's to me, like in itself, you know, worth the, the effort of any of these studios, how that boulevard goes to the, to the shoreline. And, and, and I can see this project evolving in many different ways. He, 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 he had to, but I think that as a, as a, as a self-imposed goal is fantastic. And I, and I actually, uh, I know Noah left, but I, I, I have a 515 that uh, okay. I need to get to, but uh, just Thank wanted to- Thank you for to... participating, Juan. I mean, we- Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Juan. We can figure out if the other critics still have time. I know we I hadn't realized we ran over, um, but uh, um, I don't know- No, I enjoy it. I mean, I, I seriously, I, I really want to go to Tel Aviv. I mean, I feel so bad because in a way, what, what, uh, what uh, you know, uh, it's in common, and I think Chris mentioned it to you, to you know uh, Brodel and how the Mediterranean has this. When I see some of the pictures of uh, the Tel Aviv, the sky, the light, it feels so familiar, you know. And and the notion of how cities and the, I mean, I know exactly what he's referring to. I was born in the Mediterranean, also. I know how cities have struggled to be reconnected to the to the water, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very beautiful challenge. And I think that it's very natural for us to start thinking about, well, what about the rest of the city? But this is what the project was about, and I think it's a fantastic project. So congratulations, Kevin. I think it's, it's good. The, I mean, it's, it's good that you propose a project like this, and the work, I, I enjoy very much what I have seen. I wish I could, I, I could have seen more in the discussion, but I saw the other ones in the, in the folder. Thank you for your participation, Juan. I really appreciate it. And I thank and I you taking you late. I, I, mean, I was going to just add, like, I loved Chris's. I'm sorry he's like left us as well, I guess, but I loved his question earlier about how, how does this become part of a family of projects for addressing the ocean? And like, I, I'm dying for like you guys to be like jump back in and say, like, well, how does that answer it? it does it by way of example, you know, like as opposed to you know, other, other versions, you know, but, but, but they're, they're fabulous questions to think about. And I feel like, you know, Juan brings up these really interesting points, but they are like, you know, you're not going to answer 
them through like logic. It's actually through um, vision. I don't know, if, I, I, but I didn't mean to shut the other critics up. Like, um, I just wanted to put that into the conversation. Like, I don't know if, if everybody's exhausted or John or Johanna or, or Ikai or if anybody else is still left on board, what wants to join back in? There's, there's nothing a lot to add. Just, uh, I know how hard I remember it. Uh, uh, if somebody tells you, can you just fix this and this in the project and just send it to me? Uh, how hard that to, is to do, but if, if you could, <laughs> then, uh, then it would be amazing because, uh, uh, as Kevin said in Jerusalem, you know, we we're working on this kind of idea of maybe getting some of the projects published, so in the newspaper. So this is one of those projects that uh, really it's 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 tweaking, and then you know, it would be amazing. Well, I I don't want to. Do you, do you want to, John, are you, are you waving or wanting to say something? I can't, uh, are you on? No, muted. Oh, no, you're mute. Somehow your microphone's gone away, John. Uh, can't hear, can anybody hear John? No. Crap. I don't know what to do. <laughs> All right, so John had the most interesting stuff to say and like, where he's been muted. Um, well, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know enough about. Uh, oh well, John says so. Um, uh, I think somehow one has to sign in with a microphone. But, but um, he'll tell me, and then I'll tell you guys. I mean, I I feel like it's a kind of funny way to end. But it, it, like, I do think that that one of the things that's been so interesting about the conversation over the course of the day, aside from talking about various successes or, or dilemmas of the projects, has been the sort of approach towards architecture and life. And when one starts to imagine a, um, uh, 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 when one starts to, you know, John is correcting me, it was Lewis Sullivan saying form follows function, of course, of course. Um, uh, but uh, when one starts to look at a project that is between the scale of urban design and architecture, or shall we say encompasses both scales, I think the question of, of the, the role of the architecture uh, like, and if, if one, it becomes paramount, like the degree to which architecture, you're, you're trying to architecturalize experience or you're trying to, to kind of pull back on the presence of the architecture. You know, people like Los were super clear in saying, you know, the role of art and architecture is in the tomb and the monument. And, it, you know, otherwise it shouldn't be so expressive. Um, I'm, uh, like, I, I think as you begin your careers or as you're or kind of uh, formulating your own kind of position, it's important to think about what role architecture is playing as opposed to just what can we do with our abilities. And I think we've seen a bunch of different approaches to this. I have to say, the, for me, the, it was a super hard project and, and um, uh, both with the, the degree of power of the existing condition, but also it's kind of the artifact, the level of artifice, the many, many levels of kind of um, uh, areas in which one is addressing. And like John Ronan pointed out early on today, we're, he was saying that he was impressed by the, the, the way the first project tried to deal with the various scales, or not tried to, did, did address the various scales in which the, the, the intervention was, was uh, kind of um, touching you know, from the intimate scale to the large urban scale. And I think uh, like everyone tried to do that and did it to different degrees of success, but, but all, like everyone was kind of approaching many different kind of edges. And I think, there was a lot of success. I think sometimes one loses the forest for the trees. And the, one of the great opportunities with a review, an interim one or a final one, is to kind of reassess, like, were we focusing on those things that actually are the most meaningful to, to me as an architect, the mixed um, tenses. And, and um, uh, I feel like, you know, the, these, those are one of the most valuable things about a kind of review at the end of the day. I, I kind of applaud you all for, on the one hand, getting as much success as you, you did, and there was quite a lot of success, I think, but also for like finishing this kind of very disrupted semester, kind of unprecedented in any of our experience for sure. And, um, uh, and so I hope you guys are happy with where you're at. And um, I don't know if anybody else wants to, um, wants to engage it. Um, John, will you nod and let me know if, if I should read some of these comments? Or... 
Yeah. I think you should. Those are good comments. Okay. Oh, that's everyone. So um, everyone can see it. So you, you get to read stuff. But I mean, they're really good points. Like, you know, um, I don't know. Um, yeah, John uh, has uh, asked about the kind of go big or go home with the two peer levels and, and then some of the issues maybe with um, the peer itself and, and some of the organization of it. So the peer kind of started off in, its, in a simple form of addressing the elevational change of the Ben Gurion Boulevard and the beachfront and thinking about how do you address the two different elevations while still maintaining the um, kind of like the datum of the original um, ben Gurion Boulevard elevation. So the datum that is set by that old existing boulevard is there. And that's kind of why we, we, we created the two different levels. We wanted a reference with um, the change in topography so that you can kind of feel the difference of sight, feel the, the change, while also still giving way back to the history of the elevation and um, the original Banker and Boulevard. So that's kind of like the poetic reason why we, we had the two elevation changes. But then also the other reason is, is kind of like what Kevin was saying in the past is that we just wanted a really awesome moment at the end. And we had tried several iterations of this bar. I mean, there are maybe at least 10 in the pipeline before this one came to being. So this just seemed like the best approach with the time that we were given and the conditions that we had. So, I mean, there were comments earlier about the elevation change here and if there are easier ways to get down to the ground. And we tried addressing those in several different ways. And we just thought that the mitigation of the existing site and the, um, the existing length area of this uh, old Kikara Tarim, if we mitigated it to the, to the boulevard, you focus the attention on the boulevard and you focus the, the interaction with that area. Well, if you still want to get down to the site, there is this nice um, green parkway that's kind of covered by the trees, but it's a, a gentle slope down to the edge rather than that dramatic stair step situation that we had at the which, current site. Yeah, and, and so that was kind of our our reasoning behind getting to some of the, the formal gestures. Um, and then lastly is the reason we paired this site with kind of the sports um, area is while we could have extended the beach and in other iterations we had beachfront closer towards the edge, there's beach all over the entire site. I mean, all the way down to Jaffa, it's the same, but we, we wanted to emphasize some of the aspects of the beach that we really liked as far as the organized sports conditions, the water conditions. I mean, back in the old site, there was this amazing pool condition, um, even way before its current uh, iteration, uh, an emphasis on public swim area that's kind of, although it's not privatized, it feels privatized in this current rendition. And so we wanted to give back some of those conditions to the public in this area. And then by doing so, it, it draws people towards this edge because on one hand, it's kind of hard to, to imagine people um, coming all the way down here. But on the other hand, the original site had this this uh, breakwater with a pathway that runs all the way down to this area. And when we were on the site, we thought it was so maybe annoying that you had to walk all the way down and then to get this dramatic moment, you had to do this giant loop. And we're like, why don't we just create a direct path to that dramatic moment on the sea edge where you're here by the existing lighthouse, which is not actually shown in this, but um, there's so much, drama of the water hitting the breakwater. Uh, and people go and use that all the time. We saw various people just hanging out, drinking, having fun along this area. And we thought, why not um, structure it with architecture? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of thoughts there. I think, um, 
there's validity to um, to what you're saying. I um, I personally just um, have a really strong reaction to creating landfill and filling in the water to create um, those playing fields. I um, I think those um, should be, I think the pool area should be larger and there should be more water alongside um, the pier. I think walking along that um, raised area and looking down at the playing fields um, should happen closer to the street um, and that that should be um, pushed back. Um, I did, um, I wanted to mention that little park that you brought up. I think um, even though I, um, I, I I want that tall building to go away and I want it to kind of either be on the other side of the performing arts venue um, or you know, in some way, um, I, I want there to be a void there um, on that southern side of the pier. Um, and I think that would be a great place to have some um, you know, beautiful amenities for playing fields and sports complexes um, kind of closer into the city so that that would be um, the gradient from urban to beach you would kind of transition through that. Um, but I um, I think that park that you've created at the base of that building is really lovely. And the, um, the renderings that you have of it showing the um, kind of in between the trees and other trees and the columns kind of mixed together and the way you've um, negotiated all of these different, you know, because you're actually negotiating quite a bit of slope there. Um, and that uh, I can tell that um, one of you or all three of you spent a lot of time on that. And um, I don't want to point out that um, give you props for that because that is a really nice moment. Um, and I mean, it could be, honestly even be bigger. Um, and that kind of quiet shaded moment would be um, a welcome area um, in a city that I think would be very popular. Thank you. I think to, uh, you had, you had kind of mentioned it earlier in regards to like this, this, uh, this partnership that like the city would need to make in terms of like this development, some way to pay for it. That was definitely our thinking with how this this tower not only is like the the tower the verticality of it gave us something compositionally that mm -hmm. we felt was was powerful like that kind of added to the relationship between the performing arts this this mm -hmm. bar and then it also relates to kind of like this larger rhythm of the city but i think something i was it was a struggle to try and like we're wanting to connect obviously this neighborhood but then you have this big like moment in between the two. So like, what are you doing there? Like, it's kind of. Then you have to negotiate with, you know, sometimes you say like, I've always wanted to do a tower project and it's my last semester and I want to do a tower. Um, and that, I mean, there is a valid point to that, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, studios like this where you can choose your own program. It's great to have a, the end of your student experience. Cause you, you know, this is your last chance to really control every aspect yeah. of a project and, um, you know, for, you know, probably for a few years. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. These guys are going to change the world, I think. <laughs> uh, what, what I was going to say is, is you bring up this really interesting point, Joanna, and I, I need to close this thing down so people just being polite you know, they can actually leave. But, like, you know, they, they've actually been, they were thoughtful, right? If this was the existing pier, they mm -hmm. kind of took away some water but put it back over here, right? Because the, the shoreline used to be up there. But I wonder from your perspective, guys, if you, if, and this is a more rhetorical question or to think about, like, what would be a better gift to the city if you'd taken your your pool and your fields and stuff and pulled it all the way back to here and so that the pier had like all this waterfront or would the better gift to the city be this amazing building you designed like i think for johanna it's really clear that you know it would be the former but my intuition is for you guys it's the latter it's like and i think that this is just indicative uh, like answering the question is is indicative of a kind of agenda that you bring, you know, like for Bjork Ingalls, it would certainly be the building. Um, but where you buy these other three hotels also and renovate them as part of the project. Yeah, or get rid of them all. I mean, there is this, this thing, <laughs> like, we all go there and we all are like, oh, why are these kind of, you know, nasty hotels there along the water? And, and, um, and especially of that era, you know, where it's like a double loaded corridor, like you don't make an exception on the end. It's like, yeah. you know, yeah. architects, curious architects, but, um, uh, it's a perfect example of that dilemma with that particular strain of modernism, but like um, with the logic of the organization overwhelms the site condition. But I also feel like there is a kind of architecture. It is 
not me, but is a kind of architecture that is uh, like embraces the the forces of I don't know, to capitalism or the kind of the pressure on these places to be more than the kind of generous, quaint, socialized version of low rise and you know um, uh, sort of slipping into the this great public amenity and and um, you know this is where the success of Rem Cool House comes from. You know, yeah. well, that. Brooklyn Bridge Park is also a great example of, um, you know, there's a series of tall high rise condo buildings as part of that that pay for the rest of the park. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, these aren't privatized in that way, but, they, but there is a kind of way in which one can engage like the current world successfully. Like I think from my perspective, I'm more interested in resistance to those forces, mm -hmm. but I respect the, you know, Dutch version of like, you know, conspiring with them. I mean, some might say that's cynical what they do. I would say it's cynical, but it, <laughs> I have some, you know, but, but I feel like just as you position yourselves as you go into the world, like it's an interesting conversation to have. For me, I love this idea that you might pull the pools back and that this whole end of the, of the pier would be like open to the sea and like, uh, it'd be fantastic. But my intuition is you guys are like, we are giving this incredible gift to the city with these amazing things we're sculpting. And, you know, there's a lot of architects that would, that would be right in your, your court. I should end this thing, unless somebody has some final words that they want to say, oh, Colin does. Maybe just real quick, um, I saw John's, John's message about this kind of private yacht club feel, um, who is the public for this public project. The current um, state of the site, this whole, Swath mm -hmm. is is very 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 heavily. It feels very privatized. There's like this kind of edge condition to it all. It feels very enclosed. Like at least at least from my perspective, going through the site, it does not feel accessible. So like in in like I I I, I see your comment and I I understand it, but um, I feel like this what we were trying attempting to do and maybe the rocks still make it feel like it has kind of an edge that maybe isn't as accessible, but we really wanted to open this area up because right now as it is, there's this edge, edge condition. There's kind of like this, this barrier here. It feels very disconnected from what's going on here. And I think there's some work to be done to make, make that connection stronger between the beach, um, the beach and this kind of park. Um, but I think in, in terms of what we're doing right here, it's actually, I, I feel it's, it's, it's um, kind of successful in, in how it's addressing the current state of the site, because as it is, basically what we're, what we're doing is giving it a private side that maybe is similar to the current state, which is kind of necessary for boat storage and, and that sort of program. But then we're really allowing this, this space to be more open. There's not like this, hard edge to it. There's not this, this sense of barrier or fencing that kind of like shuts it off from the rest of the beach. Yeah, you may not be making it worse. I just, John might reply, although he, he's probably more eloquent in typing than I'm going to be in words, but he might reply that like, are, are you making it that much better? And like, I think the move to kind of private, put the private stuff on the north side of the pier is, is a good one. But I, I do think there's room to improve that other side. So that is more yeah. like the original Gordon Poole. You know, those beautiful images that, that we saw earlier in the day uh, of, yeah. of it is a truly public space. And I think we, like, I'm guilty of this as well. Like I, I let that slide thinking it's like, it's better than what was there, but it's yeah. not, but without a lot of changes, it could have been really public. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that fair, John? I think, um... I just want to summarize. I think one of the the things I wanted you guys to take most from this uh, uh, studio and visiting in Tel Aviv is this idea of how, as a foreign architect, you can go to a foreign land and design in a way that really addresses what that specific culture. Without you can bring the good qualities of your own culture, but really without you know overbearing you know what your ideas should be. And I think that in that sense. Um, you did pick up on a lot of elements of what Israeli culture is about, and that's the success of your project. Um, but the more that I'm aware, as, as the conversation goes forward, I see that maybe you went a bit too far in scaling not just the buildings a bit down, 
but maybe this public thoroughfare a bit, you know, you pushed it too much out. But again, it's um, uh, um, this idea that capitalism, uh, one thing you need to know about Israelis and, and, and Israel, uh, sure, you know, like anybody else, we want to earn money, we want to, you know, but we're very much about being accountable for one another. So this kind of plan just wouldn't go further in the city just because you would have so many citizens pushing back and that citizen is somebody's brothers or sister or cousin or somebody in the sense that eventually it would just fall through because it would be an argument in Shabbat dinner every single week until this gets solved. So, so you know, th this would be built, but it would be built in a, in a version that is much more about a community uh, than, than this kind of grandiose master plan. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe with that, I, I, I should, since we're half an hour over, and I apologize again, um, uh, John Ronan, Johanna, Itai, um, thank you so much for speaking here with us. Thank you all thank students you. and critics thank for kind of what was a very lively day, especially John, like having to enter his voice in while being muted. Um, uh, and uh, I will be back in touch with all of you guys. And um, uh, thank you all very much. I hope it you all feel good about it. I'm sorry some of you guys still have papers and exams to deal with like tomorrow, but um, thank you all for coming through in the end, especially, and all the way through. And congratulations on finishing what was a, a, a unexpected and um, really unprecedented semester. Right? So, um, mazel tov. Yeah, mazel, mazel tov. <laughs>